everyone, it's Tommy Akan here with the Fox 10 News Now update. Joining me is Ron Hoon. I love having you up here. I feel like I should just have you enter the show one of these days because you're like my unofficial News Now 10 a.m. co-host. I love hanging out with you. <laughs> and yesterday, I have to say, was one of the most uh, fun, despite the fact that it was kind of a heavy day news-wise. Right. It was one of the most fun days Ever, ever, I think, for either one of us, because we were talking to people from literally all over the planet who mm-hmm. are joining the News Now bandwagon. Well, I know, because obviously everyone is joining us for Arius Watch. It's the big uh, talk of the day, I guess you could say, or talk of the week. Yeah. You know, maybe even talk of the month, depending yeah. on the verdict and how it turns out. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're at the end of February. I think you're safe to say that. I yeah. know. Well, we were talking about some other things, too, this month. But you know what I mean. <laughs> it, it, we're all Arius all the time here on News Now. Yeah, right. Um, pretty much. But we're not going to just, like, inundate you with all Arius news. We're obviously going to keep you updated on all the other news that's out there. In fact, there was a train crash. Not talking about the one in California. We're talking about the, there was one right here in Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting because there there's this huge corridor, if you're not familiar with it, living in what we call the Northwest Valley, that where this long boulevard comes in on a diagonal, comes all the way out from the retirement areas of Sun City, Sun City West, right through Peoria, Glendale, a lot of the biggest communities in the valley. And there's there are train tracks that run right along right. Grand Avenue. Mm-hmm. And what happened today is actually one of the most amazing stories of survival because the woman that was hit by the train is still alive that I've ever heard. We have a photojournalist, Rick Davis, live on the scene right now. We have a live picture of uh, the intersection where that happened. And Rick, I believe, can talk to us now from the scene. Rick, are you there? Yes, I am. I have have an update here. Uh, The story just continues to get updates. The latest is, uh, according to Trent Crump with the Phoenix Police Department, they were found illegal substances on this lady at the hospital. Oh, wow. So they found illegal substances in the lady's system or in the vehicle? Or what what exactly? Well, let let me back up and kind of give you a walkthrough here. Apparently, uh, there was a train, uh, Burlington National railway train that was going northbound uh, along uh, 27th Avenue and Thomas. A woman sitting on the tracks eating and she had earbuds in her ear according to authorities was hit by that train somehow went up under the train there there's a break in the in the track when it goes across the intersection so there's snow piles there knocked her up under the train and there's there's a little little space there she was not run over she was run over she wasn't drug or drag down the tracks and was able to survive once they stopped uh, they noticed that she had earbuds in her ear uh, she was able to get out they pulled her out transferred to the hospital once they did get to the hospital they found illegal substances somewhere on her body which okay. may indicate a little bit more about what happened here right so they found it on her as a person not necessarily in her system Yeah, yeah. According to what you know, they're still investigating, but that's the latest. And obviously, you can see where the uh, the roads are not open, the trains are are gone on, and uh, there's still some uh, uh, people with the uh, railroad that are looking at signals and things like that, trying to make sure everything's okay for farther uh, train usage. But uh, you know, the the train was going about 20 miles an hour, uh, and it and it, it's just really loud out here when he's blowing that horn. And you know the, the traffic signals are going, and the railroad crossing, crossing lights are going. So it's really unusual that she did not hear them, even with the earbuds. But that illegal substance may play into why she did not. So, yeah. what time did this uh, incident occur, and how did that affect traffic in the area this morning? So yeah, this happened right at the peak of rush hour, uh, right around 08, 15, 8, 10, 8, 15. And this intersection is actually a three-way intersection. You have Grand Avenue, you got 27th Avenue, and Thomas. And not to mention that you have the the, the traffic from the trains that are going across uh, the intersection too. In rush hour, uh, there's a school down the street. There's a school yard right next to a, a quick trip. So there's a lot of different um, places that people are trying to get into from this six-point stop. 
So, Rick, I wanted to ask you about this snow plow that you're talking about, because I, I think that's probably one of the things that people are keying in on in your report. So this is something that, obviously, we don't have any snow in the valley, but they must just fit this time of year. They must just uh, retrofit the uh, trains nationwide with these, because you're, it sounds like that might have been the thing, the very thing that saved her life because it's elevated. Yes, and, and it's the thing about that snow plow, I got pictures of it. Uh, when they go across the intersection uh, with that snow plow, because uh, the tracks are, are embedded and they go down, well, that's what stopped and pushed her up under, uh, up under the tracks, and the train just kept going north up under her until it, it came to a stop and she wasn't, you know, run over. But I think it's standard from what they're saying. Uh, they they keep plows on the front of those engines just in case because they you know they do a lot of traveling around the state you just never know sure. you know maybe it may not be snow there may be something else that they need to push out of the way. Wow, that is a crazy story. So if you had to estimate, Rick, how high up off the ground? So you got the wheels there uh, on the train, you know, that are chugging down the track. The, the body of the train, so if we're understanding this right, you're saying it literally passed over the top of her. It didn't kill her. It's, it's incredible that she wasn't crushed or something like that. How high up is the, is the belly of the train off the tracks as it was rolling over the top of her? You know, that's a good question. I'm looking at the tracks now, and you go across the track from the street it drops probably i don't know maybe 12 to 15 inches and then you throw in there the height of the belly of the train uh, that could be another 12 to 15 i'm not exactly sure but it's certainly enough that if you're hit by that plow it pushes you back and you're just there it is the train's just going to keep you know rolling and not drag you down the tracks with it wow all right, Rick. Well, thanks so much for the update. Rick Davis out there uh, at the scene. Well, I mean, there's not the train's been moved now, but uh, this is the intersection where the incident occurred. Rick, thanks so much for calling in and giving us that update. Yeah. Anytime. Thank you, Rick. As a matter of fact, I, can, I think I can just show people from just a little while ago right. before they moved the train what the scene was looking like there because we flew Sky Fox right over the top. And you see it stopped right there right. as it's coming down across. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Thomas right as it hits 27th Avenue. What you don't see is Grand, but a few years ago, they decided to go ahead and make Grand an overpass there and at some other intersections. So Grand, busy as it is, was not even impacted. Uh, but these other streets obviously were. Right, right. Well, now uh, we're moving on. We're going to go uh, start talking a little Arius, Arius Watch. We actually have Fox 10 Celeste Rodriguez who is uh, live at the court and we're going to speak with her in just a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the thing we're talking about. It's the thing we were teasing all morning. Mm -hmm. Arius Watch. So yesterday, closing arguments wrapped up. Right. Now the jury is deliberating. The mm -hmm. jury could take, they could come to a verdict. They could reach a verdict today. Right. Or it could take a month. Yeah. In theory. You know, and so it's always interesting when you send a, when you send a jury into the deliberation room, as in Texas, because we talked about Texas yesterday, right. how quickly within a couple of hours, boom, they came out, story over, case over. Now this, when you, ha when you and 11 other people have to make the decision on whether or not this person is going to be executed... Mm -hmm. There got to be a lot of not just not just the facts that you uh, brought into your decision making process, but the emotion of it. I mean, right. you have to, you, and, and that's what Kirk Nurmi, the defense attorney, was appealing to the whole time. Samia was mm -hmm. their their emotional uh, part of this story. Are are you willing to kill her? Are you willing to kill, kill this girl? This girl, this, this girl. little girl. And it's the fact that they use the word girl. You know, I had Troy on here yesterday afternoon. Right. And we were talking about that, just like the use of the word girl. Mm hmm And really trying to paint Jody as this child. Yeah. You know, this idea that this is just a girl. This is the person you're killing. She's mm -hmm. not some vicious you know, criminal. Right. At least yeah. that's what the defense is trying to p portray. It's a girl. It's a girl mm -hmm. that uh, you know felt emotionally very uh, abused. Yeah. That's the defense perspective. And think about this. This is interesting. But at one point, 
going back toward the end of the first trial, mm -hmm. uh, the attorneys wanted off this case. <laughs> Remember that? Right. They were like, we don't even want to deal with this anymore. But it does seem to me, just in terms of the... Um, the overall way it was handled this time around, it seemed like the attorneys were much more in control of things, and they managed to, con I, th I believe, they managed to convince her. Let us make the argument for you. You don't get up there and well, say anything. <laughs> well, when the trial happens multiple times, what do they say? Practice makes perfect. <laughs> when you do it so many times, well, you're bound to figure out how, yeah. to, how to do it. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's the way I look at it. I mean, they also say the third time's the charm. Oh no! But in don't, this, don't, don't in this say case, that. it's only two times. Yeah, I mean, unless but if there's she a gets, you know what? Appeal. If yeah. she gets the death penalty, there'll be years worth of appeals. Many more, yeah. many more. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's for sure. Trips to court. So we sent Celeste down there, uh, boy, early this morning, and she's been we doing did. a great job, kind of giving us the previews of what to expect today. And uh, matter of fact, I think our first report from Celeste was at about 4:30 this morning. She's still going strong. She's still going. It's 10:12. Actually, let's go ahead and check in live with Celeste now, who is at the courtroom in downtown Phoenix. Celeste. Hi, Celeste. Hey, good morning, you both. Yeah, uh, good, go, good morning, everyone. And if you take a look at this building behind me right here, I mean, I took a gander inside the Superior Court building here, downtown Phoenix, and uh, there's plenty of jurors kind of gathering in the juror assembly room that you see right past security. Uh, but no indication uh, of any answer from the jurors just yet. They were ordered to arrive here at the courthouse 9 a.m. this morning and they are expected to deliberate until about 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, they received the case late yesterday after some closing arguments wrapped up just before noon uh, with defense attorney Kirk Nurmi asking the jury one last time to spare Jody's life. A very, very interesting turn of events here with this case. So the jury then began deliberating shortly after, left late afternoon without reaching a verdict. As we know with these types of cases, we can't really determine when they will come back with a verdict. We can only speculate, but what we do know from folks here at the courthouse is that they will not deliberate tomorrow, and those deliberations with the jurors will end about 4 o'clock this afternoon. So they'll decide if Jody gets life in prison or the death penalty for the murder of her ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander. And if you rem remember, this was back in 2008. Her trial began in January of 2013, and, uh, and now here we are in 2015. If she is given life in prison, then it will be up to the judge to decide whether she will spend the rest of her life behind bars or get a chance of parole after 25 years. Something interesting as we look back on this case, guys, you remember that, uh, that there were about 400, a pool of about 400 people who were called to report as potential jurors, uh, and many of them were excused because they were already made a decision on this case because, as we know, with the first trial, it was so widely publicized with the media because the media was allowed in the courtroom they had already made a decision on this case or there are some jurors in, in part of that 400 group who thought that they, they had already made a decision so these 12 jurors now have this case in their hands to make a decision now celeste are there people outside the courtroom just uh, jody supporters travis supporters are there a lot of people out there this morning you know, as I walked around the courtroom steps, courthouse steps, I didn't really see very many Jody supporters. Uh, but on the other hand, I didn't really see uh, much of anyone else. And, it, you know, if you think back to the first trial, uh, that is exactly where there were probably close to 50, 60 people standing outside and uh, with signs. And uh, if you remember, we were walking the steps here of the courthouse talking to many, many of those people. We have none of that this time around, partly because the judge in this case, when this retrial trial began, she banned news cameras from uh, from having live reports out of that out of the courtroom. Uh, and in one specific case as well, she asked the media to leave the courtroom as uh, as a witness spoke, gave some testimony. So this has been a, a very, very different trial when you look at the first. Well, so Celeste, it's so interesting that uh, you think about, how, we've talked about how this case the murder itself was in the year 2008. Here we are s almost, seven almost seven years, years later. later. Yeah. And yeah. and it seems like it's taken forever. It's got to feel to these just to these jurors that it's taken forever because if I recall when they were first impaneled, they were told to expect their whole commitment to the county and to the justice system to be in the say 4 to 6 week range. Well, we went way over that deadline. 
Yeah, absolutely. We went four to five months, so uh, much longer than what was anticipated. But with a case like this, uh, imagine you're one of those jurors and you receive the the assignment that this is the case that you are supposed to be, uh, you know, deliberating on, uh, and and. You're, you're choosing whether or not someone gets life or the death penalty. If she gets the death penalty, she will be only one of three Arizona women, three women here in Arizona who are on death row. And so this is a big job for this jury. You have to imagine that even though they were expecting only six weeks on this jury, that uh, they, they have a big decision on their hands. You know, it's interesting. I would love to, we, we, yesterday we realized the interest on this case has really not died down because we had people from literally all over the world. Literally the world. Dubai, Germany. Uh, Switzerland, Canada. UK, yeah, And all over the country as and well. I, and I think while as, as we're chatting with Celeste here, it would be interesting to get your comments, you guys, in the, in the chat box. Would, if you were serving on the jury, would you have been able to be impartial in this case? Because that's what your job is as a juror. It is. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, there, I don't believe there was any type of a push for change of venue this time around, vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the Sarney of case back in Boston. And probably not even worth doing that, Celeste, because it had garnered such worldwide attention uh, all around the country. But uh, at least they were able to find uh, a handful of uh, potential jurors who said they could be impartial through the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of things that we know about this specific jury. We know there are eight women on this jury. We know that there are four men on this jury. And we also know that they're a fairly young jury when you can look at their ages. And so, uh, but but whittled down from about 400 people, you can imagine that uh, that there are many people. You mentioned folks in Dubai and in Europe, all over the globe, really. This has, is one of those cases that has garnered worldwide attention. And it sure is, Samia, I think you made such an interesting point. Think about when the jury was out last time around. This was about a year and a half ago. There, there would have been literally throngs of people right behind where Celeste is. Right, well, because the first time around, it was whether she was guilty or, or innocent. Right. And that was, you know, finding that information out, that's kind of the thing that everyone's waiting for. Right. At this time around, we know she's been found guilty Correct. of the crime. It's just... How are you going to suffer because of the crime that you committed? And Celeste, I wonder if you could run through us for, for people who may be just tuning in. The, ju the jury has one of, t they can decide two things, uh, and that is right. life, life or, or death. death. But there's a third mm -hmm. option, and how does that third option work? How does that fit into the picture? Well, at this point, it's life or death. A a assuming that they choose life or if it's deadlocked, Right. If it's a hung jury, like the first trial, if they can't make a decision, then that goes to the judge to decide. The death penalty is automatically thrown out. So there's no retrial here in terms of the death penalty. And that goes to the judge, and the judge then decides if it's deadlocked, if it's 25 years, she can be released after 25 years, or if she's in, in prison for life. So it's that deadlock option, which, which could happen. There's always the possibility of that. Right, and one of our uh, viewers that's watching via YouTube right now chimed in on uh, on Ron's question. Melissa Ward is saying, yes, I could be impartial if I didn't watch the last trial. Is that a requirement that you didn't pay attention to the last trial before you're selected as a juror? Because that's a really good point that Melissa made. You know, I don't know what the specifics were, but I know that there was a list of questions, specific questions that the jurors were asked. One of them was, do you believe in the death penalty? Do you believe that this is something that uh, it, it is, is it swayed by, by, by a religious belief that you might have? And so there's a list of questions specifically that jurors are asked. Whether or not they watch the, the first trial or not, I don't believe uh, was a determining factor, but, but I don't have the, that list of questions per se specifically. Right, because it would be hard living in Phoenix to have avoided the first trial, mm -hmm. the, the, the trial sure. last time around. Yeah. So. You know, any, anywhere. She's she's from California, so you can imagine. Uh, you know, today we have um, CNN here. We have other other national media organizations here. I mean, it was it was covered widely. Uh, you know, around the world, and so there was a lot of media here for that first trial. And and I think specifically the way in which. Travis Alexander was killed also led way to the fact that it was it was such a global it, news story. Yeah. People were, were completely shocked by the turn of events, by the crime itself. And so I think that really uh, is what made people very interested in this case. Celeste, I want to get your take on this. When Sami and I were talking yesterday, I said, 
and I know you've watched, this is not specific to this trial, it's just specific to other trials that you've covered. My take on it was, if we were to have gotten an almost instantaneous verdict uh, yesterday, or even potentially this morning, that a verdict has already been reached, that that was pretty much the only, I felt, the only hope for the prosecution to get a death penalty ruling out of this jury. It just seems to me that the longer this drags on, the more it's indicative of the fact that you're going to have people with differing opinions, some yes on uh, death, others no on death, and that the longer it goes, the more likely it is that she's going to get life. What's your take? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And something else interesting about that, say they, they, they're they can't really decide on the death penalty in there, and they're, they're in the jury deliberations going back and forth. That's one of those issues, I think, that is so closely tied to someone's morals and values, to religious beliefs, things like that, that it would be difficult to sway someone's opinion on whether or not Jody Arias should get the death penalty. And if you look back at earlier this week and some of those closing arguments with the prosecution and the defense, you see at how they they showed old photographs. They, they brought up questions about, you know, uh, the way in which Travis, Travis Alexander was killed. And they, they asked the question towards the jury, uh, the defense did, are you willing to kill this woman? Because that is exactly what you will be doing. So when you consider the death penalty, I think you really have something that is uh, that is close to someone's values, their beliefs, their morals. And it would be difficult, if you have not made up your mind as a juror, it would be difficult to sway them once you're inside those deliberations. Well, that's a really good point. You know, one other thing, Celeste, as we've all watched the the approach that Kirk Nurmi and the defense team went for this time, I thought it was interesting that last time around, I'm going back 18 months now, right. year and a half and, and beyond, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we all watched and listened to her emotional testimony, and they went so strongly for the abuse angle. Now, they also mm -hmm. tried to bring that up again this time, but they got a lot of pushback from the prosecution. It seems to me this time around they really were trying to more push the emotional buttons of the jury, talk about her as an individual, talk about how she managed to get through all other different kinds of relationships with, uh, without anything happening untoward at the end of a relationship, focusing on her mental state and her any type of connection that the jury might feel to her as a human being. I agree, and I think the reason is because you think about someone's emotional state on death row. If you're looking at this woman, you have eight women on this jury, right? You have eight women and four men, and uh, it's largely said and probably understood in our society that women can be, and I know you got you, Samia, and Ron can agree, uh, women can can be a little bit more emotional at times. What? And so I, I think <laughs> I think in this case they're trying to tap into that. I think they're trying to uh, tap into the fact that do you understand emotionally what she would go through on death row? Do you understand what this does to someone, does to a woman, a young woman, if you spend a life behind bars? You know. And so I think out of those three options, I think that they're really trying to tap into the emotional side. And I think that's probably one of the things as well. What well, we've I, heard from legal experts. Right. I mean, I would say that they were trying to do that same sort of emotional appeal when painting Travis as this, uh, you know, manizer, this guy that played a lot of women. They were trying to appeal to the women who may have been in similar situations where their hearts were broken, where they were the other girl without knowing. You know what I mean? So I feel like there was mm -hmm. also that emotional appeal from a relationship point of view. Mm -hmm. Not that it's justifying killing, but they can maybe understand to an extent how... Uh, Jody was mentally in this other place as a result. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. I mean, you think about it, there, there really is no justification of the killing. She is a convicted murderer. She has been convicted now. The, the first trial kind of, you know, that clarified that. Now it's a matter of choosing what her punishment should be. Should it be death? Should it be life in prison? Should it be life in prison uh, with the possibility of parole after 25 years? And um, and you have those three options. And as this jury sits there in those deliberations, uh, I don't know if they're going to come through with an answer by 4 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, I, I have sort of changed my opinion, Celeste. I want to get your take on this and Samia's too, because a couple of days ago, uh, here on News Now, as we were talking about this case, I said, 
if Jody gets the death penalty, they we, they may very well look back on her decision not to to employ the allocution or the chance to beg the jury for her life. But in thinking right. about it over the last 48 hours or so, I think that Kirk Nurmi really was so effective at um, trying, you know, the bottom line for him was, how am I going to take this woman who's a known killer, and not just a killer, but I mean, she, she the butcher. vicious, she a, just, yes, yeah. a butcher. Vicious. How do you take her and make her seem a sympathetic a human. character? He humanized a killer. Correct. And it was too risky to put Jody up there because you do it and some, you know, with her emotional state, you don't know what she's going to say exactly. And he probably felt and somehow convinced her, let me make that final argument to the jury. And I actually think it probably, probably was the right move. I think so. I think it was. If you look at it this way, how, in, in what manner would you like to leave the jury? Do you want to leave them with um, questioning whether or not Jody Arias uh, was being truthful or whether or not she was, um, or whether or not you believe her in fact? Because she's taking the stand and she needs to tell the, she's supposed to tell the truth. But, you know, whether or not you believe her in fact. Um, or do you want to leave them, uh, you know, wondering whether or not emotionally she could survive behind bars on, the, on death row. And so I think, that, I think that her not taking the stand was probably a very wise decision by Kirk Nurmi. Yes, absolutely. By the way, we should just mention there's a lot of chatter online right now, and we are not able to confirm it, uh, that a juror, a, a, an actual juror wants to switch with an alternate. The problem is there's so many of these things that get out there on social media right. before we have a chance to confirm it. So I would say stay skeptical on that report. We know it's out there. It's all over Twitter. Uh, but we're not going to we're not going to confirm anything on that until we can actually hear from the judge, and of course we got the best sources possible because Celeste is out there. <laughs> we got Celeste out there, we got Troy out there, we got Steve Kraft has been working this case for months, I know. as well as a whole a team of legal analysts that we've been talking to over the last uh, probably two years of this case. Sure. Celeste, thanks for your reports today, and uh, can we check back in with you as the morning goes on? Okay, absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Celeste. Yeah, so you just have to be skeptical. There was a report, I'm trying to remember what it was yesterday, but we saw it kind of clear on the chats and we thought to ourselves, that just does not sound It was. Correct. Someone said some, oh, someone said that the verdict was down. Okay. I think that's what someone said on chat. Yeah. I don't know. There's so, so many things on Twitter. You can't believe everything that's said on Twitter, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Otherwise, uh, I mean, well. I guess it's fortunate that you can't believe everything on Twitter from uh, even the school lockdown that we talked about yesterday, the school in Queen Creek that was locked yeah. down because of a bomb threat on social media. Not sure if it's Twitter or another social media site, but obviously people put out a lot of lies on the internet I wanted too. To, I wanted to be able to come in today and report that an arrest had been made in that bomb threat because it, it once we start reporting on the good police work that generally is done in these cases, mm -hmm. that uh, the whole thing was a hoax which seems like almost always they are right um you know then that's when people will think twice about it if you end up somebody ends up i don't know if they actually it's go to not jail a prank. over it it's not a prank you can't just you like know. it's not you know prank calling the pizza parlor down the street right. you know it's sort of like this case that we're dealing with in arizona today which is heartbreaking for those of you who have never been to the beautiful sonoran desert these gigantic cacti uh, the saguaro cactus is practically the symbol of the state of the Sonoran Desert. And we have an area, a natural area outside the valley where people have been chopping these saguaros, some of which could be 100 years old or older, mm -hmm. out on desert trails. And it might surprise you to realize that that can be punishable by up to four years in prison. I have that story. That's how protected they are. Well, you want to pull up that story now that you brought it up? Sure. I mean, just so everybody understands, we're fully on uh, Arius watch. We are. And nothing's going to happen without watching. us talking about it. If anything happens, it. don't worry, we will cut into this story yeah. that's one and a half minutes and let you guys know what happened. Hopefully, I don't think anything's going to happen in the next minute and a half. I just wonder if people, as they watch it in other parts of the world, get as upset about it as I do because this is... About Arius? No, about this. About, oh, about, about the destruction of the desert. The cactus. The because cacti. it takes... I, I was once told by an old timer when I first moved here, it takes 75 years before they even grow an arm. 
Wow. So some of these are 75, 100, 200 years old, and to have them chopped down, it is, ugh. Let's watch. Yeah. A proud symbol of our state, uprooted, left to die in the desert, an apparent victim of vandalism. Jim Kekala is a member of the Sun City Festival Hiking Club and is familiar with this area of White Tank Mountain Regional Park. He got a call from a friend who made the discovery. And he said, Jim, you need to get out of here right away because we've got a, a, a disaster on our hands. Kekala says he was appalled at what he saw, nearly a dozen downed saguaro cacti. Uh, someone has used a an ATV, a uh, very large tire ATV to shove these over. It takes about 80 to 100 years for a saguaro to reach about 15 feet and to start to grow its first arm. Kekala says the down cacti were all over 20 feet tall. Some had several arms. He estimates each cactus was around 150 years old. Well over a thousand years of growth in the, just in the 11 that we've discovered, um, uh, making it Com completely egregious that um, uh, somebody would be as um, senseless and uh, violent as this. This act of destruction is a crime, and for this passionate hiker, this is practically cactus cruelty. Kekala wants to see justice and is asking the public for help. I will personally guarantee $500 if, if this person can be found. I love that. I love that he loves the desert so much that he's willing to do that. I'm sad that someone went to vandalize the, like a cactus. Prank. It's the same thing yesterday. Prank. You know, people who are idiots, who, I don't know, I don't know if they get together with a bunch of buddies and they think it's funny or, maybe or they're, they're drunk. drunk. Yeah, my guess is drunk. But... Um, or it's like a hazing ritual or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Sue G8R says, poor cactus, sad face. That's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. I feel that way too. There's something, I don't know, I just moved to Arizona uh, almost four months ago and I get happy every time I see a cactus still. <laughs> and I know it sounds like such a tourist thing, but there's something so like, I don't know, I have this Instagram photo that looks like me hugging a cactus. You do? Yeah, and I feel like uh, there's something that's just so... If I was going to personify a plant, yes. a cactus seems like a friendly <laughs> plant, which is ironic because they have thorns and everything. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe it's like the arms or the hug ability. Whatever. The point is, I feel like you shouldn't vandalize no. a cactus. I mean, even trees. If you go back to like Disney movies and such, trees were characters in yeah. Disney movies. Well, that's right. Look, think about the, the Wizard of Oz. Right. The trees picked up apples and right. threw them at the tin Or man. even uh, in a recent Disney movie, uh, The Princess and the Frog, I feel like there's a talking tree. I don't know. I've just had this. I what did trees do to you? <laughs> I love hearing your personal connection to the cacti. Uh, well, one of my biggest issues with, I know, I mean, I love it here and it's so pretty, yeah. but when I was first coming from California, um, I had only seen the downtown area. Yeah. Uh, like the airport right. and work and stuff yep. and I was like there are no trees in Phoenix <laughs> and I was so afraid to leave my trees behind yeah. and then I found that there were all these trees all over the valley yeah. and I live on a street with many trees there you go uh, but there's something about just being around like you know green the story, makes you happy the story we tell in my family from long ago was the first time we ever came to Arizona I grew up up in the up in the northwest up in Washington state we made a family trip down here and then we were going to cut past the Grand Canyon and we crossed into Arizona from Utah, coming down the highway, and somewhere up there we saw an actual cactus. And we stopped and everybody got out, we took pictures and everything, you know. And we're like, an actual cactus, how cool. It's always the first time. And then of course you go another 10 miles and there's like 50 cacti, right. 50 cacti all around. But there are some places here, I still want to get you on that drive going up to Payson on the right, Beeline Highway. That. It's like a forest of cacti and it really is so cool so anyway let's hope they get those people caught asap linda r has never seen a cactus except in walmart i totally <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> i want right? to or in, in the florist shop at the airport you know in a, like a little well i mean yeah. i'm assuming linda might not be you know a local so maybe she hasn't seen a cactus in real life i had never seen a cactus i had seen a cactus once prior to moving here and it was in uh, las vegas by the airport Yes. But I mean, it's rare to see a cactus. And for all my friends that have visited Phoenix recently, yeah. 
every single time I watch them see their first cactus, it's the greatest <laughs> sight ever. They're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, and we obviously have to pull over and we have to take the picture. Sure. Um, this is a cactus that I saw at the grocery store around what? Christmas. They had a Christmas oh. cactus, and it was <laughs> so great because I was like, oh, my gosh, only in Arizona we have a Christmas crack cactus right. in addition to a Christmas tree. Yeah. Um, Steven Martinez is asking, hey, Sammy, did you get that video from yesterday from the archives? Yeah. Well, I have some good news for you guys. I did. I have the full 47-minute clip, <sighs> the raw interview that Troy did with Jody, with Jody Arias. Arias. Yep, from two years ago. We pulled it from the archives. I'm going to play it soon. I'm just okay. teasing you guys right yeah. now. I have that, and there's another story that Troy did um, – I believe on what it's like to be on women's death row. So I have a couple of Jody Arias related stories okay. from our archives that we've restored. We've pulled up for you guys. So we're going to play them here on News Now. Don't you worry. That is coming very, very soon. Okay. And obviously more like news talk. I know you have to go to your meeting. i got to so run into a meeting. I feel like now would be the time to play Although, that highly anticipated I would like to sit and watch it again. Jody because, Arias. See, I mean, it made such big headlines so you want me to got that in. No, okay. go, no go ahead. Are go you ahead. sure? But by the way. Uh, we just had Randy join us in uh, Denmark, who says, no, we don't have any cacti in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wondering, maybe I'll play the death row story in the meantime. Uh, well, I'll play a couple a lot other stories, but I might have to start playing the Jody Arias. I'm sure. Yeah. So, guys, okay. the Jody Arias uh, raw interview is going to start in just a few minutes. In the meantime... I'm going to play everything else. Now, this story that Troy did was a few years ago, and I want to set this up carefully. So at the time that Troy did this, there were only three women on Arizona's death row. Yep. Since this story has aired, one of the women, Deborah Milkey, has gotten off death row. She is now a free woman, uh, heavily protected. But Deborah Milkey was someone who had, was sent to death row in the murder of her four-year-old child. She told her four-year-old son that he was going to go meet Santa Claus when in reality... Two men took the boy to the desert, shot and killed him. Really sad story. Deborah Milkey was um, was let off death row because they declared what well, was a mistrial or like an unfair trial. Well, uh, whole... she had people working on her appeals process, and the the bottom line was that there was a and sometimes a technicality is enough to get a conviction thrown out. There was a detective who worked on the case, who by the way is still alive, and who could still testify but chose not to. Um, but he had a history of lying in cases, and because of that reason, she is a free woman. And it's here in Arizona; it's still highly, highly controversial. Right, right. So I'm going to play this video about Arizona's uh, the females on Arizona's death row. In the meantime, I do see a few questions. Melissa Ward is asking, "Did you find the one of the Alexanders?" I know that our uh, editors they're looking through archives right now, so we'll be gathering g gathering. More and more of that old footage. Uh, Melissa's talking about uh, the Alexanders pleading with the jury yeah. uh, in the first trial. So we will be able to pull that for you guys. I don't know what time I'll have that, but I will have that. And then I noticed that someone else, oh, Patrick, Patrick Renfro, had asked if there were any archived footage of the news reports at the time of the murder, before we knew it was Jody. Mm, we'll That's actually a really a good, good question yeah. and suggestion. In fact, I'm going to go ask my bosses because I think it would be great to go back and look at the story before we knew all this stuff. It would be really fun to watch. So, meantime, I'm going to play this clip real quick, and uh, I'll be back with you guys shortly. Two of them killed young children. One killed an invalid husband who was dying of cancer. All three given the ultimate punishment. Death. Deborah Milkey. Wendy Andriano and Shauna Ford. And all three of them are here at the Perryville State Prison in Goodyear, behind these fences, inside those buildings right behind me. And with the cooperation of the Department of Corrections, Fox 10 gets to take you inside. The prison is just north of Interstate 10 near Cotton Lane. The unit containing death row is right here. It's called the Lumley Unit. And this is what a death row cell looks like in Lumley. The prisoners are locked down inside the cell 23 hours a day. Before their hour out, they're put in shackles and walk to a small cage-like enclosure for recreation. And the three women sharing this fate? Let's begin with Deborah Milkey, the woman with the most tenure on Arizona's death row, nearly 23 years. Just before Christmas in 1989, Milkey and two accomplices told Milkey's young son Christopher he was going to meet Santa Claus at Metro Center Mall. Instead, he was taken out into the desert near 99th Avenue and Happy Valley Road, where he was shot in the head and dumped. Prosecutors proved Milky thought the boy was a burden and wanted him dead. Just before she was taken to death row, she sat down with Channel 10 reporters for her only on-camera interview. I don't have just one tragedy, I have two. 
you know. And the first one is the loss of Christopher, and the second one is being charged and going through this legal stuff and being convicted of it on top of it. This is what Milky looks like now, and to this day, she still maintains her innocence. The next woman on Arizona's death row, Wendy Andriano. Back in October of 2000, Wendy Andriano and her husband Joe were the managers of the San Riva apartment complex here in Ahwatukee. Joe had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He was very weak, and Wendy apparently was tired of caring for him. So she started poisoning him. And when that wasn't working quickly enough, she stabbed him and beat him to death with a bar stool. And if you're watching the Jody Arias case, the prosecutor in this case is going to look very familiar. This individual was somebody who was and did kill her husband. It's Juan Martinez, the same man who is now trying to put Jody Arias on death row. And he went after Wendy then, the same way he's going after Jody now. Yes, sir. That's not true. That's not true. That's a lie. Yes, sir. Andriano was convicted of premeditated murder in 2004. This is what she looks like today. And finally, Shauna Ford. She and her vigilante group burst into a home in southern Arizona in 2009, hoping to steal drug money to fund their anti-illegal immigrant activities. But there was no drug money, no drug dealers, and she and her accomplices shot and killed a man and his nine-year-old daughter. Three women, all found guilty of terrible crimes and all now awaiting their final punishment. All right, again, you're watching a story from a couple years ago when we were covering uh, the Jody Arias trial the first time around. That was a story that Troy did. Now, uh, a lot of it still applies, though. I mean, you saw what it would be like for Jody if she was put on death row. What are your thoughts on this? What do you think about everything that you saw in Troy's story, um, what Jody's experience would be like? And I want to know, do you guys think, I mean, I know there are a lot of passionate people out there in the chat room right now urging for justice for Travis. Um, and I know there's a lot of passion there. Now that we have waited uh, a number of hours, uh, the jury has continued to deliberate. Do you think that the jury is going to come back with a death row punishment? Or do you think it's going to be life in prison? I'm asking you what your thoughts are in terms of what you think is going to happen, not what you want to happen. I would love to read your thoughts in the comment section right now and see uh, what you guys think and read them live on air. In the meantime, um, while I get that... 47 minute raw interview with Jody Arias ready. I want to play another story. This is a non Jody Arias related story, but I thought it was really interesting and weird and just like I have to share this with you. Basically, a bank robber, you could say he chickened out. He attempted to rob a bank and then he decided to wait at the bank for police to uh, capture him. And so I want to play this for you guys now. Um, and uh, we should be back in a couple minutes with that uh, full Arius interview. Just after 9 a.m. Wednesday morning at Cleburne's first financial bank on Main Street. We have just received a note from a person sitting in our lobby stating that this is a robbery. It was the draft of a bank robbery. The bank CEO makes a 911 call. There is no, no threatening anything about it. Uh, at this point in time, but I don't know what's next. Cleburne police say the note instructed the teller not to activate an alarm or place dye packets with the money. With stolen cash in hand, this is where the story doesn't make sense. Kind of funny, he came in past this note and then he went and sat down with his back to the teller. With his back to the teller? Yes. The arrest affidavit says instead of a getaway, 57-year-old Harold Collins grabs a seat in the lobby and waits for police to get there just crazy that he didn't leave. I don't understand why he just sat there. They're directing him on the floor. I think they're putting cuffs on him right now. Kind of shocked. I mean, why would anybody have the money in their hand and just sit there? You know, most people would just burn off. Those that know Collins say it's hard to believe he's now in the Johnson County Jail booked on a robbery charge. Never it would even crossed my mind. Brandon Heater knows Collins as a kind, positive person who lived nearby with family. I, I couldn't believe it happened in Cleveland, first off, and then you know, later on I found out it Harold, and I was like, oh my goodness, it blew my mind, honestly. Heater says a few months ago he gave a ride to Collins and says he didn't appear angry in need of money or show any trace he was dealing with a problem. We talked about just showing diff diff people love and how we have to supposed to do things in this world, but... People have their off days sometimes. He must have been off his rocker or something. With no gun and no getaway, for now the only thing held up 
is a reason for the robbery. Don't judge anyone for one single action. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Such a crazy story, that story out of Texas. Now I have one more story, one more weird robbery story, and then I promise right after that, the 47-minute interview, the raw clip with Jody Arias. Just one more because I feel like it's sort of relevant since we're talking about burglars and robbers and things like that. Here is a caught-on-camera situation where a burglar uh, slipped on ice while uh, attempting to commit this crime. Um, because, you know, even though cold weather is not so pleasant... In this case, it looks like the cold weather came in handy. They broke from here, and then they opened the door. Hassan Chaudhry wasn't home when burglars broke into his Upper Darby home Monday night, but he says they left behind a trail of blood, a pile of broken glass, and lots of evidence for police. We got samples of that blood and hopefully we'll be able to do some DNA testing on it to see if we can come up with a baby. This was the first time I never thought of it. This has been very safe neighborhood. Chaudhry says the burglars were inside for a while drinking beer and stealing all kinds of items before they fled. They got few old clothes, one old TV, and few things I don't know. Mostly, tools, stuff like they, that. they got tools. The burglars' escape was caught on tape as they tried to get down this icy driveway between Chaudhry's home and his neighbor's house. Let's say they were a little too light on their feet. One of the two took a header. The way they're walking, it looks like a female, but maybe they're limping because of the fall. Was that their just reward for uh, robbing your house, falling on their <laughs> butt like that, or what? <laughs> that was a good remark. Superintendent Chitwood says the burglars got more than they bargained for with this escape route, caked with ice for a good 50 feet. He's hoping someone will recognize the pair from their less than graceful departure. We're hoping that somebody can take a look at the video and help us identify these uh, individuals. I hope they catch them. So at least we are robbed, somebody else will be saved. Well, you can hear that the victim in that situation, the house owner, uh, definitely wants the suspect to be caught, or the people involved in the situation, to get the punishment that they deserve, which is my transition into Jody Arias. I know a lot of you guys want justice for Travis. A lot of you guys want to see uh, Jody get the justice you think she deserves. A lot of you out there in the chat window uh, demanding the death penalty. I did ask a question a few minutes ago about what you guys thought in terms of what would actually happen. Not what you want to happen, but what you think will happen given what we've seen over the course of the last 24 hours. And and I uh, clipped some of your guys' comments. Barb F. saying, since we have a juror wanting to trade places with an alternate, I bet we have a mistrial. Linda Bell saying, I think the death penalty is absolutely just in this case, but unfortunately, I think she'll get life without parole. Jack Carver is saying he predicts a locked jury. And Barb F. is saying, why would a, juror, a sitting juror say they wanted to trade place with an alternate number two? So uh, obviously, uh, Barb is insinuating that there's some conflict as to whether you were able to put someone uh, on death row or not. Maybe that juror individually is having trouble with it and that is uh, her opinion. So I guess I've been teasing it. I've been teasing it. I've been teasing it. I don't want to lead you guys on anymore. So I think it's time that I pull this video up and you guys sit back and watch 47 minutes of raw interview with Jody Arias. Now this is an interview that Troy did a couple of years ago. We had aired a seven minute version of the interview, the one that aired on TV yesterday here on News Now. Well, we've pulled the entire video and I have it for you guys now to watch. Enjoy, leave your comments. I'll try to grab some of your comments and read them after we air this whole clip. And we'll talk more about this once this uh, clip is over. Again, this is a very raw interview. You're getting all the behind the scenes uh, footage, uh, behind the scenes look of exactly how these interviews work. Everything from uh, putting a mic on, sitting down, talking to them. This is raw, straight from our archives.
Right now you can't hear anything because this is uh, right before the interview took place. The mic isn't on yet. So in case you guys are thinking that your speakers aren't working, don't worry. Uh, we will have, uh, you will hear Jody in just a second. All right, guys, it looks like we're having a couple technical difficulties with the audio from this specific story. So give us just a couple minutes and we will have that audio for you guys now. In the meantime, I want to send you guys over to the White House where Press Secretary Josh Ernest is speaking. We're going to go ahead and listen in on what Josh Ernest is saying. And in just a couple minutes, we'll be able to get that uh, full Doty area story for you with all the audio as well. Right now, there's no reason that this shouldn't get resolved. Uh, what's being considered by the United States uh, Senate is a, a piece of legislation that would fund the Department of Homeland Security through the remainder of this fiscal year. Uh, it would not include any ideological or politically motivated riders, uh, but it would reflect the bipartisan compromise about appropriate funding levels for that agency. Uh, I'm always I'm routinely loath to make predictions about what's going to happen uh, when it comes to Congress. But right now, I think everybody expects that that piece of legislation, once it actually comes up for a vote, will get bipartisan support. And so the question then uh, will be whether or not the uh, House, Speaker of the House is going to put it on the floor. Because again, we know that if that piece of legislation that passes the Senate with bipartisan support is put on the floor of the House of Representatives, it would also pass with bipartisan support. So uh, the question right now is a, is a question for uh, senators in both parties as they consider that piece of legislation. I think we. Uh, have an expectation about what, they, what, about what that outcome is going to be, uh, then the question, I think, will rest with uh, the Speaker of the House. And if it's necessary for the President to speak to him directly about how important it is to fund the Department of Homeland Security, uh, he'll have that conversation. But I would anticipate that the Speaker of the House understands the stakes uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this action. Uh, and we're hopeful that he will take uh, the responsible course uh, and allow that bipartisan bill that would fund the agency for the uh, remainder of this year uh, to come up for a vote and pass the House of Representatives. And then I just have one question on Israel. Is the decision to send Susan Rice and Samantha Power to APAC this weekend, is that part of an effort to kind of dial down the rhetoric that's just been getting hotter and hotter on both sides? Well, uh, Nancy, I think the participation of Ambassador Power and uh, National Security Advisor Rice is consistent with the kind of administration participation you've seen in previous APAC conferences. Uh, the President has spoken uh, a couple of times over the course of his tenure in the White House. I know the Vice President has spoken over there at least once during that conference. Uh, but it's not at all uncommon for senior administration officials to also uh, speak at that conference, and that's what will happen this year. And uh, certainly, uh, if people, if it's perceived by some as an effort to demonstrate bipartisan support for the relationship uh, between the United States and Israel, then that would be great. That would be a great conclusion. That certainly is the kind of investment that has characterized uh, this administration's management of that relationship. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way that everyone has participated in this uh, dispute over the last several weeks. And we are hopeful uh, that we can ba get back to a place where the national security of the United States, most importantly, but also the national security of Israel can be enhanced 
by ensuring that our relationship is not subjected to uh, partisan turbulence. Mm -hmm. Jeff. Josh, what role did the U.S. play in the unmasking of all right, guys, it looks like we have fixed those technical difficulties courtesy of our social media manager and tech expert, Jeff Moriarty. He just came over and was able to fix that audio issue. I apologize for those of you who've been waiting very, you guys have been waiting patiently to watch this raw clip, the 47 minute interview with uh, Jody Arias. I've listened to it now. I hear the audio. We have it coming for you now. Stay tuned. Showing it to you guys now with audio. You want to do a mic check on both of us? Can I get you to count to 10, Jody? Yes. Okay, you want to do it one more time for me? I'm sorry. Great. And if you could put that uh, mic cord back behind her again, please, Robert. So if you need to leave for any reason, if you want to stop, because you know, I don't know if you want that noise in the background of the sliding doors opening up. Okay. It's pretty heavy. No, we should mechanical. be good. We'll go, we'll go straight through here. Get my notes up. Everybody's good? You look nice. They've got you lit really well. They've got you lit really well. Remember, waist up, no stripes. Yep. Either one of you guys, okay? We good? Okay. Um, just a couple of minutes ago, you heard the verdict from the jury. What are your thoughts? Um, I think I just went blank. Just, um, I mean, I just feel overwhelmed. I think I just need to. Was it unexpected, do you think, this verdict? It was unexpected for me, yes, because there was nothing I could have done to make you have things look that way. But I didn't expect premeditation. I could see maybe the felony murder because of how the law is written, but I didn't, the whole time I was fairly confident I wouldn't get premeditation because there was nothing. It seemed, and you got a lot of questions from the jury, it seemed like some of those jurors didn't believe what you were telling them, didn't believe your story. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I can understand that, I think, because of what I was, the lies that I told in the beginning to try to cover up this, cover up that, hide things that I didn't want to be known in the public. Why did you lie at the beginning? Um, well, mostly because I was scared, but I also didn't want certain aspects of my relationship with Travis to come out. And um, I was ashamed of what had happened, how it happened, how it escalated. Um, I don't know if there's really a word, in, at least in my vocabulary, to describe it, but I think mortified is one of the closest words. Ashamed, things like that. You, um, did you avoid eye contact with Travis's family while you were in there, or did you make eye contact, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, typically avoided eye contact. Travis comes from a family where they all sort of look a lot alike. So when I see their faces, I see Travis. And I see the man that abused me. And I don't want to look at that. Um, 
Is it hard? Do you have a sense of where the, the public feeling is about you? Whether you're liked or not liked? I mean, I get the sense that there is great division on both sides, but I believe the majority is against me. What are your thoughts on that? Um, a psychologist once explained to me that society has this need to um, persecute people to get some sort of gratification from it. So there might be something going on there. Um, beside that, I, I don't really, it's so convoluted that we could talk for hours on that. But um, it just is what it is. You, um, in just a recent, and we'll talk about Twitter in a second, but in just a recent tweet you were talking about, you just mentioned the word suicide. I mean, how are you feeling right now? Well, I'm not really looking forward to what comes next, but. Explain that to me. Um, well, I just, just more court, it just keeps going on and on. I just want, wanted to get it over with. Are you focusing on the court, or are you focusing on what could be the, the worst outcome for you? Well, the worst outcome for me would be natural life. I would much rather die sooner than later. Longevity runs in my family, and I don't want to spend the rest of my natural life in one place. Um, you know, I'm pretty healthy. I don't smoke. And I would probably live a long time, though that's not something I'm looking forward to. Um, I said years ago that I'd rather get death than life, and that still is true today. I believe death is the ultimate freedom, so I'd rather just have my freedom soon, as soon as I can get it. So you're saying you actually prefer getting the death penalty to being in prison for life? Yes. That might surprise some people. Well, I think that if you look at um, things eternally, it's not as scary. I mean, we do get attached to our life, and I'm attached to mine. But, um, I don't know, I just can't fathom staying in one spot for the rest of my life. So I've been everywhere. And uh, I think it would just drive me a little crazy. You uh, had some clashes with Juan Martinez. You kind of went after him on Twitter a little bit. What are your thoughts on Juan? certain things, hoping it would just go away. But in the end, what does it matter? It didn't help my case. As far as all the evidence that did come to light eventually. All right. um, in trial, I think that um, his accusation that I was seeking fame is, is absurd. Um, I remember a hearing we had in 2011 when he stood up before the court and said, I don't control the media. If it were up to me, I'd be on TV every night. So hmm. I think he's the one seeking fame, not me. But, you know, it is what it is. You uh, had some, some pretty tough things, I would imagine, to go through in the trial. During the trial, there were photographs of you displayed. Uh, I noticed you tended to look away. What were you thinking when those photographs were being flashed up in front of everybody? If you had to look at some of the tougher uh, parts of what you've been through for the last four months, what would they be? Just coming to fully understand what I've put people through, my family and everyone else as well. That's the part I always regret. Tell me more about that. What do you mean? Well, just the way everything happened, um, I think that if I had just been honest from the beginning, I'd be in a different place, and so would everyone else. And um, because of what I've done, 
a lot of people will hurt for a long time. It's got to be a tough uh, time for you, obviously, just learning what happened. But you're telling me that if you would have done things differently, do you, do you regret how you went about doing things after Travis was killed, after you killed Travis? Yeah, I think that I was just freaked out. Well, I know I was freaked out. Um, I didn't know what to do. I, did, I knew that I couldn't just carry on as normal, but I tried to do that. I tried to act that part until, you know, until everything came down. I just, I just couldn't imagine going to my family and saying, okay, look what happened, or going to the police and saying, you arrest me. Um, I was just horrified with what had happened, and it was difficult to face that, you know, that I had been pushed to that point and that I could be capable of something like that. And let's talk a little bit about what happened um, after you were at Travis's that night and that day. A lot of people who have talked to me about it have said, how could she have gone up and been with another man, you know, basically 24 hours after this? How were you able to put that behind you and basically go on a date? I don't think I so much put it behind me as I just sort of checked out. I hardly remember that day. Um, I don't remember it being nearly as intimate as he described. I remember falling asleep and taking a nap and he was lying next to me. Um, I remember feeling it's strange, but I remember feeling safe. He wasn't going to snap. He wasn't going to, you know, take advantage of me or try to do things I'm uncomfortable with. Um, I just felt safe with that person, but I knew that, I mean, it's not like I went up there because I was hoping to pursue a relationship. Right. I went up there because I thought, oh crap, I need to keep my schedule. So I went up there almost because I felt a sense of obligation inside in order to keep up the pretense, not because I was going off to have fun. But it's odd even to me, and I don't know you at all, but I, I feel like I know a little bit about you. But you, really, you look at your hands and you realize what's happened. Yeah. And at that point, you say to yourself, I've got to go up and meet this person. I'm going to keep that appointment. I'm going to keep that date. How do, I don't understand how that goes through your mind. Well, how, what happened was um, I slowly began to come to while I was in the desert. And um, um, when I found my charger and I turned my phone on, there were tons of voicemails. Um, one from Leslie, I think a few from Leslie, maybe one from Ryan. And I realized these people are wondering where I am. And I thought, I just felt like I needed to myself some time and figure out what had happened. I was just very, I was very shocked. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I'd like to go over just a couple of things in the case if I could. Um, when your grandparents' gun went missing, that's what most people point to as the point where you basically made the decision that I'm going to go down there and do this. What, what do you say to people when they make that point? Well, I was really hoping the defense would call my sister because I spent the day with her. and. Um, we weren't at the house when that happened. We weren't even in Barlica. We were out of town. We were um, actually in no town. We were out in the middle of almost nowhere at a Buddhist monastery near the border out of Oregon, California, taking pictures. I was really hoping my defense team would um, recover those pictures. They're on another hard drive that stopped working that they never made an issue of. Those photos on there um, are date and time stamped and they show that I'm out of town um, during that time. So that was my hope, that we could show the jury that it was nowhere near that area. I mean, that's what's really helpful. So you're sticking by that part of your story, for oh, sure. Absolutely, yeah. Let's talk about the gas cans. That's another thing that keeps being brought up all the time. Was there a third gas can? Um, there was initially when I purchased it, right. but I, I really did return it. I got $13 and change back, and I went on my way. A lot of people are saying, who, who carries gas in the trunk of their car? I didn't fill it up until I realized I was going to be driving across the desert um, on a highway alone that I've never driven at night. And um, it's something that we began to do when I moved to the desert because they didn't want to get stranded somewhere. Um, just being from the coast, 120 degrees is a, a shock to your system. So we sort of um, would travel with provisions and things like that 
so not always gas, but I was taking a road that I'd never traveled before. And um, suddenly being safe was more important than saving a few dollars in gas, which was my initial goal. And uh, the other thing that keeps coming up, or the jury seemed to have issues with as well, was the lack of memory over the attack. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that to me? Sure. Um, I think it's been described how certain memories come back with time and rather than get worse. And I've experienced a little bit of both. The memories have come back. It's not just completely blank. Little things have come back here and there that I remember. Uh, have, have things come back since we began talking about this, since the trial started? These things have come back within the last year, two years, things have been popping up and coming back. And I testified to that a little bit, um, just different scenarios that have research. I don't want to get into the details. Okay. Um, so I, I just, I can't explain it. I think I have a good memory, and it's almost like I blacked out, but, I mean, obviously it wasn't unconscious. Um. You're talking about your defense a little bit, and you wish they would have done this and done that. Are you happy with your defense? I'm grateful for my defense. That's not happy, though. Um, not 100 percent, but they've worked very hard. What would you have changed? Um, there is a man who saw me with bruises all over. I would have made every effort to find him, and they didn't. who saw me with bruises. Um, my friends, my sisters, and the defense didn't call them for their own reasons, and I think that that would have cooperated some of the things that I said on the hard drive that we just discussed, um, the one that was not part of my trial. There are photographs during that time, and I think there might have been a photograph on there. Maybe, maybe not. We wouldn't know unless we looked. Of, but, of your bruises, you're yeah. saying? I took pictures of myself during that time, not specifically for that purpose. The Lazarus effect is... I just keep thinking of the lady that was in that photo. Um, tons of things. You know, um, what I hear from women a lot is if she was getting beat up, why didn't she call the police? That's why didn't she tell? Scared of the consequences for him and scared a little bit for me of calling the police and getting them involved, getting the law involved. And um, I didn't want that to happen to him. I, I just wanted him to go on and be happy and be successful, and I wanted the same for myself. Um, let's talk about your family for a little bit. Your mom has been um, there for you every day in the courtroom. What are your thoughts on her? Is that the hardest part, thinking about your mom? Yeah. My mom and my whole family. Yeah, that's difficult. As far as my mom, I feel like I don't deserve her. She's been a saint, and I've not treated her very well. There was some talk about you getting physical with your mother. Did that happen in terms of fighting and things like that? Um, I vaguely remember the incident. I think when they say I kicked her, we were arguing and she was kicking me under the table. And I think I kicked her back. I was a teenager. She did everything she could to keep us under control. So. 
she uh, visits you often, what do you talk about? What happens during the good visits? Um, usually she's telling me um, stories about things that are happening with my family or my friends or how many um, emails and messages of support that she's getting. People that support my family and you know, moral support that they're behind us and that makes me feel good. What about, the, what about the bad visits? What are they like? They're usually um, just discussing unpleasant things, um, frustrating times, things that are frustrating sometimes. And it just, it's a drag. Um, your artwork is all over the place. Do you take... Uh, pride in the fact that people are paying money for your art? Um, it's interesting. Um, I take pride just not so much in the price tag, but in the way I've developed the gift itself, or the talent, I should say. I take pride in that. I'm just, I'm happy that I'm able to share it with the world. Um, I noticed that... Um, and I saw this on another network, so I, I don't know 100% if it's correct, but uh, that you buy large amounts from the commissary. And then you tweeted out that you, it's not only for you. Tell me about what you do behind bars when it comes to the commissary. Yeah, um, after I was arrested, I'm no longer working or going to church, and so I'm not tithing anymore to the church. But the church encourages you to tithe 10%, so what I do is I take 10% of the dollar amount that I spend, and I give that away. And then recently I've been blessed with the ability to spend a little bit more, so I'm able to give more. And I've been glad to be able to do that. Are you still practicing your faith? Um, I don't think I... I'm still a member of the LDS Church, but I'm not actively practicing my faith at this point. Um, they don't offer LDS services for maximum security inmates, and the Mormons rarely come around to visit. So I still have a solemn way for that. I don't know. I still have my scripture. I still read it. But it's hard to maintain um, an active status in the church when you're sort of cut off from it. You say the Mormons don't come around to visit you. Who are you talking about? Um, they have, well, they do come, but maybe like once or twice a year. They are volunteers that are members of the church that go to jails, prisons, um, facilities where people are incarcerated to visit them. The uh, Alexander family, uh, especially the, the two sisters uh, and the younger brother, if you could say something to them, what would you like to say to them? Do you still think about Travis? Yes. In what way? Um, there's a lot of regret because I was really hoping to get a plea and avoid talking about all of the things that came out about him. Um, if we had been able to avoid trial, we could have avoided just the murkier aspects of his life that he kept hidden. And these aren't just things that came from my mouth. They're his own words, his own emails, his own text messages. You know, the activity that he was up to, photographs that show that as well. 
none of that ever would have come to light. It would have just been forgotten, and he would be immortalized as um, not perfect by any means, but somebody who was known to adhere to his morals and the principles that he espoused. But now the curtain has been drawn, and we can see the hypocrisy and everything that was there. And I regret that because I know that even though he was living the life of a hypocrite, that's not how he wanted to be perceived, and I think inside he really didn't want to live that kind of life. There were some parts of your story that were definitely backed up by emails and texts and phone conversations and things like that, but a lot of people had real issues with the pedophilia when that was brought up. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, again, I mean, he's fantasizing about having sex with a 12-year-old on the tape. That's a pedophile by definition. Um, also, there's a photograph on my hard drive which my attorneys didn't feel was relevant, but it's a picture of him chasing around a naked four-year-old boy with his Bible open, pretending to be a Catholic priest. I don't know why we were all hanging out. I thought it was silly at the time. I snapped the photograph, and um, at the time, I just thought he was mocking the Catholic Church in poor taste, and, and then that was that. But that was a year before I walked in on him, and so after that incident of walking in on him, I began to put all these things together, and that was one of the puzzle pieces that seemed to make sense to me. A lot of people accusing you of tearing down a dead man's reputation. I would have been very happy to remain silent and go quietly into the night off to prison. My defense team decided to rip the lid off because we were forced to trial. Um, the state didn't want to settle. So it's not that I wanted to plow ahead and do this. I took the stand because strategically they advised me to, and when I was on the stand, I had to tell, I had to answer the questions that were posed to me. So if you had to do this all over again, you're in the desert, you notice that you've got blood on your hands, how do you handle it? I would turn around and drive to the Mesa Police Department. And what do you think would have happened to you then? I don't know that it would have been the right thing. Let's go forward. Let's say you do get a long sentence. How are you going to spend your life? I haven't decided yet. Um, Talk to me again, if you can, briefly, about wanting to hurt yourself. Do you feel like you want to hurt yourself right now? Not right now. I think I've gone in and out of periods of that since 2007. There was some talk about me being uh, suicidal in high school. I never was. I think I might have written words, something along the lines of wanting to die, but that's distinctly different from wanting to actually kill myself. So I never was. It, I found it strange at the time that after I had gotten into the church and I gave the testimony of the church, so my uncle went suicidal. I didn't understand that. But I never did anything, so it could just be talk. It could just be purging my thoughts, um, that kind of thing. Um, you're tweeting. Talking about Twitter. Was that your idea? Um, initially... I've never been on Twitter. I don't even know what it looks like. I just have heard about it through other people reading about it in magazines. Um, in 2009, somebody started a false Twitter account in my name and began tweeting, pretending they were me. So I had that shut down. Um, and then it, it just became sort of an idea that I thought of in February. Are you happy you have? Yes. Well, Why? I wouldn't say happy. I mean, I don't regret it. Right. What has it brought to you? Um, I think there's a little bit of satisfaction gained from being able to um, just impart my ideas and my thoughts and sort of let people 
you know where I'm coming from. Whoever wants to look, I don't have to read it if you don't like it. So. Right. Uh, you went after Nancy Grace there a couple times. You want to talk about Nancy? I don't think she's worth it. Juan, you also went after there. Yeah, I just found it a very highly hypocritical that he would point to me and call me legitimate a liar when he's lied over and over on record in court over the years. Um, I wish I had the ability to comb through those records and say right here he lied, right here he lied, right here he lied, but he's not the one on trial. So in that sense, it doesn't matter that he lied, but in another sense it does because of the important position that he held. Um, we have, how am I doing on time, Lisa? Okay. Um, you've got a mitigation hearing coming up here, or at, um, at penalty phase. Tell me what, do you know what your mitigating factors are going to be and how you're going to play it out? Um, well, I've been told that I don't have any mitigating factors. By who? Um, my attorney. So, Kirk Nurmi you're talking about? Kirk Nurmi said to you there are no mitigating factors for you in terms of arguing against the death penalty? Um, nothing that is what you typically see in a case like this, such as um, a childhood where there was drugs, alcoholism, molestation, things like that. None of those things occurred in my family. Um, so, I don't know. I guess we would sort of joke that my mom didn't beat me hard enough. So I don't really have mitigation. So what are you going to do? I talked to the attorney in the, in who's handling it. Um, she seems like a very pleasant woman. She says she's got a week-long case. Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that um, they feel that I would be a suitable candidate to behave myself in um, a correctional facility and just not be a problem. Did you uh, have any knowledge of, you know, the interest in your case? Do you have an idea of how many people are interested? Um, I hear things, but I have no access to the news, the internet, that sort of thing. No direct access. What kinds of things do you hear? Um, I do get the newspaper, so that's been one portal where I've learned things. Um, a lot of inmates have come in the jail since then and they tell me um, they want to come up and shake my hand, they want to give me a hug, they want to, they want my autograph, you know, I'm not going to sign anything. They just, they want a piece of something, but, so it's, it's kind of strange, but that's given me an idea. That has to be strange, huh? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think when somebody comes up and asks you for your autograph? Why don't you sign things? Um, my goal isn't fame. I just, my goal is just to get through this. So I certainly didn't want that to, to give off that impression. Pretty, uh, a quote or a sound bite from your trial that's played over and over again. And you even smiled at it in court was Kirk Nurmi saying nine days out of ten, even he doesn't like you. Yeah. What did you think when he said that? Um, I thought of, um, I actually thought of Elizabeth Johnson's trial because I was reading the coverage in the paper and her attorney said, told the jury that it's important. Um, well, I'm paraphrasing, but he told them that it's not about whether or not you like her. It's about the facts of the case. So I think it was, um, I think it might, I believe it's standard somewhat that, um, need to remember it's not about whether or not you like the defendant. Um, Does Kirk like you? I think nine days out of ten. I mean... Nine days out of ten. One day out of ten he likes you. One day out of ten. Yeah. Why don't you get along? Or do you? Actually, we got along very well for a long time and then we just have had clashes um, in ideas and ultimately he's the boss.
Anything you want to say to Juan Martinez? Um, you seem to be writing quite a bit during testimony, or were you drawing? What were you doing? I was writing. Just thoughts. When I heard something with testimony, I would write notes, pass it to Jennifer, pass it to Kirk, things like that, just to get them informed. So you weren't drawing? There might be occasional little scribbles in the margins, but no, no drawing. No drawing at that point. Anything else you want to talk about? Ivan? Actually, there is one more thing yes. I wanted to say. Um, if I could um, tell somebody in a situation that I was in anything, I just would encourage them to document it. I think that I, it doesn't mean they have to turn the person in or betray them, but should a situation ever arise, I think documentation would have been really helpful in the case. And. Um, My sister is going through um, something right now with her ex-husband, and there are um, a lot of things that she could have documented that would help her. So it surprises me that even as she knows about what I've gone through, she still fails to document these things. And it's so easy. Save these text messages, save these incidents, write these things down, make reports. Um, but they don't. People just don't do that. I don't know why women don't do that. I mean, some do. No, it's not black and white, it's not 100%, but if we could just make a record, then that record will stand should something happen down the line. You've actually started, um, at least uh, you tweeted out that you're selling t-shirts for a domestic violence shelter. Do you plan to continue those efforts? Yes. Why do you do that? Um, my, uh, well, I, I assume that they were doing okay as is with government funding and things like that, just donations, but I've spoken with some people who have worked in those shelters and they always need donations. And um, it's important to me to be able to assist them in being able to assist survivors. So I guess I'll wrap it up by saying, and you talked about domestic violence, um, a lot of people are going to be, see, going to be, a lot of people are going to be seeing this. Is there one thing you'd like to get out to all those people? Do you mean um, people in general? Yes. I'm sure I'll think of something very clever to say later. <laughs> As you walk out, yeah. I can understand that. I guess what I really want to say is to um, other women who are in a situation that I was once in, and it's like I just, like I just said, I really just, I wish they would just document it. That's it. If you don't have to do anything with it, if you don't have to turn the person you love in, you don't have to do anything. Just document it, just in case. It's better to have it and not need it than the opposite. And um, again, I think that things would be very different right now if I had documented all of the things that I went through instead of being in a state of denial. What would you like to say to all the people who seem to really dislike you, even, even hate you? Maybe I should be flattered that they focus on me so much. If they dislike me so much, then why am I always on their radar? I'm Ivan Bellamy. I'm Troy's executive producer. Thank you for doing this. Um, do you, you were just talking about people that don't like you. Mm -hmm. Do you care at all? I mean, does it matter to you that people like you or don't like you? Is it going to matter to you wherever you end up if you let answer Troy? Um, at age 32, it doesn't matter. Um, I think when I was arrested at age 28, it bothered me. And um, even before my arrest, before I ever imagined my life going this direction, if I knew someone didn't like me, it, it would gnaw at me in the back of my mind. But at this point, I can truly say it's like water off a duck's back. Um, I've reached a place. I wish I'd reached this place years ago, but I think it just comes with age. But I've reached a place where it, it really doesn't bother me. What about the domestic violence? groups that don't believe your story and say, we don't want your help. There's some people out there saying that, you know, keep your t-shirts, keep your efforts, we don't believe you. Okay. I'm not aware of um, any organizations that help survivors of domestic violence that are calling a survivor of domestic violence, um, saying that they don't believe that person. That's, um, that's 
one of the things I sent out to spend through it. Through it. Um, it would be like a child running and telling somebody what's going on with them and the parent says, I don't believe you, or an authority figure says, I don't believe you. Hmm. So you can imagine what it does to that person. Um, and then I have a question about the jury. You obviously you think they got it wrong, correct? As far as premeditation, I know they got it wrong. Um, so it's like felony murder. I think that's uh, a very ugly law sitting in my position. But as far as the way the law is written, I think I can understand how someone reached that conclusion. So what's your message to the jury right now? Well, I don't know that I have a direct message for the jury. I know that um, I pray constantly for every single one of them. So that's the jury that was brought to me. That's the jury that I was meant to have. So you, you pray for the jury? I pray prior to trial that the right jurors would be on the case. So um, I just have to believe that those were the right jurors. And the last question I have is, going back to when you were on the stand and Juan Martinez was cross-examining you, it was really tense. It felt like you were giving back as much as he was giving. What was going through your mind? What really did you want to say had there been no constraints on what to say at that point? I would have said a lot more. Um, you want to say it now? Well, I can't. I would have to think back to a specific incident. Well, you told him he was scrambling your brain because he was yelling at you. I do remember that. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking when he was yelling at you? Um, I probably shouldn't say. Okay. There were a lot of times when he was beating up on other witnesses, more like attacking the messenger rather than the message, and I just wanted to be able to jump into their body and respond for them just because I feel like he is um, a bully. I actually kind of expected you when he would go after you like that to, to shrink away or cry or be like, Why? but instead you, you did stand up to him. Was yeah, that? I think that if um, it had been any sooner than trial, they take a long time to finally get here. If it had been any sooner, I would have melted. I would have just fallen apart. Um, but my confidence came on the stand knowing that I'm, I'm up there and I'm ready to speak the truth and I know that I was, I know what happened. And that gave me a sense of inner strength to handle him. He can throw whatever curveballs he wants. I know what, the, I know what happened and I'll answer it. What are you gonna do tomorrow? I have court. Um, I don't know. What's tonight gonna be like? I'm hoping. Knowing, knowing now the decision, what's, how is the tonight going to be different than every night up leading up to today? Um, well, I thought a lot about that, and um, I had a list of things that I wanted to do with my life if I were blessed with a second chance. So there are still things on that list I might be able to accomplish regardless. Um, but tonight I was going to go back and visit with my family and um, break the news to my friends who have been very supportive. And just business as usual tonight and then we'll see what tomorrow brings. Thank you, Jody. We gotta get all your stuff off you here. I was gonna try to show you what your Twitter page looks like, but we have no service down here. Here's what a home page looks like. That's my home page. So yours is a shot of you in court. Yeah. And then down below is a whole bunch of the groupings of what you write. So you only get 140 okay. characters. Okay. And then you're able to uh, direct message here. That's how Donovan was able to get in touch with me a couple of times. I see. So um, if you ever need to get in touch with me again, you've got my number. And Donovan can all obviously get through and do that there. Thank you. Um, stay in touch. I mean, uh, I don't know what I can do for you on the outside, but you've done a lot for me by sitting down with me today. And I respect the fact that. I read when you gave me your card. Postcard yes. You said you have daughters. I do. And I don't know how old they are, but. 11 and uh, 14. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'm sure you're a great dad. I don't know you, but um, I just, I just would just, daughters are really fragile as far as.
know, I think about that all the time. My wife and I talk about it quite a bit. My 14-year-old had a boyfriend who we weren't really crazy about. It's her first ever boyfriend, and she's still crazy about him, and I'm going back and forth about what to do about it. All right, guys, that has been the full uh, Jody Arias raw interview. That, again, from uh, Troy's uh, interview with Jody Arias from a couple of years ago. I know there was a lot of uh, chatter in our YouTube chat window. I was uh, trying to monitor while, uh, while playing the interview, and I did grab a couple of good points that you guys were making. So I just want to read them out loud, and then you guys can discuss. I know that Troy is going to be here in the newsroom in just a few minutes. I was texting with him earlier, and as soon as I see him, I'm going to bring him up to the set, and we'll talk to him some more. In the meantime, reading some of your uh, comments, you see John Hoffman saying, if Jody was a man, she would be on death row already. Uh, Sue G8R is saying, I hate how she tries to use such big words and sounds so eloquent, blah. Um, Jane Kennedy Ellis is asking, or adding rather, if a man had sex with his victim right before he killed her, it would have been a sex crime to boot. Sue G8R is saying, but mom won't get up and say, quote unquote, save my daughter because they want her to stay locked away from them. They are scared of her. They're finally safe. Uh, Jane Kennedy Ellis had a similar note saying that if her parents were, would have tried to speak for her, it may have helped her, but none of them did. They know she is evil too. Again, these are just comments that I'm reading from our YouTube chat. You might have a differing opinion. If you do, go ahead and put it in the chat. I'll try to read them uh, here live on air. Stephen Frame is saying that, so number two that was dismissed, the uh, juror, wanted to be an alternate, so that's what the whole juror controversy was about today. Uh, that juror, juror was told too bad. And uh, I'm going to actually, when I have Troy up here, I'm going to have him clarify um, the details on all this, uh, on all the latest happenings with the jurors, because he is, or rather he was uh, live at the courtroom all morning. So I'm going to have him here. We'll hear it straight from the source. Troy Hayden, our very own uh, Jody Arias expert, should be here shortly. And you guys can submit questions in the YouTube chat uh, there. For Troy, I know Madison had asked, I want to know how Troy felt about doing this interview. Troy talked about it a little bit yesterday, but I'm going to have him back later today and he'll talk about it again. Uh, join me. Join me, Ron. Hello. I was just, uh, we just wrapped up on the. Uh... Oh, I went the wrong way. No, you just turned <laughs> me off. I was like, what? That's mean. Um, no, we just wrapped up watching 45 minutes of the raw areas. Mm footage yeah so uh, i bet the comments were pretty enlightening huh yeah i mean i was just reading the comments uh there's so many according to kelly davenport the jury just asked for the autopsy photos i don't know any of this information okay i can't confirm it because i have not been on my phone i haven't been checking twitter and i haven't mm -hmm. spoken with troy yet who's out there but troy is going to be here and when he's here we'll be able to ask him everything that you guys want to know another one of the reports that we had over the last few minutes was that they had um told the uh, judge they asked a couldn't we work through our lunch break oh wow so they might they want to have a verdict today if they're working through their lunch break yeah that means they want to drop it today it sounds because like because during celeste live hit she said that the jury was not planning to deliberate tomorrow correct right they which We'll they have a so, choice too, because yeah. normally Fridays are off. But right. as Troy had mentioned yesterday, they have a choice to deliberate tomorrow mm -hmm. if they think they can reach a verdict tomorrow. Right. So if they're going to work through their lunch break, we could be we could get an answer this afternoon. Well, then the second thing they were asking was, okay, if we do take a lunch break, can we take our notebooks with us? Because of course they've been writing notes for the course of this whole sure. thing. Sure. Um, are we able to do that? And the judge said, no, you may not. You can't take your notebooks. Uh, those can only be in the deliberation room with you or in your possession, but you can't be sharing them, you know, if you're out uh, having a sandwich at Stickler's or something. You've got to, uh, you got to make sure that uh, that is in the environment where it's basically more of a sealed environment. So just a couple of interesting insights that shows you, A, they really are working and really do want to uh, 
you know, wrap this thing up and come up with the decision. And B, they're just trying to feel out what the rules are so that they can continue. So I'll just say, don't be surprised at the end of the day. If we don't have a verdict by the end of this day, don't be surprised. That means we'll still be on Arius watch. <laughs> that, don't, yeah, don't be surprised if they say we, we will come back tomorrow then. So, uh, you know, I've been teasing them periodically with different footage that we have from our archives. I yep. tease them and tease them and finally play that 44-minute clip. I know. Well, guess what? One of our viewers, I believe it was Patrick, asked if we had archived footage of the news from way back when this all this was starting. Mm -hmm. It turns out we got some. We got some. Okay. We have some archived footage from uh, 2008. It's actually titled "A uh, Suspect Arrest." So okay. this is early on, like when we're ju we know about this murder and we don't know who did it, kind of thing. This is a very early on news story from almost seven years ago. I'm trying That's to remember. Crazy. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. And I'm actually just going to tease them right now. We're alive. I'm going right. to give them a few minutes. Oh, that's not that's coming up. It's going to come up a little a bit later. Minutes. I just okay. saw uh, I just saw Troy walk in, and I know there's many questions that he needs to answer. So we'll see. Yeah, he's got to got to get that noon broadcast ready, and then maybe hopefully he'll come hang out over here. I don't know if he's coming here first oh, or he's going so. to the noon because I, I know that he and I texted. I wanted to do a phone interview with him at 11:45, and he told me he was going to be in uh, around that time, and I don't even. They don't even know what's happening, guys. Troy is right there. Can you come up? Can you talk now or after Absolutely. the noon? Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, come on in. We could do a... Yeah. Do you want to I'm going to go out? grab a third chair because i got a half a dozen questions for him, too. Oh, or, I could, or I could, we could do the other thing that I do oh, normally. Yeah. If that okay. makes everything easier yeah, for sure. us. Okay, we're going to do this. Um, or maybe a hey, third Rob. chair. What's on the air right now? That's on the air. You're oh. over there. Hello. Mm -hmm. You're far away. But I mean, where this is happening. Yeah. Is this fine? Because I can give you my chair. The only thing is I have to monitor Stop. this chat window that everyone's coming in on. Okay. Are you good sitting there? Yeah. Are you, Troy? Uh, sure. Are okay. you sure? I yeah. can sit there. I'm totally fine sitting there. I do it a lot. No. I'm good. All right. So what's your take on the questions the jury was asking to the judge? Uh, the only stuff that I saw was um, uh, that they wanted to have... Yeah, you know what? This is weird. This is really awkward. Here, guys, <laughs> okay, we're going to switch. switch things up. What yep. we're going to do is grab that other chairs. chair. Yep. Oh, no, I can get back there. Oh, okay. All right. Because I'm small. Yeah. All right, guys, you guys are watching live musical chairs. There you go. Tr literally, Troy just walked in to the newsroom. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'm going to slide over here so that Troy can just pop in and get re ready for the noon show. That way, and that yeah. way you can monitor the Twitter questions too. Okay. Oh, ah, Oop. the YouTube questions. You're right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we do still have some wires. This is fantastic. I know. Everyone's been asking. We need larger sets. We need an extra camera. <laughs> I know. I know. This is cracking up our regular viewers for sure. All right. Uh, here we go. I'm sure they're entertained by this. We'll yeah. get you a little closer. We'll get Ron a little shorter because it's up high for yeah. my seating purposes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right, guys. So, huh. your take on the interaction between the jury and the judge this morning? I think the fact that they're asking for uh, exhibit numbers mm -hmm. uh, and more information means that uh, they're not very close. I think we could be here a while. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, you know, I, Sammy and I were talking about this this morning, saying that... Let me put the, I'm, I'm expecting a couple of really important calls. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay. Let's try. I mean, one of the things we were talking about, uh, if you first joined us at 10 oh, o'clock Arizona time, was it just seems if you follow other cases, and this case obviously is unlike any other that uh, we've seen in a long, long time, but if you do, it's, it's one of those things where... If they don't come up with a fairly instantaneous, like yesterday or maybe through the morning today, uh, announcement of a verdict, it just it feels like the longer it goes, the more there's not dissension necessarily, but debate within the jury pool or within the jury itself, therefore lessening the odds of a unanimous death penalty. Yeah, I, I think the, the, <clears throat> the odds of that now are pretty slim, mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah. Uh, only because, um, you know, uh, here we are, you know, how long they've been sitting there. They've been sitting in this trial all this time. Right. They've been sitting in this deliberation room. They had three solid hours yesterday. Mm -hmm. So they probably took an initial vote of maybe two at the beginning and at the end. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything. I, mm -hmm. You know, is it one holdout? I mean, it, right. uh, you know, will they pound on that person? And I will say that uh, Kirk Nurmi did a really good job yesterday of saying to all those jurors, this is a personal decision. So the decision you make, it's every right. 
that you have to bring oh, that decision into the courtroom. Right. You can bring that with you. You know, you, you don't have to all agree on the same thing. If you say no death, that's legitimate. And as a matter of fact, by jury instructions, you're obligated to take that belief in. Well, now, one of the things that I think, one of the reasons we look forward to having a chance to truly talk to you is that you've looked these jurors, I don't know if you've made eye contact with them, but you've looked at these jurors. Are there certain jurors that, this is this is obviously your reporter's opinion, that you think might be sort of leading the discussion? Did there appear to be one or two or three who, who maybe either more engaged, more involved in note-taking, or might be considered kind of leading the discussion? I don't know. This is a very, very difficult jury to read. I think much more so than the last one. The last one we had jurors who would be visibly upset, or they'd shake their heads every once in a while and do things where they'd be like, whoa, okay, that, what's going on with that jury? None of that this None time? None of that. They were all very difficult to read their faces, even during you know some mm. of the more emotional parts of this. Mm -hmm. As, the only thing I saw them do... Uh, uh, at the very end of closing yesterday was when Kirk Nurmi brought up a CD with some of the sex talk. It was a uh, like a phone sex type deal between Travis and, and uh, Jody. And when he brought up Jody's journal, he uh, wrote down or he talked about the exhibit numbers. And they all grabbed their papers and, and wrote it down right away. And as soon as they did that, I thought, this is not a jury that's got their mind made up. This is a jury that's immediately going, okay, well, I want to see those things. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna, and I'm going to make a note right now as to what mm -hmm. those two things are because I want to see more of that. We're getting every a, single one of them. We're getting a lot of comments on our uh, on our YouTube page. One of them asking uh, from Erica, "Will Jody be wearing stripes when the verdict yes, is read?" Yes, I believe so. She and I, I don't have I don't know that 100, percent but I think so. She was in court today in stripes. You know, at this point, <clears throat> you can't bring. I mean, I guess you could in some jurisdictions, but you don't in Arizona. You don't bring somebody in if you're deciding their fate and have them in stripes and have them in shackles. Right. This is prejudicial. Right. I mean, the second you see somebody walk in in stripes and shackles, you're thinking, oh, criminal, bad person. Sure. Yeah. So you, you want to have the defendant, no matter who it is, right. if it's a man wearing a, a suit or whatever, and sure. because you don't want that to play into it. You want the actions to play into it. Right. But now, when they come in and say, we've got a verdict, I would assume that she's coming in in stripes. I don't know 100%. Was there any type of reaction that you picked up on at all amongst the jurors when Kirk Nurmi said, if you decide on the death penalty, you're killing that girl. To, as we have talked about it and we've been interacting with people in the YouTube box, that seems like one of the key moments. But how did it actually play with the jury? Um, it, it, again, very stoic. It's tough to read their faces, but I know how it played with me. And uh, I'm a father of two girls. And uh, it you know, made me very sad because you see this five-year-old Jody Arias, mm -hmm. who at the time you think is innocent and, you know, just a little kid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now what she's done in between then, obviously, not innocent at all. But when you point to a little kid, you wonder well, what has to happen between the time she's this smiling five-year-old mm -hmm. and now she is in her early 30s facing death. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is. Maybe it did hammer home with some of those jurors. Look, you're not just killing this criminal. You're killing this entire being that has been up to this point. Mm -hmm. And saying, you know, you're, you are taking a life with this vote. Yeah. That's why I think, you know, I, I, part of me thought it might be today mm -hmm. if they all were unanimous on life. That's what I thought was going to be yeah. today. Is that right? That yeah. it could have been that strong? Well, that's quite right. an endorsement for the approach the defense took this time around. Because I mean, we've been talking about the fact that they have tried to really appeal, it feels to, to me anyway, more on an emotional level with this jury as opposed to last time around. Uh, let's put Jody on the stand. No, we're not going to put Jody on the stand this time. We're simply going to show you who she was and make our best argument to you regarding her as a human being. Well, one of the other things, a lot of people are asking this question because we just aired your raw interview with Jody Aries from 2013, all 44 minutes of it. Uh, 44 all, minutes. Yeah, so. that was a lot. We were just watching it I haven't it seen it in its entirety, I think, ever. I mean, how you did you watch it. How did you walk in here and convince our producers 44 minutes, Troy? I can't, I can't get two and a half. <laughs> well, yeah, no. well, <laughs> on a five-hour morning show. They're all asking, A, are you gonna are you going to get another interview with her after the verdict? Is that what they're asking? Well, that's what they're asking. And they're also asking how you felt about doing the interview the first time around. Let me ask you this really quickly. Is this the link that we have? Uh, yeah, it's out. whatever link that we had shared with you earlier. Okay. Uh, uh, let, me, let me get this out. So let him send the this. Twitter link out. Let's watch the numbers rise. <laughs> okay. well. People have been with us like ever since yesterday. I mean, we were on air for six and a half hours straight yesterday. And we were Seven reminded, hours. Troy, of the sort of universal, uh, for whatever reason, 
appeal of this case uh, as I mean literally the, the we just said okay tell us where you're from because we get we see the numbers grow and I mean it was literally from Lugano Switzerland to the state of Maine to uh, high up into uh, British Columbia Dubai yeah Dubai yeah Israel yeah. Israel, mm-hmm. yeah, we were Liverpool, having Liverpool, Ireland, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't, you know, the thing is with this case, um, I think it just is, it has a little bit of everything. It's got people who are anti-death penalty involved and and you know um, upset about it. You see a lot of people from Germany with Deborah Milky too. They were very involved in her case. Mm-hmm. You got people who are involved because the the, the, the titillation, you know, the, the mm-hmm. sexual aspects right. of it. And, oh, sure. Jody's hot, you know. People will say, and mm-hmm. and then you've got a lot of people who are just angry and just hate. Jody and what she did, right. you know. So it's got it's got sex, it's got lies, it's got you know violence. It's, the perfect it's got soap opera. Reality it's got everything. Show. You know, it's a lifetime movie, literally. Right. And it, so, and it, well, and why it have was. people connected with it at that emotional level? Because we read some of the comments, and they're I mean, they're things that we, we can't really even say. But the desire that a lot of people have to uh, basically make sure that she is executed. Uh, I, in in some cases, feels more emotional than just well. I feel that you know that's where the justice system would take us. There's that emotional connection people have. Why? Absolutely, I, I don't know. I, and I was telling Samia yesterday at the height of this thing, I couldn't go anywhere in town without people talking to me about Jody Arias. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Kobe Bryant. Um, I'm trying to think who it was. Kobe Bryant reached out to it was somebody that was covering this case from L.A. and walked up to them and said, what, "What's you know, forget about this? What's the deal with Jody Arias? You know, on the court <laughs> and the Lakers. I mean, wow. everybody was into it. Wow. Yeah, I know, isn't that crazy? Um, wow. So people were just into it. Um, but women uh, between the ages of I'd say 30 and like 60 just hated." Jody, mm-hmm. and can you believe the lies? Can you, you know, and, and men not quite as much. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I always got the feeling that women were like they would look at her and, and see the worst of of, a, of women in her, and they see through her and they see through the lies. That's what they're saying. Yes, mm-hmm. there were a lot of lies. Wow, you know, well, and all maybe a stories. guy is willing to be more open minded. Um, There's always going to be that sort of gender bias, Well, though. because, yeah, I mean... Because you can say on the flip side, a lot of our commenters, when they were watching um, Troy's 44-minute interview, they were saying, you know, if this was a guy, this person would already be on death row. So there's really, the flip side, well, that, too. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. You know? Now, do you have to be on our noon show? I think you yeah. have to be on the noon show. I think that's what they're saying. Oh, is that what it is? I don't oh, know. I think there's some right. signaling there. Okay. Was there a signal? I don't know. I'm not mm-hmm. really sure. I just know there are a lot of questions, and I feel like I'm ignoring some of the. No, let's comments. let's let's get to some so of the one questions. One of the things they were uh, talking about a lot. So there's some uh, new information about jurors wanting to switch positions today. Uh, there was a lot of tweets they were reading. I wanted to get your. Uh, yeah, I got to be honest. In- I haven't been down to the courtroom today. Oh, you haven't. No, oh. I took time to uh, hike and exercise. I put in a couple of long 16-hour oh. days. I need to refresh the body. So I lied nice. to all important. of them when I said that you were coming straight from court. I'm well, sorry, we, uh, guys. And we actually asked Troy to get up at like 6:30. Was it yesterday morning? Yes, it yeah. was. And be yes. on our 7 a.m. hour. But I love being on the morning show. It's always fun. Yeah, we love having you on. There, Troy, but you just it. have this perspective. Um, what can you set the for? Because we aren't even able to show the courtroom. If we had a, a, a YouTube viewer right now who's watching us in, uh, you know, whatever country they're watching, just set the scene for us. Describe for us the courthouse and uh, just the whole process that you go through in order to enter the courthouse. And once you get in, you know, the pool of reporters versus family that you're sitting around. Give us the lay of the land. Um, well, you walk in um, the uh, as as you're looking at the judge. Mm-hmm. The left side of the courtroom is the uh, the victim side, the prosecution side. The Alexander family and friends and extended family taking up the first two rows. Yesterday, it was the first two mm-hmm. rows plus chairs on on either end. They wanted more seats. But they were only given the first two rows. Mm-hmm. And then behind that was media. I think there were only it's the three full rows with chairs. I think there were only one or two open seats mm-hmm. in the media section. Mm-hmm. A lot of the national media that had been gone. For Frankly, for the last, you know, two or three months, we're back. Uh, as a matter of fact, that phone call I took was from Fox News, so yeah. I'm assuming they want a live shot on it later today. But I told mm-hmm. my call them back. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's on the left side. On the right side is the defendant side, and they have two full rows for Jody Arias's family. But uh, they've only had maybe three or four or five members of the family, mm-hmm. even at the at the best of times, mm-hmm. and maybe a couple of friends. The three rows behind them are uh, public. 
So I think there are some bloggers over there, maybe, or I don't know if they have a lottery for who gets who in there. Who from Jody's side is there right now? <clears throat> well, I spoke to, um, and this is some news I haven't talked about yet, but I spoke to Sandy Arias this morning, her mother. So I know that her nephew's in town. Uh, he was a young man who I didn't know who he was, but he was sitting next to her the last couple of days. How old is her nephew? I would say he looks 30. Oh, okay. Something like Sandy's that. Sandy's nephew. Yeah. Okay, not Jody's nephew. Okay. No, okay. Sandy's nephew, so it would be uh, you Around know Jody's, Jody's aunt's son. Right, Jody's yeah. cousin. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so th that was with her. Um, Jody's younger sister was with her, uh, I believe yesterday and the day before. Uh, but um, uh, Sandy told me today that they're probably not coming back for the verdict because it was a lot for them. Uh, she also told me that Jody uh, was in good spirits and that... Um, she was very happy with the job that Kirk Nurmi did, mm -hmm. and she's already working on her appeal. And I think that's telling because uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that really that whole defense team, and I don't want to say they're writing this off, mm -hmm. but they know it's not over, no matter what the jury comes back with. Wow. Because they're going to try to appeal on a number of different grounds. And they, well, I don't know if they'll be successful or not. Because if she gets death, she gets an automatic appeal. Sure. It happens, right. no matter what. If she gets life, you know, a court has to agree to that appeal. Mm -hmm. So they've got to make a compelling argument and convince I, a judge. I just can't see how anybody can think that she's going to get the easiest of the three options, which is life with a possibility of parole uh, in 25 years. I mean, I'm not saying that judges are influenced by public opinion, but I just cannot see that judge or any judge after everything that we've sat through now for the last couple of years saying, okay, well, I, you know, I want to give you the option to, to get on out of here after 25 years. I, yeah, I, I mean, I uh, Judge Sherry Stevens has taken um, a, a lot of uh, heat for the way she's handled this trial. And I don't know what would happen if they decide life and she comes back with possibility of release. I mean, there might be people coming after her. I mean, who knows? Yeah. I there, mean, people are suggesting people. riots. Well, I would never suggest a riot <laughs> or people in the comment harming box. anybody. Yeah. Uh, but, I, I mean, we might be able to see some sort of an orchestrated attempt to get her out of a judgeship or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm just oh, speculating. Yes. But yeah. um, although judges are you're supposed to be immune to that, if she feels there's some overriding reason, but I just, I just can't. I, I don't can't, see it either. I really, I can't see anything other than the middle option, which is going to be life with uh, natural life, or life right. with yeah. a chance of parole. And I think you know the. I think for the most part, the opinion has changed quite a bit over the last two years that I've been covering. That's at least what I've seen on Twitter and, and people who talk to me. It went from, we've got a killer, we've got a killer, to, all right, look, we spent enough, it's enough, life is fine. As long as she doesn't get out of prison mm -hmm. and she goes somewhere, I'm fine with that. But have you sensed that Travis's family has Oh, absolutely changed? not. In, in, have no. they moved even 1% that way? You know, I have very limited contact with them. Yeah. We say hi every once in a while right. at lunch. Right. Um, I'll ask them how they're doing. I talk mostly to Samantha, who was the uh, the sister who was the police officer. Mm -hmm. She's got the shorter hair. She kind of looks like Travis. Mm -hmm. Tanisha's the one who's got more of the sculpted yeah. face, and she's with her husband, Harold, who's the mm -hmm. bald guy with the goatee. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they're just, their lives have been devastated. And, you know, I mentioned here yesterday, I don't know how they have kept this up from something is it's not simple, but it's, as you know, not very emotional. It's putting your life on hold for all this time. Right. And then they come here and they live here. I, mean, I don't know where they're living or how they're living. Uh, and and then the, probably the worst thing is to sit in that courtroom every day for a total now of almost 10 months, mm -hmm. he, being reminded every second of why you're there. Right. That this brother that, <clears throat> you know, everybody, those kids looked up to Travis. They had a terrible childhood. Yeah. And that doesn't get a lot of play. No. I mean, they had uh, abusive parents that had drug issues. They grew up in a uh, camper on the back of a truck. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. That was rough. Yeah. So, Travis. And how he made something of his life. Exactly. Really successful at a young age. Doing well. Yeah. I don't think he was quite as successful as a lot of people think he was. He, he was doing well. Yeah. Um, but, uh, he, you know, he, he did. He definitely, from coming out of the back of a trailer. I mean, think about right. it. Or a camper shell sure. with abusive parents. He could have gone south easily. Right. All those kids could have, really, when you think about it. Yeah. And so uh, they had some sort of an inner strength. And, you know, Samantha has said, and, and Tanisha, I believe in some of their victim impact statements, that it was the strength of Travis that got them out of that situation they were in. Okay. I'm going to let you continue the interview with Troy so I can go do a couple more things. Sell me in. See you again soon. This is fascinating. You know what I love? I love that we can literally ask Troy anything. 
right here. Let me just unplug it for five seconds. Out of here. All right. um, we can ask him anything, and he's got the perspective and the answers for it. I know, and we have, we have another one where our chat window has so many like uh, comments coming in that the loading's been disabled because of the high volume. It's crazy how many uh, questions and comments are coming in, and just... Uh, Shelly's asking, for example, Shelly Edward, Troy, what happens if they're hung, the jury? Automatic life. So at that point, if they're hung, it's automatic life um, as per Arizona law because they only get two chances at this. The first chance was in the original trial with the original jury. This is the second chance. And at that point, Judge Terry Stevens will say, okay, um, I'm going to take it under advisement. I'll either get, uh, allow you to have the possibility of release, which doesn't happen very often because this is not a parole board we're talking about. This is clemency. It's a clemency board. These people are appointed by the governor. We have very conservative leadership here in Arizona, as I'm sure everybody out there is aware. And the governor would then have to sign any sort of a clemency paper to get somebody out. It just doesn't happen very often. We Got don't it. see it very often. So when we say possibility of parole, it's not like, oh, here, 25 years, bye, Jody, you're out. Right. It wouldn't happen that way, mm -hmm. even if she got that, which I, I don't believe she's going to get. Got it. Now, uh, this is something that you uh, did explain to us yesterday, but I think a lot of our viewers may not have tuned in to okay. our chat yesterday. Jane Kennedy Ellis asking, Troy, explain to us how you got that interview with Jody. So you maybe want to recap. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, actually later on today, and I'll, I'll release a scoop here, we are releasing something that uh, really was one of the most bizarre uh, experiences I've ever had as a journalist. It involved Jody. Is it the singing? Well, I don't want to talk about it because <laughs> we have to get it all together, and I think we're going to release it here first. I've talked about it with, uh, with some of our newsroom executives, and I think it's going to happen. Uh, but I will definitely tweet it out and let everybody know, and that was part of it. So here's what happened. Um, I was going to do a story at the Australia women's jail yeah and uh, and I do a lot of active type stories if you uh, google me you'll see I do all kinds of stuff I've been out military and I've been um, down in drug tunnels and I've done all kinds of stuff even so the story you did recently that went viral with um, the use of, force. use of force yeah that was yeah. a great story that you did so what I try to do is I, I, I put myself in these situations and bring the viewers along okay so what I was trying to do was put myself in a situation of being a female inmate spending the night in the women's jail right and this is at the very beginning of the Jody Aries case I just started covering it and uh, I didn't realize I knew that she was in the Towers jail but I thought the Towers jail was a separate jail from Australia I, I knew I've always heard of Towers jail and I've always heard of Australia but Towers is a section of Australia so on the day before I was gonna go spend the night in the women's jail I did a walkthrough to kind of see what we were doing and the people giving me the tour said oh that's the Towers part I said Towers I said wasn't well, that where Jody Arias is they said yeah and I said well am I gonna have access to that and they said, yeah, we can take you back there. And right then the light bulb went off. I was like, okay, so I'm going to be able to get in there. Uh, I'll try to make some sort of a headway with her and see if she wants to possibly do an interview. Because it, the, the trial was just taking off at that point. Right. Um, so uh, I uh, put some stuff together that she could contact me. I did some self-addressed uh, envelopes and stationery that they allowed me to bring in, which they normally don't let you bring. And I said to her, I, I walked up to her cell, and she wasn't happy to see me because she wasn't expecting me. And, um, okay. Uh, I'm looking at some of the, the comments as they come in. I'm, I'm copying <clears> and pasting <throat> them while you speak. Oh, so okay, that I good. Have a, a, oh, that's we'll get a good to system. Them. You know, we'll get to them because they keep coming down and I miss right. them. So we have a word doc. I'm getting your questions. Don't worry. Let's okay. listen to Troy. So, yeah. So, anyway, I gave her this whole stack of uh, papers to contact me. I didn't know if it was going to happen. Uh, we were shooting video around her pod, and she was very upset. She asked to leave because she thought we were going to shoot video of her. I told her we weren't going to because you can't in the jail unless they give you permission to shoot video of them. So uh, she left, and when she left, I went through her cell because I had, I had permission to go in there, and I kind of did a, a walk and talk showing everybody what was in the cell. And when I came out, all of her fellow inmates were writing, and I was like, what are they writing? They're writing on these sheets of paper, and then they held up these sheets of paper that said, Free Jody. And they wanted our cameras to get, and there's maybe like maybe 10 or 12 of the inmates saying free Jody. And maybe later on today I'll even pick up, I, I video that, mm -hmm. and we can show that yeah, a little Yeah, we can show on. it all here. I'm actually going to show, uh, one of our viewers requested uh, original video of the crime from back in 2008, like original news report. We do have some of that. I'm going to play it for you guys as well from 2008 when Jody was simply just a suspect. Oh, okay. So. I don't know if I've even seen those. Throwback Thursday. Yeah, how about welcome. that? <laughs> So uh, uh, Jody saw me interviewing those women who were holding up the cards, and Jody being Jody, she wanted right back in there because I think she wanted to be a part of that whole thing. And when she got back in, the women I had talked to had kind of relaxed a little bit because I thought for a while they were going to go after me. Mm -hmm. I was in there by myself uh, with about, and for the photographer too. Right. 
like 13 women, three of them have been accused of murders. I mean, these are not soft, small women. These right. are hard. And they were all upset that I was in there and made Jody freak out because they love Jody. They won. Jody <clears> Aries <throat> won over women that were con convicted of murder. Oh, won over. <laughs> I mean, it's like they would like they were ready to tear me apart. I, I thought I was in some real trouble, to be wow. honest with you. So uh, I just went. There's, there's these steel tables, and I went and sat down at a steel table, just quietly. And all I did was, and they're all kind of looking at me, and I was waiting for them to kind of simmer down a little bit because I didn't want to go talk to them, but they're they're all staring at me like they're going to come after me, and then. Uh, they finally calmed down, and, and once they calmed down, um, they started saying, well, you just don't know Jody as she really is. You know, you need to know this. And I said, well, it, talk to me. If you want to get that message out, talk to me. I'm right here. I've got a photographer, and let's, let's do it. So I started talking to them. Jody came back in. Long story short, by the time Jody came back in, they're all like, Jody, you know, he's okay. He's a good guy, and, you know, you should sing for him. So she sang four songs for us which was odd she did a concert what kind of four of songs. songs did she sing for you the first song was an original <laughs> that was a... song that she had written with uh three other women and they sang it in a harmony you're looking at me like i'm crazy i'm just like it was really it was a strange i'm experience. just trying to understand did she have a musical background growing up in middle school and high school and i don't know about music school. but she's definitely already um so writing uh, a song isn't easy <laughs> it's, it's kinda... she probably had help okay and these women knew what they were doing i mean because they, they had a harmony down and whatever so they sang that song and then i'm trying to think the second song they sang was kind of like a gospel type song the third song was like a prayer by madonna and that was just jody and another woman and jody took the lead on that and then the final song was she sang the national anthem uh, by herself and um and I, I told this story yesterday, but it still blows me away to this day. So she's finished, and I'm in this room with all these hardened women, and I look around, and half of these women have tears streaming down their face. They're crying watching Jody sing a song. I mean, that's what, how much they looked up to her at that point. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> after that, we talked for a little bit, and when I walked out, she stuck out her hand and said, well, um, if you don't show any of this uh, on uh, TV and don't talk about the things we talked about, which was nothing. It was all like small talk stuff. It wasn't anything about the trial. And nothing I was holding back on that. And she said, I'll give you the interview afterwards. And she w made good on her promise and contacted me when the jury had the case. And there it is. That's amazing. Now, back to some of the questions. I, I mean, we're still really, I think I'm like 20 minutes behind on chat because there's so many people chiming in. But Susan Michaels is asking, why haven't any of her family members spoken out on her behalf? That's a big mystery to me. Um, you know, I, I spoke to Sandy this morning, uh, Sandy Arias, and uh I didn't ask her. I, I, I feel like, um, you know, maybe I'll have an opportunity to, to talk to her afterwards and we'll see how things go. And uh, if I do, I'll, I'll definitely hit her with a lot of trial questions. But um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, there's one of two things. Either they don't want the notoriety. I mean, people are, are, are frankly uh, scared to stand up and talk for Jody because of what happened last time. Right. Alice LaViolette was an expert witness who came on and basically had threats and um, lost a lot of her practice. Anyone who comes in on the defensive side is probably threatened, right? Especially then. I think it's changed a little bit now. Mm -hmm. I think people have, have relaxed a little bit. Um, it's not getting the daily play like, on HLN like it does was. Does Nermi and, feel fear for his life? I doubt it. He's okay. a pretty tough guy. You know, he's, <laughs> he can handle it, I think, and, and Wilmot. But I do know they were getting threats. And some, some paperwork that came out, of them in chambers during this trial, Nermi did talk about getting threats. Mm -hmm. And Jody talked about getting threats. And it's why she says she didn't want to do her allocution because she felt like if she said something that people uh, didn't like, uh, that she could be harmed by those people. But I mean, Jody is already locked up, right? Yes. She's locked up. How is she going to get harmed by people on the outside? Uh, I Jody don't know. getting threats, I mean, she's already facing life in prison or the death penalty, which is like the ulti ultimate threat, I uh, mean, in theory. Yeah, no. Uh, Jody says that, um, and I haven't confirmed this with MCSO, but that somebody tried to come visit her saying he was an attorney. MCSO okay. asked for credentials. That didn't happen. Um, I know attorney visits are different than uh, normal visits. They mm -hmm. actually can get into a room where they can touch. But uh, okay. uh, with, um, with uh, regular visits, you're separated by glass. Right. But attorney visits are different. Okay, <clears> I see. <throat> uh, Jennifer L. is asking who pays for her appeal if she gets life? Uh, the state does, but she has to be granted the appeal. It's not automatic. If she gets death, it's automatic. I mean, uh, it's the way our justice system works. 99.9% uh, .9 of criminals have their defenses and their trials paid for by the public. It's part of our criminal justice system. Linda asks, if she gets life of parole, then the time served, how long would she be in jail? I, I think she does get time served. So she's been in since 2008. So that's been, what, almost seven years mm -hmm. now. So, uh, again, it's not parole. 
Uh, so let's say she's been in for seven years. So in 18 years, uh, something would come up to where her case would go in front of the clemency board. And the clemency board would then look at what she did, discuss it. But remember, all these people on the clemency board were appointed by a governor, and almost all the governors in Arizona are very law and order. So let's say on an outside chance, the clemency board says, yeah, you know what, we, sh we think Jody Arias should get out. Right. Whoever's governor at that time, 18 years from now, would then have to look at it and say, okay, and sign it and commit political suicide. Right. And let's be honest. Right. I mean, so it's, you know, people so would, uh, would demand a recall. 18 years is, uh, is when I think she would be up for clemency. Is it going to happen? No. Mm. Even if she gets it. Which she won't. Lisa asks us out, asking, how long does the jury have to decide? They, it's uh, it's up to them. A after a few days, um, I think the judge... What's the longest will... that a jury's taken to deliver? I don't know. I wish I knew that. I don't. But I know... Someone you know, there's watching, been uh, can you guys find that out <laughs> for us? <laughs> the longest and, like, ever deliberation. In. I want to know. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Is there... Is, what has, you know, set the record for that? No, I know. I, if they're out longer than a few days, I think you might see the judge kind of... So, hey, uh, how, what are you thinking? Uh, anything we can do to help you out or is there uh you know who knows and then uh right. you know they'll they'll try to nudge him a little bit and see hey you know but you know at this case uh, a no decision is a decision so i'm not sure that that's as crucial as it was maybe in the last case sure. because the judge may have said look let's avoid another multi-million dollar trial this is what we had here right by you jury coming to a decision right whereas here they come to her and say, we're deadlocked. She's like, okay. You know what no, I'm saying? That's your answer. Yeah. That's it. Life. Um, Rachel, our very dedicated viewer, Rachel, from right here in the Valley, is asking you, Troy, how do you prepare yourself to interview someone without having a predetermined opinion in that way? Oh, it's impossible. I've got my own opinion. I'm a human being. Right. So um, <clears throat> I just try to ask uh, good questions. And I try to ask questions that I think most people um, have the answer to. You know, I've always said I'm not the most creative guy. I'm not super creative. But I think the talent that I do have is I think like most people. Uh, I walk into Pottery Barn and I like everything in there. You know what I'm saying? I'm not one of those guys that has some weird picture on his wall. So I think I'm able to think and say, okay, what would most people want to know now that I'm speaking to Jody? Sure. You know? And uh, I got a lot of heat for that interview I did. So, oh, you're too soft on her. Why didn't you go after her harder? You know, why didn't you do this? But I'm also a human being. So, you know, well, here I am. Go ahead. I was going to say, as a journalist, you're not, I mean, I think we see a lot of people on TV and they just go after people. But it's technically not your job to just go after and attack people. It's to ask questions. Right. And a lawyer's job is to attack. And, and if then I you have the Nancy right. Graces of the world that who are lawyers. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know. If Nancy Grace is a journalist so much, you know. Right. But there, there's, I've the always lawyer. said that, yeah, she's kind of like the editorial page of the newspaper. Sure. And there's a place for people like that. Right. And she has big ratings, and I understand that. But, you know, um, yeah, that's not me. I'm more of a middle of the road. I'm going to ask certain questions. And, I've, and looking back on it, and I haven't watched it. It's funny you just watched this. I've, I don't think since I did it, I've never watched this video. So you guys know more than Troy <clears throat> does yeah, about you his interview. Yeah, lived back that day. That was a whirlwind of a day, too. That was crazy. We, but, we um, watched every moment from her pausing, her crying, every question answered. How'd I do? You were great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and it was weird, too, because here I have uh, a woman who did this terrible, awful thing, but she's still a human being in front of me. So you've got to kind of juggle both of those things. You know, do I go after her? I know what she's doing is, is BS. Do I go after her and say, hey, look, that's BS. Or do I just let her tell her story and let everybody else say it's BS? And, right. Yeah, you know, that's what I, it is. A couple of people are asking if uh, Jody Arias will be in stripes for the verdict. We act, answered it a few minutes ago, but yes. Uh, I, th I think so she I think will. I don't know. I don't know 100. percent I, you know, maybe I should. I'll, I'll uh, text my contact right now and ask. Oh. I'll probably get the answer in just a second. Oh, great! In the meantime, I'm going to read Lisa's question from earlier. Did Travis Alexander's family do victim impact again? Yes. Uh, oh, will they do it again or did they do it again? Uh, she's asking, did they do the yeah. victim impact again? <clears throat> that was very early in this trial. And uh, that was right before uh, Jody freaked out and uh, didn't want to be on the stand and said she had to testify in secret. So they gave their victim impact. I think it was right at the end of the prosecution's case. And Jody, according to my sources, who were very close to all this stuff going on, said, it's happening all over again. It's happening all over again. I can't do this. Uh, I can't do it. If I testify, it's got to be in secret. Because she thought that as she testified, it was just going to ramp all up again. And she right. probably would have would have been true. Because even though you're not seeing her, we were all in there and we were all texting. You know? Mm -hmm. 
I'm gonna let you uh, send that text. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and for a second take some time and just go through this because I don't know where. I feel like I've lost myself. I might be skipping some of your questions because my window just keeps going down. Um, Jane USA 22, Troy, uh, do you think a verdict will come today? No. I, yesterday I would have said yes, but uh, because they went in and they asked for, um, well, somebody early on had a great uh, tweet saying, oh, a juror just came in with a crock pot. And you're right, you don't bring a crock pot if you think you're going to be done in the morning, do you? Right. You, right. you know, you go home and eat There's your crock pot. Cooking. Well, done. they're cooking or they're keeping it warm or whatever. But you show up with your cookware. Yeah. Things are gonna, you know, things are gonna go for a while, and then they. It doesn't uh, seem like they want to leave to take a lunch break. Right. They've got some work to do there. Right. You know. Uh, by the way, we have an answer. Longest deliberation was four and a half months. Oh my Louise gosh. McGuire, Nicole, uh, Nicole added. Uh, it was 1992 California trial in which a woman and her son sued the city of Long Beach for, for, for preventing the opening of a chain of residential homes for Alzheimer patients, and it lasted four and a half months. Eh. Not a sensational of a... <laughs> no, but, I mean, they had some time. Okay, I've got a definitive answer on whether Jody Knott is going to be wearing civilian or stripes. She's wearing civilian clothes. Oh, wow. Civilian right clothes. Right here. I'm going to tweet that right now. That's some uh, good info. Thanks so much for answering. I think there's at least, like, five, ten people asking that same question. Yeah. So we have a new answer. Uh, Andrew the Dude is asking, how many years of the life sentence? Is it till she's dead? In theory, yes. A life sentence is uh, until she's dead, unless she has, uh, unless she gets out, released with parole, right? Hold on, let me get this tweet out. Sure. Still for a second. Goes for her sentencing. I am live. You gotta do a better fill than this. Come on, give it, give it, oh, give me what? I'm sorry, I'm just reading. I can just keep reading. Grace Hulbert is uh, saying if Troy interviews Sandy Arias, he needs to ask her why she immediately suspected Jody when she heard Travis had been murdered. Because she knew that, I mean, this. you're asking my opinion. She knows her daughter's nuts. Crazy. Jody is nuts. And that, you know, I think they did an okay job of explaining that. If I were Jody Arias' defense team, I would say, look, Jody was always a little off mm -hmm. throughout her whole life. She dated a series of awful boyfriends. Here they are. Boom, 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 boom. They were, and, you know, I'm sorry if you're watching, but I don't disparage people, but, you know, kind of loserish guys and, and not right for her. And then all of a sudden, at, she sees this Travis Alexander guy. Her age, no kids, uh, good future, hard worker, Mormon, clean living. Great guy. It's, yeah, and she's thinking, perfect. oh, this is it. This is my future. I've got this guy. And when she found out, and she did everything for him, as we all are, you know, very aware, uh, sexually and whatever else. Yeah. And, and when she found out that he didn't care about her, that little thread that was holding her to her sanity or whatever just broke. And she lost it. And she, yeah, she said, that's it. I'm going to, you know, she made up her mind right then. I'm going to kill this guy. I can't take it. She uh, faked a robbery at her grandfather's house, stole a gun. Uh, she borrowed gas cans so nobody would know she was driving in. She took the license plate off the rental car she was driving. She got a white rental car instead of a red one. You know, speculation that red would be easier to recognize. Mm -hmm. Killed Travis in a horrible way. Actually, she gave him one last shot. They had one more, one last roll in the hay. Probably gave him one last shot. If he takes me to Acapulco or Mexico, wherever right. he's going, we're fine. He wasn't. She killed him. And here's the part that makes me think, if anybody doubts that she's not right in the head, she drives from that location up to uh, Utah and goes on a first date with somebody. You know what a first date is like? Awkward. Well, hey, how's it going? And, you know, you have to ask all these questions, whatever. The whole time she's knowing that just hours before that she just almost cut a guy's head off. A normal person doesn't do that. Right. No, that, that's fair. That's fair. Um, a lot of people thanking you for asking or answering all these questions, Troy, by the way. Oh, good. Um, let's see. Everyone got, uh, oh, Kelly got your tweet. Which one? Uh, I don't know. She just said, oh, got Troy's Twitter. Ha ha. Oh, good. That's so great. Um, Troy, do you think if Tro Jody was a man, she'd already be on death row? Dolores asks. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, may, I mean, I definitely would be different. We wouldn't be paying attention like this. I know that for a fact. We wouldn't have uh, thousands of people from all over the world. Tuning in. No, we wouldn't. Uh, I mean, would the, would the justice system have been different? Yeah, probably. I mean, there wouldn't have been this much attention to the case. So, um, But I've always said, you know, generally, and I know I've said this a few times, so pardon me if you've seen this already, there are basically four criteria for people in Arizona to go to death row. You, you kill a child, you kill multiple people, you kill a police officer, or you have this heinous criminal background, and then you kill somebody in a first-degree murder. And Jody doesn't fit this mm -hmm. in either one of those four. But we do have people on death row that don't fit it either. So when somebody asks me, oh, would a man have, have been there? Yes and no. Um, you know, a man probably would have pled out. Jody had the chance to plea out early on in this right. case and refused to because she was busy talking about ninjas and she didn't do it and standing on her head and all the crazy stuff she does. Kathy's asking, what is the restitution order for Jody? Have the Alexanders filed for it? I know they've gone after it, and I had something really interesting uh, mentioned to me today, and um, you know, I'm wondering if I want to talk about it here. I don't, you know, I don't want to talk about it here because I think I'm going to do a story on it later, just for a, um, a competitive standpoint. So I don't know exactly when that starts, but stay tuned. I, I may get some information. We'll hit it with you at three o'clock. Let's see. Troy, do you know anything about the rumor that a deliberating jury wanted to switch with an alternate? <clears throat> well, what I just saw from somebody who I sat with in that trial for months and somebody I trust, uh, and I haven't talked to her about it, but what she tweeted out was that the, the alternate wanted to switch in. Right. And I can understand, and I tweeted it out yesterday and talked about it. You know, can you imagine sitting there for five months and these jurors are getting whittled away and they're getting dismissed right and left. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there. Okay, oh, my gosh, my whole life, five months. And then all of a sudden, they say, okay, 12 out of 14 of you are going to deliberate this case. You're going to take it through. And you're thinking, well, my chances are great. 12 and then out you're of 14. one of the two. <laughs> yeah, you're one of the two. And you're like, are you kidding me? I've been sitting here for five months listening to all this crap, putting my life on hold, dragging my rear end down here every day, and now I'm shut out of the deliberation room. Do jurors get sick days? Um, that's a good question too. I, I know if a juror is out, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you can help us out there. I mean, I don't know if you can call in sick or not. I know, I know. Sometimes when there's an issue with a juror, they'll they'll cancel court on um, whatever right. it is or won't schedule it. Right. But um, I don't know if they get sick days. Uh, Troy, are you anti death penalty? Nicole asks. No, um, I'm. I'm. I don't uh, go on one way or the other. Uh, I've seen three executions. And uh, if you want to know my thoughts on executions, we've got a bunch of stuff on. Oh, I, I have that to play back later. Oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last one I saw was really intense. It was here in Arizona. Some people called it a botched execution. DOC said it wasn't a botched execution because the guy died. But he laid on the table for two hours and was like, you know, his mouth was opening like a fish and laying there. And we're watching him breathe. And it was, it was a weird, it was a terrible scene. Does that make me anti-death penalty? No. Um, do I think that it um, is a deterrent? I don't necessarily think it's a deterrent. Uh, it's way more expensive than putting somebody away for their natural life, as we went over that yesterday, just because mm -hmm. of the court costs that's involved. But here's where I think it does, uh, it is legitimate, and that's why I don't think we should get rid of it, is victims' families want to see that person die, and I get that. Some victims' families. Right. Eloise is asking, since Arius was already found guilty, can the Alexanders also filed a wrongful death suit against Arius? Yeah, I think they can, but what are they going to get? I mean, she's everybody talks like Jody's got all this money. I don't think she has all that money. I know she sold a few paintings. I think the paintings she sold have gone. I don't know this for sure, but it's the feeling I have after talking to people that um, that she uh, has used that for her mom's travel expenses. Oh man, um, do you know if the art sales will be cut off at Perryville? Oh yeah, there's that. I think that art stuff is over. Because she's now she's totally convicted and sentenced. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Here's what I will say about Perryville is that her life at Perryville is going to be better than her life is right now at the towers. She's going to have more freedoms mm -hmm. very quickly after she gets there. If She'll she be in max for two years. If she gets life in prison. If she gets life, yeah. But if she gets death penalty, it'll be what the same kind of environment or worse? Uh, it's still a little bit better. Oh. Yeah. The worst of, what, what is she experiencing right now? <clears throat> 23 hours a day lockdown. She can come out and uh, use the phone for an hour a day, take a shower. But I don't think she's involved in any group activities at all, like each one of the inmates. So for her, going to court every day is almost a relief. You get to go outside and see people and interact with humans oh, in I would a think sort so. of way. Like, continue, you know, extending this trial gives her more time just 
outside of herself. Right. Uh, yeah, and she gets to put on uh, civilian clothes, and she gets to yeah talk to people, and yeah, be right. on the outside it's world. It's more of a life. I would think it would um, be being in court now. Uh, Tulips on a field is asking why did the defense use Jody's age as a mitigation factor? Use her what? Use Jody's age as a mitigation factor. Age? Yeah. That is a mitigating factor because they're saying that oh she was pretty young and. Um, <clears throat> you know, she's not she's an, she's she's an, an adult, adult though. Twenty seven, still an adult. She was an adult. Yeah, it's not a very strong mitigating factor, right, is right. it? You know, saying that she was young when she did it. Grace Hulbert saying, "How awful of a person are you when no one in your family will beg for your life or plead for mercy and won't come to your court to hear your final verdict?" Yeah, uh, I I've been asked to try to explain the area's family, and I, I'm not close to them. I don't know, but you know, just watching them in the courtroom while they're saying these awful things, I don't know how they do it. I, I don't know, you know, and I'm not to put myself in their position, but again, sure. I've got two daughters, and I just it makes me literally sick to my stomach to think about ever having to have one of my kids go through that. Mm-hmm. And how would I react? Right. Um, you know, Sandy Arias didn't kill anybody, but she's not. She doesn't react in the way that most people would. I don't think she mm-hmm. shows very little emotion. And maybe that's just the way she deals with this and processes it. Right, right. Well, Troy, thanks for we joining done? us and a- answering all those questions. Um, you did mention your experience uh, watching executions. We do have that clip. I think it's like 20, 25 minutes long. It's a chat with you and Carrie oh, okay. discussing your experience in terms of uh, people on death row. So I'm going to play that. And then a little bit later on, I'm going to play this clip from 2008. An original news report from 2008, back when I believe it was when uh, Jody was first arrested, or when the f- crime first uh, came about. So well, you've got all kinds of programming. I'm just going to get out of your way. But you're going to join me a little later again. I'm assuming. Yeah, with with our with our big uh, big exclusive. Yeah, it's interesting. We'll just tease it. So might make you angry. Might make you laugh. I don't. Don't know, go we anywhere. Have. We're going to have Troy in a little bit. You can ask him questions. If you didn't get your question in now, you can talk to him a little bit later. But in the meantime, I'm going to play for you guys this. Uh, this clip between Troy, it's a chat that Troy did with uh, Fox 10 anchor Carrie Lake, where they discuss what it's like to be, um, to witness an Arizona execution. So let me just pull that up. Give me a minute while I grab the file. And... There you go. Channel, we're talking to Troy Hayden, a Fox 10 News anchor, about what was a pretty interesting experience yesterday. Your third time witnessing an execution. Right. But this probably one last. was, and probably the last, yeah. but this one was really unique for many reasons. Do you want to talk about one, why you've witnessed three, and how you got chosen to see this one? Uh, basically, it's a lottery uh, that they've put out for the media, and they they ask who is interested in coming out and seeing this, and that's how you get chosen. So I, that's basically how I was chosen. I got the I knew this was coming up. I knew this was going to be an interesting execution uh, because they were changing the drug protocol, mm-hmm. and so um, they're going from a three drug protocol. They went to a one drug, and now they're going to a two. And I knew they had some issues with it, so I thought it might be interesting to, to witness this. And one. it sure was. I mean, this one right. lasted about two hours. The Two previous executions you witnessed lasted what? Ten minutes. Really? Fifteen tops, yeah. Uh, okay, so we're going to get into what's going through your mind when this is going on for hour and 40 minutes, two hours. But I first want to talk about yesterday morning you wake up, and at the moment you're thinking the execution's on, you're driving down to Florence. Kind of what's going through your mind? It was a very early morning because I worked until, you know, with you. I, I was on until 10.30 at night, and then uh, I get to bed about midnight. And so uh, I had to get up around, I think it was about 6 I got up, took a shower, drove down. So I'm a little fuzzy, just trying to get my wits about me as I drive down. Um, I'm just preparing myself, getting ready, thinking about um, what my workload is going to be for the day. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go into any story, it's not so much, you know, living that whole experience. It's how I'm going to take that experience and communicate it to the viewers. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking about on the drive down. And I know in the days preceding this, you were talking about the crime that happened. I'm sure that you we're weighing that in your head a little bit. That, that I know that came up for you throughout the week. You're thinking about what this guy did, why he's sitting on death row. Right. You know, and, and you know, as we continue talking here, this is not this is Joe Wood behind us and the guy who was executed yesterday. And this isn't about Joe Wood so much mm-hmm. to me. This to me this is more about the process of what all of us, what you did yesterday, what I did, what everybody in Arizona did, because we're all involved in this and how that process uh, you know played out yesterday. 
So Joe Wood, um, not a good guy, terrible crime, tore a family apart 25 years ago. That's mm -hmm. part of the process as well that people have a problem with. It's like, why does it take 25 years for us to finally get to the point where he faces the ultimate punishment? So mm -hmm. I wasn't even thinking about Joe Wood so much. And, uh, and I was thinking about this family and how they were going to react and how they're going to see it. But, you know, you're talking about being removed a quarter century from this actually happening. Right. But, you know, there's one thing that I will say is whenever you see, maybe it's just a feeling I get, but as soon as that family walked through the door, I knew exactly who they were. Mm. Because people who have lost somebody to a violent crime get that kind of a hollow, almost a shattered look, you know, and I could just yeah. see it on their faces. 25 so I years that. later, it's still, there's oh, yeah. something it's missing inside of them. Father and a daughter, yeah. you know, so it was, the, it was the, another daughter and it was the sister mm -hmm. of the people who were killed. One of the, so the, you're driving up to a uh, maximum security prison yesterday. You, they, I'm sure they let you on through and then kind of walk us through driving in to getting to basically the death chamber, which not yeah. many people have seen. No, no, it's not a nice place, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they lock Florence down, especially around, this is, it happened down in Florence, which is about an hour southeast of the valley. And uh, it's the old prison. I don't know when exactly it was built. I think right around the turn of the century. So it looks like an old prison. It's big concrete walls. And uh, there's a checkpoint at the main intersection outside. Then there's another checkpoint right at the main entrance when you go inside. And at that point, I had to identify myself. I drove in to where the other media was assembled. Um, we met up with the communications uh, director for Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. and he brought us inside a, a building, and basically that's just like a, a classroom. That's not actually inside the prison. That's just, just outside the gates. And before we were even allowed to get on the van to go into that area, we got searched. Uh, we had to have um, the only thing that we could have with us, we could bring our wallet, we could bring our key for our car, and, uh, and your watch. But everything else had to go. You couldn't what bring do you a mean? Pen. You, you just leave it there? I left it in my car in the parking lot. So before you even get on the van to go, they, they wand you and they say, okay, that's your watch, that's okay. And they say, okay, that's your key, that's okay, you can have that. But you can't have a pen, you can't bring a phone. Whoa, you know, so it's you know. all memory. You, no. Obviously there's no live tweets, you oh, can't no, the phone's record gone. Yeah, anything, you anything, nothing. Like that. But they give you a little tiny pad and a pencil. And then they collected that at the end of the execution, which I thought was odd. But they give you a little pad and a pencil, and that's what you can bring in to take notes. Okay, so uh, you get back there. Yeah, and so you're in that first room and uh, the uh, Department of Corrections Director, Charles Ryan, came in and spoke to us and said, okay, here's where we are. Um, everything's going the way it should be going at 10 a.m. Now, we got a little bit of a delay yesterday, but this mm -hmm. is how he first came in. He said, at 10 a.m., we're gonna move forward, we're gonna move you in, and that's it. He's kind of walks out and he's gone. Yeah. So we then moved inside the prison itself, and we walked about, I don't know, about 50 yards to the prison entrance and at that point is when the big iron gates open up you know, that you see like in the movies, right. big gates. And only one opens at a time. It's a long hallway, there's gates on both sides. So one opens, you walk in, that closes, then the other one will open up. And so we went in front of another guard and we were escorted by our liaison inside the prison to another like classroom type area. I think it's where the corrections officers uh, either you know, have some sort of classroom activity or something, but it's inside the prison gate. And so we sat there and waited until we were taken back to the death house. That is a, and it was, hours that you waited there. Right. I mean, I just can't imagine you're sitting in this maximum security prison about to witness what we think, because at this point there were appeals that were still kind of right. playing out, an execution. Right. Um, you get in a, do you have a, a pit, a horrible feeling in your stomach? No. How do you feel? You know, the thing is, and people ask me that all the time, is how can you handle this and how can you see it? You know, I've, I've been in TV news for so long now. It's been like 26, 27 years, and my my second day as an intern, like the very first time I ever was a part of a newsroom, I saw the most horrific scene, it was an accident scene, and that really affected me. And I think over the years, you get a little bit of a tolerance for it. I don't mm -hmm. want to say I'm inhuman, but you, you, you figure out a way to kind of deal with that. So I wouldn't say I was upset thinking about watching somebody die. Uh, again, I was more thinking about the coverage that I was going to provide later right. on. The odd thing is, you're thrown into an area with five other people that you really don't know very well, as other mm -hmm. members of the media and your liaison, and there's, you're, there's nothing to do. There's no phone to look at. So you end up making conversation. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You make conversation about different things. You yeah. talk about other executions. You talk about other stories you're working on, things like that. So that's what you do. Like the, the old time. days before yeah, really. we spent talking. Our, all of our time uh, on our phones. Imagine talking. So um, at what point do the families come in? 
Now and we you, don't. And, well, we don't see them at all. Let, let me. Um, you want to go chronologically because then I can talk about us. Yeah. I, I don't see the family until I get in the death house. Okay. So okay. Let, let's talk about how eventually you get into the to the death okay. house. Okay. So uh, the um, the liaison we're with, and now I'm fast forwarding because we were taken out of the prison and then brought back in. So this is like when it was actually going to happen. Yeah. So this is later in the afternoon, about 1:30. Because there were some delays with some last minute yeah, uh, the, legal the, wranglings the, and things uh, like that. The state supreme court took a look at it, but then went back, and so at one o'clock we met in that outside classroom and at 1 30 we were in the inside classroom okay. ready to go and that is when you knew there will be an execution today. yeah it was, was going to happen so at that point he had no more appeals or anything else so we our liaison he's got a little um earpiece in his ear and we saw him kind of talking to whatever he was talking to okay yeah okay we're ready okay and then he took us and this i think is maybe one of the most intense parts of uh, the three executions that i've witnessed the first one was back when it was midnight, because we used to mm -hmm. execute people right at midnight. This is 1995, I think, is the first one I saw. And you're walking through this big open prison yard. And this is an old prison. So like you see in the movies where you walk and there's a yard and there's a big building and a big building and a big mm -hmm. building. And it's on lockdown. And it's dead silent. I mean, there's thousands mm. of people in there, but it's silent. And you look up, this is back with the midnight, and I could just see the outlines of the heads of the other inmates looking down on us as we walk through that courtyard and it's silent except for the clicking of our heels. Ooh, I just got chills, oh, Troy. I'm telling you, it's, it's a very, very intense walk back to this death house and it's all the way on the other end from where the entrance is so you're walking all the way through past these big buildings. The death house itself is very small. It's about the size of a half of a double wide trailer. Very small. And the death house consists of a small cell where the condemned is held, the room where he'll be put to death, at our, at our waiting room and so all right we're just going to put this on pause for a second because we have live images uh from right here in the valley of llamas on the loose this is a video courtesy of our sky fox camera you can see these two uh llamas are they llamas or alpacas we're going with, do we know we're going with llamas we're, we're being llamas. told that they are llamas mm -hmm. and this is uh breaking news do we know exactly where these are on the loose uh, let's see. I know it's just llamas on the loose. Is Taylor. Mary, what's the location? 103rd Avenue in Grand. This is where this is happening. Oh, they got the golf cart out. Oh, this is where it gets kind of dicey. Hold on now. Look, a second ago they were walking. Now they're like, they are wanting to get out they're of there. They're on the loose. Okay, so 103rd Avenue and Grand is going to put it right up there, kind of in the Sun City area. You've got, it looks like the uh, the Black Llama is uh, the leader here. And the White Llama is just kind of following along whatever the Black Llama wants to do. <laughs> Doesn't it? This is kind of cute in its own way. I guess. I guess. It I probably mean, llamas aren't that threatening, right? They're not threatening animals. They're uh, not dangerous. Yeah. What do they do? They spit, I think, at you if they. Right, feel but we're fairly but safe. Even correct. though there are llamas on the loose, correct. I think humans, for the most part, it's oh, not look. like there's a bear. Yeah. Look at this around. guy here. See that guy there? Yeah. He's going to put out his arms. That's going to stop him. Hey, stop right there. The thing that might surprise people who are watching who aren't uh, from right here in the valley is that um, you're in such a heavily populated area, 4 million plus in the metro area, but, uh, you know, there are still plenty of open areas as you oh head kind of <laughs> northwest. Oh, look, it's been shaved Watching or this sheared. this is so funny. Yeah. Oh, they're galloping again. This could, uh, this re could require some patience. I think they've totally outrun their handlers, whoever it was you know, who earlier on realized, well, we don't even know where they came from yet. We just know they're on the loose. Sky Fox doing a good job showing us the llamas. But you can also see, you're right out, you can see a parking lot. So I think we're in a kind of a residential area there in Sun City. We can, um, okay, now there's the, 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 I believe that's Sheriff, huh? Yep. So Maricopa County Sheriff's Office handles law enforcement. Not that the animal world is going to necessarily respect that, but we'll see what happens here <laughs> once the law shows up. Eh, he's just kind of taking a wait-and-see approach here. Seems like if they could get them surrounded, we'd uh, 
be able to get this issue resolved. But, oh, there we go with a little bit of a gallop. Oh, my gosh. Wouldn't it be... I wish I was on the road. I wish I was at 103rd Avenue in Grand right now witnessing the llama crossing in person. Yeah. I mean, the llamas are a good Instagram. You can see it's so funny here in the newsroom. Yes. So many people working here going and taking pictures of the shot right now. Mm -hmm. to oh, pose. Yee, yay. You know, the thing is, you got to watch. They have some busier streets out there. So... Um, I think as long as they stay in the more residential areas, I'd get I'd get most concerned if they were going to try to cross Grand or 99th Avenue. Speaking of Instagramming, Sami is doing it right I'm now. I'm trying to get a picture of the llamas mm -hmm. on the It's hard shooting off that screen, though, right. isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's probably a better screen up there where everyone else is taking their pictures. <laughs> I suppose so. But these guys are gonna they're gonna get tired out in a little it's while. It's safe to say that they have left the intersection of 103rd Avenue and Grand, right? Yes. <laughs> what, uh, you want to pull it up? Uh, no, I want to watch that. Normally, I like your maps, but I'd rather watch the, the oh, no. animals. Totally, I meant in like in person. the in the corner or something. Oh I don't know if we no, could even... I'm just gonna oh. watch. They're gonna, oh. we're gonna watch with them. Us in the corners. Yeah, we're gonna watch. Better. Llama watch. Yeah. We've gone from Arius Watch and Verdict Watch to Llama Watch. Don't worry, we'll go back to Arius shortly, guys. Yeah, well. As soon as we get some information. But for now, right. we're going to watch these llamas. Mm -hmm. Now they're just taking a break, taking things slowly, walking. It is a beautiful, unbelievably nice day here in the uh, Metro Phoenix uh -oh, area. Uh-oh, uh-oh, Sheriff. Yeah? Sheriff. Right. Llamas under arrest. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, like I said, they don't necessarily respect the law. They're just these like, we're going to keep going. Laws, I'm going to move out of the way so we can see them clearly. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see what happens here. It's right up next to them. <laughs> They're just not going to have any of it. They're going to go right onto that guy's lawn. Oh, now we got three vehicles. Maybe they'll be somewhat corner. Oh, look at here now. Okay, that doesn't... Well, no, they could still escape. I was thinking they were going to back right up to the fence line of that house, but they're just out in the uh, in the shade. A lot of citrus trees there. It looks like it's probably an orange tree. Not yet picked, by the way. We've pretty much made sure we got most of the oranges off our <laughs> orange trees. I, by the way, all our viewers are very involved in this. The llama watch as well. Llama I bet. Loose. I love uh, Melissa Ward's comment. She's the, she's like, you need another black one to make the Oreo llama cookie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, here's Rachel saying, run. Uh, somebody else is like, you know, do they run free in Arizona or is this a zoo escapee? Well, uh, there is actually a zoo uh, there in the West Valley, but it's several miles I away. I like what Nicole pointed out. She's like, jaywalking llamas. You are correct, Nicole. Yeah. These llamas do not follow uh, light sig any signals or anything. Maybe, yeah, maybe They're not waiting for the crosswalk. Maybe that's how law enforcement got involved. I know. They're like, you know what? Jaywalkers. These llamas are under arrest for jaywalking. <laughs> See, now, if they played it really cool right here, this seems to be an area where... You know, they could kind of surround the llamas, but it seems like this could probably go for a while. You know, uh, because we need to, uh, there need to be like an animal handler or something. So, the uh, closest fix we have is 103rd Avenue. I think it's kind of in the Sun City area, but 103rd Avenue and Grand is the closest fix we have, so... Do we have uh, let's a location? See who would hey, oh my God! Are we just? This is amazing. Taylor. Okay. Oh, let's see. Oh, they're oh coming my around. Gosh, well, I don't gold. see. I don't see how. I mean, these llamas can outrun. Oh, look at that gal right there. Do you see that? She's like, "What are you guys doing in my backyard?" This is so great. But where are we? What are we looking at? This is 103rd and Grant. Yeah, so Steve, it's in the Sun City area. This is? Are we in Sun City? We right. figured they've left that area because they've done a lot of running. Yeah. Okay, so it's just Sun City. I'll just go with Sun City. Yeah. Uh, but they see now they've got the uh, in terms of being able to corral them, they've got that uh, decorative wall on their side. So that if they could get on the other three sides, if they could get either animal handlers or law enforcement, they'd be able to uh, 
in fact close right in on them. Now this guy's going to run. That's going to make them want to run too. Well, they're stopping and looking at him. Okay. Is this that guy that earlier had his arms outstretched? Oh, oh, uh -oh. that's not going to work. Oh, we got oh, a lasso, no. but no. <laughs> wow. I mean, you got to act fast. This is a fast. nice break from Jody Arias while it's Yeah, it's, actually it's, it's it is. Fun. There's that lady again out in her backyard. I, you know, I presume that if she wants to now, she can come in and watch us on News Now. And uh, don't worry, ma'am. Hopefully they won't be back in your yard. All again. right. We are back with you guys watching Llama Watch. Yeah, see, they get spooked. And You're they right. Really, it's, they, the little black one follows the larger white one around. See, it's now like first, it's lackey. Well, first I thought the black one was the one kind of leading the way. Now, oh, this no. is where I get a little worried because you have all these side streets, but then you can see this is a busier street now. Mm -hmm. And you've got... You know, we just don't want to see a situation where they get where they literally uh -uh. run out into traffic in a busy area. Now, this almost seems. Well, like now the llama, the white llama is looking both ways. It looks like I look both ways before you cross the street. Yeah, well, it's still jaywalking, <laughs> <laughs> not in a crosswalk. Right in front of a sheriff's deputy. Okay. And now, now it considers itself. You got these two work trucks here. This might be interesting. These these might be guys who. either have some connection or knowledge as to what's going on. Are they entering someone's home? Are they on the lawn of someone's home? It uh, appears that that's a home. Yeah. Right? It's probably a multi-unit Or are they in a business area? No, it's mostly residential yeah. through there. I'm going to see what the, what the tweets are saying. What tweets are coming in. It's so good. Somebody is saying, now this would seem to be somewhat common sense. Uh, da, 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 says, just... Um, oh my God, they're prancing again. They're, run, they're not prancing, yeah, they are. they're running fast. Somebody said, just put out some food for them. The problem is trying to get to a location where you try to head them off. Oh, see, here's a... They're calling them Bonnie and Clyde llamas. Uh oh now they've <laughs> been separated. Now this could get very interesting. Who do we follow, the white one or the black one? Yeah, these are mostly uh, like duplexes out there in the Sun Cities. We have Sun City and Sun City West. So this black one, he's 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 he really wants to go. Yeah, they're, look, they're connecting. He's like, now follow me. We're gonna get this out of so here. This is so great. Yeah. Okay. Did I just hear some newsroom humor there a minute ago? I missed it. Llamas on the lamb. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, see. Oh, yikes. Okay, so now here's where there's more. Ashley suspects that these llamas are probably really scared. Oh, I would imagine. Sure. I mean, they're certainly not quite sure. Gail McKay is asking, aren't these alpacas? Uh, Ron? I'm not enough of an animal expert to know the difference. I don't know. But don't Gail, if you know the difference between al al llamas and alpacas, tell us. And we'll, in a close up view, we'll try to get a better look. Well, at least traffic is stopping here. Oh, wow. I'm sure anyone in those cars are probably just like, wait, what? Yeah. Like, they're probably just so confused. Like, I what know. is that driver of that black vehicle thinking? Mm hmm. Like, do I take my phone out? Do I take a picture? Will I get in trouble for using my phone while driving? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. They're probably thinking only in Arizona because we do have a town where Route 66 goes right through a town called Oatman and traffic stops every time a pack of wild burros crosses the road. And they live up in those hills up above Oatman, which is near Kingman. And it's, they're a huge tourist attraction. So these could become the Sun City Llamas. I'm just saying, these could become like uh, you know, Sun, Sun City's own uh, kind of uh, tourist attraction. Right. But it looks like we got... Uh, it's so interesting to see new people, you know, suddenly be shocked that this is happening. Now traffic's stopping. This has got to be like 103rd Avenue or 99th Avenue, something like that. 
where traffic is just coming to a complete stop because this is amazing you know people probably are not aware that we've been following these guys for about the last 10 or 15 minutes and thank goodness they're stopping on a busy street right right by the way Lee, i'm reading all your comments as you guys are watching this and lisa's asking when i'm going to play the video footage of jody from before the trial i think what lisa means is uh when am i going to play the story from 2008 of the initial mm -hmm. suspect arrested fo uh, video i'm going to be playing it in sometime in the next hour or so i mean we're going to be streaming this uh, llama coverage live and then i'm going to continue with uh, troy's story on arizona executions then uh, Troy's going to come back with some uh, new exclusive Jody video, and I will also, around that time, uh, play this old uh, news clip from 2008. So okay. stay tuned, guys. It will happen this afternoon, I promise. But right now, we are on Llama Watch. It seems like this guy's either acting like he has food for them, the guy that we just saw right there, or maybe he truly does have food for them. Oh, see. No, they can just outrun anybody. I mean, we're watching this, but... I love how people are taking, they're, they're like uh, here in the newsroom, run! But right now there, are seer, there seems to be no actual solution. Sunshine Lady's asking, still want to know where the llamas came from. Do they live out in the desert? Yeah. Ron, I'm going to give that to you. Okay, I have to believe that there is a, um, some kind of a farm uh, nearby that they have probably escaped from. Uh, not the zoo. The, we, there is a zoo in the West Valley. It's actually an outstanding zoo called the Wildlife World Zoo. In fact, we have them on our morning show on Fox 10 about every week. Um, but they've got, uh, I don't think we've ever had an instance of any of their animals getting loose like this. So I would bet you within, I don't know, somewhere within a, a couple of miles of Sun City, which is a huge retirement area, mm -hmm. combined between Sun City and Sun City West, there are tens of thousands of people that live out there, that there's, there is some sort of a more of a rural agricultural operation where a guy has a few llamas or else alpacas. Right, right. And by the way, uh, continuing to read these comments, a lot of you guys are pretty funny out there on mm -hmm, YouTube. Mm -hmm, Daniel mm -hmm. Post making a joke, oh, sorry, I was late to work because of llamas. <laughs> Imagine coming into work and saying that that was the reason you were late to work or you're late to a doctor's appointment. <laughs> uh, llamas. Um, or how about Andrew Contrera, Shama Lama Ding Dong. <laughs> I like that. Or Rachel says, Hooner, ask Rick for his best line. Rick. Do you have any good lines for the llama situation going on right now? Llama drama, I heard someone <laughs> say. Rick says it reminds him of that old 80s classic, Ebony and Ivory. By the way, Gail McKay, McKay is saying she's not an expert, but they look like alpacas because her neighbor raises alpacas. She's oh. out in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's her take. Because okay. she, she has, she's neighbors with alpacas, yeah. is what she's saying. Okay, so... I let, oh, are, <laughs> did you just hear that? What you just heard, the announcement, is that the network is now picking this up. Yeah, so you're going to see, oh, it's right there on Fox News Channel, too. So mm -hmm. those of you who have a TV nearby, if you turn on the Fox News Channel on television, on your cable, you can watch the Llamas on the Loose live on TV as mm -hmm. well. Remember, we brought it to you guys here first, though, on You know, now. yeah. Only thing is with them, you know, they'll have to dump out for a commercial break or something. <laughs> we <laughs> just keep rolling. We're going to be on Llama Watch. Uh, okay, so... So, you know, this is the funny thing is you can ride, um, it, it's just a considered a regular vehicle out in Sun City. It's such a popular retirement area. You can ride golf carts out there right along with the cars. And so, oh, there's Thunderbird and, ooh. Wow, they've traveled a bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's Thunderbird. I'm going to have to pull this up on my own Google map. So they've, they've uh, that I would think. I think then they've headed a ways away there. That's Cheryl Stern is saying the main difference between llamas and alpacas are the size. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. I Google. I was about to Google map Sun City, and I accidentally uh, Googled. Sin City and Las <laughs> Vegas popped up. That's so great. Google <laughs> knows the nicknames. That's funny. Um, Lauren Williams and a few other people are joking, saying only if Jody knew that Llamas stole the attention away from her. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. 
It's so funny. funny. Melissa Ward saying, ha ha, love how they walk after prancing. It's like they're saying, ha ha ha, can't catch us. Yes, that's it's like right. the gingerbread man song. Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Yeah. Kind of. No. Well, no, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, that's I'm on I'm board with that. Um, so Thunderbird is, uh, we are on the far side of the 101 freeway. <laughs> and uh, let's see, we are probably pretty close to 99th Avenue. So Thunderbird, uh, we just do we got to make sure they don't get out to Grand Avenue because that's six at least six lanes of traffic that goes zipping by on the on the main highway that goes from Phoenix up to Las Vegas. So oh look, it looks like we've got. You never know when somebody stops if they feel like they can help or if they just want to get a picture or if they're just being cautious. If they think they've got some possible way they can help bring this to an end. But for now, once again, we've got a situation where the llamas are just kind of roaming free and traffic comes to a stop. Okay, so here comes a couple of... Here comes a guy. Oh. I don't get the people that try to talk to them. I don't get the... Uh, you know, you can see they're like gesticulating some way. Oh, okay, so we're right in the middle of an intersection here. There's a guy trying to take a left. So I wonder if that would be Thunderbird in 99th. They have been traveling Avenue. quite a bit. They yeah. did not stay in just one location. They right. are kind of all over the place. Which this is a, this is a test of endurance. I thought a while ago when we kept seeing them run that eventually they kind of get pooped out. But it uh, looks like they just keep. George is saying, "What ambling. the heck is that on my lawn?" I don't know if George is making a joke or if he's serious. <laughs> Maybe he's actually watching llamas on his lawn from work. Who knows? Okay. So we got uh, another sheriff's vehicle here pulling up, but so far that has not proved to uh, provide a real chance to stop these guys yet. But he's there and he's on scene, and I guess they're moving around too much to go with what seems to be the simple possibility of just putting food out and seeing if that would be enough to get them to stop and slow down. So there's a sheriff's deputy stepping out of his vehicle. Got the folks in that red minivan who just can't believe what they're seeing. And traffic just keeps moving on. So, okay. Oh, there's Boswell Memorial Hospital. All right. So that's a good uh, marker. We're actually, unfortunately, getting kind of close to the... Uh, to Grand Avenue if they're over by Boswell Hospital. That can't be. Have they already gotten all the way up from Thunderbird up to Bell Road? No. It's the main banner Boswell Medical Center that they're approaching, which is closer to Grand. And Thunderbird. It's quite a large campus. Boy, if they get onto that campus, I mean, I'm. Yeah, that could be. Uh, that could get a little dicey. Looks like we've got another law enforcement officer. Not able to get much cooperation. So we flew the helicopter when we heard about this. Oh, maybe uh, heading them out there about a half hour ago. Okay, look at these guys. Now there's a guy in a work truck again, that white work truck. Kelly Davenport is saying, hey, Tommy, and they're playing tag. The black one says, tag, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here Daniel comes Post, this. at one point, the, the, they're like, the llamas are wrong way drivers. <laughs> Yeah, see, this guy, I, this has got to be, that's got to be either there. Oh, look, he's really, he really is able to try to stop and talk to him. Okay. So this might be an opportunity right here. I mean, there's still enough space for them to get through, but instead they decide to turn and go the other way. The truth hurts, which is uh, 
says Jody, you have been outrated by a llama. <laughs> well, I guess the truth hurts, Jody, right? Well, actually, what did we when we were talking about Jody, I think we had a good six hundred viewers or so. We have more people watching so. the live, uh, the llama coverage. We're up to eight hundred now. Yeah, we're. Lo- oh world. no, we've lost the llamas. Oh, it'll, they'll be back. Don't worry. No, no, no. Okay, yeah, they're, see, they're back. Yeah. I was like, no, oh no, no, no not yeah. we can't lose llamas. It's just the technology. Just the signals are going to go out every once in a while, but hopefully not for too long. They're just so. Cu- I just love that they're sticking together. They haven't separated throughout this whole chase, you know. Oh no! That's what yeah. I love about this llama, uh, llama drama. You Correct. could say. Well, okay. It's that they're sticking together. It's not like one llama fends for itself. No, they're a right. team. They're a team, and they know if they get split up, kind of like Bonnie and Clyde, other well-known outlaws. <laughs> uh, you know that uh, their odds are oh, not no. as good as if they stick together. What's the matter? I don't know. I just saw a car, then I realized it was a cop, and then was everything was fine. But yeah, 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 it's yeah. still nerve-wracking to watch this all happen. Right. They're getting cor- cornered, and I'm just so nervous for them. Okay. <gasps> they Ooh. turned. This is yeah. crazy. This I really just, is how cool would it, I don't want to say how cool would it be, but it would be really neat to be in those cars on the streets with the llamas, seeing this. I mean, we I get know. to watch it live from an aerial point of view, right? Which I think we have the best point of view. Oh, we've look been at here. following yes. them everywhere. But I totally still, agree, but it would be cool to be on the ground. But you'd, be you'd have about five seconds to snap your picture because then they'd be gone. See, now this guy, that that sheriff's deputy probably thought, oh, here's a good opportunity. There, it's they are up right against that Boswell campus. Uh, okay, so the one takes off. Okay, so we're on Del Webb. There we go. Sky Fox kind of helping us out, showing us where so they are. So where right are now. we right now? All Come right, on. so let me pull up Del Webb on the Google map. Hold on. They're at the far side of the um, of the uh, old uh, Banner Medical Campus at uh, along Del Webb. <laughs> Someone's making a joke. At about Thunder th- th- about Thunderbird still. By the way, I love reading the comments coming in from all over the world. Cinna Spice Girl saying they're looking for the courthouse, insinuating that the llamas are looking for wherever Jody Arias is. <laughs> <laughs> they will. Even the llamas yeah. are on Arias Watch. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so every once in a while, I think they actually stop and rest in the shade, right? So they're like, okay, this is a nice, cool place to hang out. I mean, these guys have got, uh, they're some of, like the one guy looks like he's sort of partially sheared there. You notice that? So I guess certainly if they're alpacas, they're uh, being raised for their wool. And uh, here's a guy who, uh, you know, is partially shaved, but it's, you still got to be warming up. It's a nice 75 degree day here. Perfect late February, early March kind of weather. But every time we see somebody with their arms out saying, come on, stop. It only makes them run. This is so great. One, I think it was Patrick saying, if only my boss knew that I was spending my time at work watching llamas, I'd be at the unemployment office tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Watching the news. Yeah. But this is the news. This is what's happening right now here uh, locally in the greater Phoenix area. Yeah, Patrick. I mean, we all got to see how this comes to a conclusion. You're just trying to be informed, and, you know, if you need, we can probably write a letter for your boss. Or something, <laughs> you know? um, okay, so another parking lot. All right, now see here. There. <laughs> another person, Benita, saying llamas in support of Travis Alexander and wanted to be there to support the DP oh, verdict goodness. once it's read. <laughs> well, it has certainly attracted the attention of a lot this of law so enforcement. Fun. How about that guy kind of I'm, Okay, I'm convinced the, the white one is the leader now. Now watching yeah, it, the I, black one has followed more than the white one, and the right. bi- white one is larger. Yeah. So the white one is larger mm-hmm. and is taking charge, is little, the leader. A little older, a little wiser, you Sure, think? and yeah. then the little one is tagging along. Uh-huh. It's where it's like a lackey, you know, the little sidekick in high school. <laughs> The yeah. white, the white llama is like the cool jock, and then the black llama is the one that's a, his kind of his friend and sidekick that does all the stuff he doesn't want him to do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what do you... Okay. Yeah. Oh, now they're up against. Uh, looks like a ball field. I'm just fascinated. Who are these people on the ground? Are they just random passerbys? Are they actually like officials? That oh my god, these llamas or alpaca, whatever they are, they're fast. Yeah, they are fast. I mean, so far we haven't seen anybody that could even potentially keep up with them. But uh, I don't know. I've seen that guy in the vest two or three times, and there's that 
Is that that same white work truck that we've seen before? I mean, you can see how the old, the larger llama has uh, her leash or his leash still on him. And this is hilarious. Watch this. These people think they can. Uh, and it's, it's funny reading the comments and seeing how people are speaking on behalf of the llamas. For example, Rachel saying that one is saying, Llama bro, didn't we just come to the, come this way? And he's like, yeah, dude, but we didn't go the wrong way this way. <laughs> and it's just like these hypothetical scenarios. Like, what, would, what did one llama say to another? That's like the premise for a joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, what did the white llama say to the black llama? I mean, somebody start writing some jokes. I'll read them on now, air. They did just uh, get off of Del Webb Boulevard again. All right, so there's Del Webb. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is they're right at Del Webb and Thunderbird. They've kind of been hanging in that neighborhood for a while. So if we pulled up a map right now, would we yes. be able to like kind of yeah. chart their course? Yeah. Sort do, you, of? do you want to put it in the corner? Yeah. We, I know we don't want to. T- yeah. Maybe we can put it in the corner. Let's pull up the map over. Do you okay. want to pull up the map here? Sure. Once you find the map and the right. route, yeah. Maybe we'll be able to um, show the viewers. Okay. I'll work on the that. llamas and the map. That way, they have an idea. Because I feel like we're just watching from up here. Again, when we originally brought you this scene, they were at 103 and grand. They've obviously traveled quite a bit. Right. Just prancing around town. I don't even know. Are they still in Sun City or have yes. they made it? Yeah, made they're it really in the off? heart of Sun City. I accidentally typed in Google Mail and pulled up your mail oh, account. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm Hold getting up. an email from my Chase Quick Pay. Uh huh. <laughs> well, we can work on that in a while. Let me just, <laughs> let me just keep working on Google Maps uh, here. So, well, let's let's All continue right. to be on Llama Watch. Yeah, can I just give folks the latest on what's happening here? Is uh, we get people all over ca- the place watching this. How do you catch a llama? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's happening. All right. We're standing by to chat with Dr. Gray Stafford in just a second and uh, that'll be pretty interesting all right so let's get back up to Sun City Sami is working on uh, some of the latest details that we can give people and we are going to show everybody exactly what's happening in just one Yeah. Well, that was really close for a second there. I mean, because you had that electrical box and the wall, I mean, it really looked for a second like they were going to get uh, cornered. But every time it looks like they're going to get cornered, uh, people on the ground don't have the perspective that we do watching from our helicopter. They don't realize how fast these things really are. I mean, they're really hopping along. We're in the process right now of just getting a hold of Dr. Grace Stafford. Actually, we just got a hold of Dr. Gray Stafford with the Wildlife World Zoo, who's watching this live stream live with us right now. Uh, Dr. Stafford, uh, you're on speaker now. Can you talk a little bit about everything going on? Yeah, it's been rather fascinating to watch. Um, You know, originally when the animals were both together, um, I think that was an opportunity for us to try to, you know, set the perimeter and then perhaps slowly close the perimeter down and and get a hold of them because they seem to be pretty well bonded with each other. Um, and where one goes, the other one goes. So you can often use that to your advantage because if you get a hold of one or the slower one and, and one has a harness on it, it looks like it's got a rope around it, uh, then you can probably get the other one to, to stay in the vicinity. So All right. So, Gray, one of the questions we are being asked, we have people watching this uh, on our on News Now on our YouTube channel, literally all over the world, uh, and they're asking, well, so where most likely would they have come from? And I said, all right, well, we've got a great zoo on the west side, but I know they didn't come from there. I presume we have people who are growing them for their wool uh, in areas not too far outside of Sun City. Is that your take on it? That's probably the case, absolutely, because, uh, you know, they're almost, uh, they've been domesticated for centuries. Uh, a lot of people like to have them as pets, whether they, they do it simply as a, you know, a backyard animal in a, you know, horse area, 
or if they're doing it more from a commercial standpoint to get that wool, as you say. It looks to me like the white one's been sheared, at least in the middle, Yeah. Uh, from the images. So that's probably the case. You know, a lot of people like to use that wool to manufacture sweaters and that sort of thing. It hasn't been done for, you know, a thousand years or more. Uh, I think the, the main thing I would do is, is try to set a perimeter with vehicles, uh, even in a shady area, give the animals a chance to, to rest, get their wits about them, and that way, uh, you know, law enforcement and others can perhaps approach a little more closely. So would the, would the animal behavior, and I know you're watching this on a little bit of a delay from what right. we're seeing, so just kind of work with us. We are seeing right now, it looked like a handler, you'll see this here in just a second, we're seeing what appeared to be a handler up literally doing the horse whisperer routine for a second, walking with it, and almost, almost able to reach out. I think we might have a successful conclusion here. Oh, no, no, uh, in just a second, because he was able literally to walk right along. And it looked like, uh, obviously, the animals develop a bond with their, um, either with their, uh, with their grower or their handler, that kind of a thing. Oh, and, we got the white one back, too. And so just uh, as we watch this here, they've been apart for about three or four minutes, and now suddenly they're back together again. Is that the best bet, is to have uh, the handler uh, literally kind of calm them down, and then they can try to get a hold on them? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think you want to get them calm and, and slowly close down the loop, get your team together so that you don't have those opportunities for them to escape as they've done for the past several minutes you know, as people close in. You know, you want to take your time. As long as the animal's not in the middle of the road and, and traffic's been alerted, now, you know, see that you mean that they're back together. This, I think, gives you an opportunity, especially since one of them does have a rope on them. Uh, if you, you know, get a good, quick, lucky strike and grab a hold of that rope, you've got one of the animals and hopefully the other one will stay in the vicinity. Right, right. Um, and we were getting a lot of questions on um, online whether these are alpacas or if they're llamas. Can you clarify and can you elaborate on what the difference is between the two animals? Yeah, uh, to me they look like llamas. Uh, alpacas, uh, for lack of a better description, look like they have more of a moppy head on top uh, with extra uh, thick and longer hair on top. So they look a little different. They're from slightly different habitats and regions in, in South America. Uh, these are both uh, basically uh, domesticated versions of their wild cousins. You know, llamas have been in, in human care for so many years as part of uh, commerce in South and Central America because they're so sure-footed. They are descendants of a common animal related to camels, so they have a very wide foot compared to other animals, and they, um, therefore they're, they've, they've lent themselves to being pack animals for, for many, many, many centuries. As, uh, do you have any idea how um, common this is here in the valley? I know it's surprising people who are watching from areas outside of Arizona, but you only have to go, uh, you know, a half mile outside of the Sun Cities, and, and uh, you could be in a more rural or more agricultural setting. But uh, is this quite common here in Arizona? Well, you know, I think it is because, I mean, you think about the history of areas like Scottsdale. Scottsdale's a horse community still. You know, maybe not so much these days, but there are entire neighborhoods uh, in what would otherwise look like a residential area that have horses and other livestock, maybe uh, pygmy goats, and certainly oh. in some cases llamas. So uh, not uncommon at all, and particularly, as you say, out in the Northwest Valley, there's a lot more agricultural land out there. Hang on one quick second, Gray. It looks like we've got one of them that was just successfully lassoed just a moment ago. Yeah, and it looks like just it's a, moment a ago. shopping center, or no, it looks like the... Uh, Parking area of an apartment complex. Yeah. Now, the other one uh, is still running free right. and actually is quite a ways one, away. The black one has been uh, lassoed. Yeah, it's and j again, uh, the just white one's still on the loose. For folks who are watching us, we're, uh, Dr. Gray Stafford from the Wildlife World Zoo is watching this on just a little bit of a delay. Uh, and uh, we're trying to kind of get you the same information at the same time. So it looks like they did manage to get the black one lassoed. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, go, go ahead with what you were telling us a little bit about uh, just what we should understand about them. Well, they, you know, if they're raised by people and they're put in a, you know, a similar situation as you might have horses and, and goats and that sort of thing, they can be quite affectionate animals. Um, you know, you always hear about them spitting and that sort of thing. That's, that's typically if they're feeling territorial during breeding season and so forth. But 
Uh, I know that a lot of people are, are llama and alpaca enthusiasts, not just for the wool, but for the companionship aspect of these animals. Um, we've had many on your Fox 10 set over the years yep. as youngsters. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if they get to be five and six feet tall at, at the at the head, you know, they don't travel in zoo vans as, as well. But um, this is not as big an animal as a horse. Um, doesn't mean you can't be kicked by one or, or headbutted by one. Um, I think the main thing here is to take your time, maybe show that the other one is, is under control, but being treated well and calmly and keep voices down. And again, it's just establishing that safety perimeter that you can then close that down until the animal decides to, to give up and, and is restrained. Uh, one of the viewers actually asked, how common uh, is this scene right here, llamas on the loose? Is this a common occurrence? Llamas on the loose. Um, I, I, this is the first time I've seen it in 15 years living in the valley. But of course, we saw a few months ago that bear that came in from the, the East Mountains uh, mm-hmm. uh, towards the globe and so yep, forth. Right. And it took a long time for, for law enforcement and wildlife officials to get their team together. And you want to kind of steer the animal away from populated areas, away from traffic areas, because of course, it's not just a llama that's at risk here, it's, it's any vehicle that might strike this animal. This is a very large animal, and it can cause serious damage to a vehicle. So, you know, you want to really take your time and make sure that you don't keep rushing things uh, when you're not prepared to close that loop and prevent the, the escape. One uh, of the, as, yeah, one of the questions we had early on was uh, if they might have escaped from a zoo, and, and we know that... Uh, that's just not going to happen here. They've obviously escaped from uh, an individual handler, but are there? Are you aware? Are there any requirements in terms of fencing, uh, et cetera, uh, when uh, someone gets into the business of raising animals like this? I mean, I could see where uh, it, obviously they were being led somewhere because he's he's got yeah. his his, uh, his leash on him, and so somebody something spooked him. They could have been in the process of transporting him or moving him around. But are you aware of what? Re- requirements exist for people who uh, who have alpacas or llamas as a business? Other than any local ordinances that might exist at the city level, I'm, I'm not aware of any. Uh, obviously, your, your property has to be zoned for having animals like that, either as a pet or if it's more of a commercial enterprise, then you've got to be zoned properly for that. But you bring up a good point about a, a zoo situation. Well, we, have, we are required by law federal and state law to have double barriers. So not only are the animals enclosed in a corral, for example, but then the entire zoo property is enclosed by a certain height fence. So that if an animal, if a gate was left open, if an animal slipped by a handler, uh, if, a, if a child left the petting zoo gate open, that animal's not going anywhere. They're still going to be contained to the zoo grounds in, in our case. <laughs> Obviously that doesn't exist necessarily on a farm or in someone's uh, horse corral. Have you ever noticed a situation, Gray, when you are in the process of getting ready to transport? As you say, we've had these animals right here in our studio, and they seem so, I don't know, they, they seem so calm, etc. But have you ever noticed a kind of a skittish nature uh, to these particular breeds? Oh, sure. I mean, these are, you know, these are herding animals. They are hoofed animals. Uh, their main defense is to keep moving and stay away from predators and to, to run. So in an unfamiliar environment, like a city street and dozens of vehicles and dozens more law enforcement and, and people just trying to help, you know, the, all the things the animal may have be familiar with are now gone or changed. And you can see them just trying to flee this unknown situation. So this is very, very common. That's why it's really important to, I think, for, for everyone to, to move slowly, stop traffic where necessary, to line up vehicles to, to create a visual barrier and then move slowly as you get in the, the wranglers, the, the folks with the ropes and so forth, so that you don't create a situation where every time that animal escapes from one scenario, it's getting better for the next one. And so you really want to go slowly. You know, for example, if you take your pet to the veterinarian to have some, some vaccinations done, it's really important that you use enough you know, passive restraint on that animal so they don't flee when it's time to get that injection. If they wiggle out of it, they're only learning that next time they just wiggle a little harder and they can escape this unpleasant thing right. called right. an injection. It's the same learning process going on right here with this llama and with any animal that's on the loose. Here comes a lasso attempt. Hold on just one second. Boy, if that guy can get his lasso working right here. Oh, he got him. He got it. He got him. He got it. Good. 
Wow. Okay. So we had a couple. Actually, we got three guys here. Wow. Uh, in this uh, in this work truck, and one of them had the last two. <laughs> They're giving each other high fives. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the thing that was concerning me is that it was right on the verge. Thank goodness they've got that decorative wall between the side street and Grand Avenue, right. because you got six, seven lanes of traffic out there on Grand. But it looked like it was heading right for the parking lot to the medical complex. That huge medical facility that's out there and you know then if you get it on a onto the campus of uh, of a medical center uh who knows who knows by the what way llama watch is trending on twitter can i just add that in uh, is that right yeah and, and how appropriate that the guys drove up in a dodge pickup truck i mean that's, that's like a modern western right there <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly I right know. someone needs to take a photo of the sure. scene the screenshot yeah. of oh Mama you got to believe the executives from dodge are going to be getting a hold of those guys and make yeah, their next super bowl commercial or something <laughs> it is so interesting though uh gray because we've seen so many situations here in arizona of a major metropolitan area of four million people, when we have these animal uh, interactions, I think it's it's uh, surprising to people how often it does happen. As you said, it was not that long ago we had a bear on the loose coming in from uh, from up out of the Superstition Mountains. I just want to say llamas is the second most trending thing in the United States right now. Are you kidding it's me? These llamas, I'm pretty sure no one else is talking about any other llamas. These are the most famous llamas in the country right now. Wow. Well, Ron, you you raise an interesting point, and I think there are probably two basic reasons for that. One, the valley is growing. We are extending our borders well into the desert, uh, wild and pristine areas, so we're going to see these encounters. Uh, we've had, you know, weather changes and drought conditions, so animals are looking for moisture, they're looking for food, and we're creating these lush habitats here in, in urban areas. And then, of course, the history of Arizona is, is rural, it's agricultural, it's it's western you know television movies so uh you're seeing kind of uh those those animals when they do come out like they are today it's probably a combination of of both of those factors yeah well absolutely so um no doubt one of the questions we were asked a minute ago is they've got to be awfully scared in a situation like that they have no idea where they are right Right. And, you know, you see this panic situation anytime you see a feral dog or cat on the side of the road. You know, it just kind of breaks my heart to see that what must surely be dismay and terror on the part of that animal. Uh, but the good news is now they've got the animals con- under control. They can, uh, you know, the animals, if they've been handled at all, which it looks like they have with one of them having a halter on it, um, they're used to being led around. They may not be pets, they may not be that socialized to humans like the ones in our petting zoo situation, but they're at least familiar enough with people, so now that they're under control and can't flee, things should calm down for them and and, uh, they'll settle down, I think. You know, um, you were talking a minute ago about how the learned behavior of animals, if they can wiggle out of a situation, unfortunately they just learn to wiggle harder the next time around. What about when they've been in a uh, almost a panic, stressful situation uh, like this, just in terms of, uh, you know, getting them settled down and getting them back to uh, their regular environment. I, I think that you raise an excellent point. And, you know, initially, uh, escaping and being someplace new can be fun and interesting because it's, cause it's different. Once you start throwing in vehicles and, you know, airplanes overhead and, and helicopters and lots of strange people and noises, then you're right, an animal can go into a panic situation. And that's what you really want to avoid, if you can, by creating that perimeter, whether you're using fences or vehicles or so forth, to, to prevent uh, animals running into traffic, but also uh, to prevent them from rehearsing this flea behavior, this fleeing behavior, this panic, as you will, that only can spiral uh, even higher. You know, get into that fight or flight syndrome, in this case, a flight syndrome, and it does arouse the animals and does lessen their ability to think clearly, I guess. Well, we sure had a lot of people with a lot of interesting questions that uh, one of the things about this uh, this news now that we've got our new YouTube channel is that literally people are watching uh, from all over the world. Can you recall, beside, I'm trying to remember now, we had this llama today, and it looks like they're, they've calmed him down at least a little bit here, that they may have a transport vehicle nearby. I'm glad to see them doing that. They just stopped and for a, it looked like maybe two or three minutes just tried to kind of calm him down. Right. Um, uh, and then we had the situation with, was that a black bear? 
or a brown bear? It was bear, a black bear. It was a black bear, yes. and that was out in the complete opposite end. That's probably 50 miles the other side of the metro area, all the way out in, the, in Queen Creek. But we've had other situations, for example, where we've seen horses, right. uh, where we've seen, and it might surprise people to know that we've got wild horses, etc. But it's really been fascinating, Gray, just to, uh, to get a little bit of perspective from you today. And So as we watch, and people around the world watch it, uh, we can uh, understand a little bit more about uh, really seeing this sort of through uh, the perspective of of the two animals who created quite a stir. There, there are going to be a lot of people in Sun City uh, who've got a lot of stories to share because it was a, they were running a, through a lot of backyards. Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks for your time. Hey, great to be with you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and make another phone call. Uh, I know uh, Fox 10's Mia Garcia was speaking with uh, Alicia Santiago from Arizona Llama Rescue, and she was saying that llamas are not supposed to be tied around the neck like that. So I want to give her a call and get her take on um, on this llama watch that we're all uh, watching right now Mm -hmm. and see, because she is with Arizona Llama Rescue, so I know she'll have some insight as to uh, the proper way, I guess you could say, to... Um, capture, apprehend, right? safely secure mm-hmm. a llama. So yeah. give me just one second. I'm going to give her a call now. Okay, so I'll, it's 1.30. It would be a good time for me to uh, just, uh, while Sami is hopping on the phone, to update everybody what's going on. We got a report here about an hour ago that there were two llamas on the loose just outside of the large retirement communities of Sun City and Sun City West in the northwest part of the Metro Phoenix area. And we saw a lot of people just literally trying to stop them. Uh, you are watching our new YouTube channel uh, that uh, we continue to invite folks to uh, subscribe to this channel because we have live news coverage of events happening here in Phoenix, including this, the latest developments from the courthouse in the Jody Arias case, and other stories that happen both locally and around the world. And we've got uh, somebody with some interesting perspective here, Samia. Right, right. I have Alicia Santiago with Arizona Llama Rescue on the phone now. Uh, Alicia, you've been watching this live, uh, I guess you could call it Llama Watch, uh, over the last few minutes. What's your take on uh, everything that's happened thus far? Well, it's apparent that this llama is someone's pet that got out somehow. Because when you're watching him, he's um, he's halter trained because he's leading well. Uh-huh. And he's been sheared. He or she has been sheared. Mm-hmm. What? Tell us a little bit about, maybe you can give us the perspective. Are there a lot of llamas here, either on the fringes of the metro area or in, we do have little agricultural pockets here and there, of course, across the, uh, across the metro area. How common is this? Well, it used to be we knew all the people in Arizona that had llamas. There weren't many of us. But now they are more popular. So I don't even know how many people have llamas here. I get calls around shearing season, which is starting up now, and I'm really surprised at all the people that have llamas here. In the valley, which is surprising, there's more more llamas in Flagstaff in the White Mountains and then down in the Sonoida area where it's cooler. Mm -hmm. So you're saying uh, population-wise, as the valley continues to grow and becomes more urbanized, uh, naturally they're going to go there, but also they are raised for their wool, and I would imagine that actually is a fairly lucrative business. Well, yeah, they're they're raised for their fiber, but they also are used as packing animals. So if you're a backpacker, they could carry quite a bit of weight. They have um, saddles that are made for them with packs, panniers, that'll carry your tent, your your um, your sleeping bag, your camping stove, food, etc. So it could carry quite a bit, and then, you know, you could enjoy the hike while they carry everything else. Now, Alicia, uh, is there a safe way to, uh, I don't, don't want to use the word capture, but uh, safely capture these llamas that were on the loose? I mean, the way that uh, we watched it happen live on TV, is that the best way to get control of the llamas? You, yeah, you should not be lassoing them because their necks are fragile. So the way that we catch llamas, and we have caught llamas that have been wild. <laughs> these were not wild llamas, which is why they were easier. This one was easier to catch. But you... you um, 
you use a chain of people, basically, and then you get them in a corner. And then if you don't have a halter or a rope, you know, or, you know, a proper halter for them, you can take um, a rope and you put it high up around their neck, right under their chin. And that, you can lead them around with, but you don't ever want to lasso one because you, you risk the, you can risk breaking their neck. When was the most recent time that you were on uh, an actual, what Samia said, capture or rescue, et cetera, where you, uh, you know, you were on the spot and uh, you or the folks with you actually did have to uh, capture one of them? Um, about a few months ago, in the fall. Okay. But that was it. That was, uh, we had to shear the llamas and these were llamas that weren't used to being handled. So what we did was we took some panels and we made a smaller area and we herded them into the smaller area. Is there a reason that these two llamas chose to uh, stay side by side throughout this whole chase? I mean, they were they were almost like buddies. You know, people on our YouTube channel were joking that they were like Bonnie and Clyde. They never really separated. They were always a, a pair. Do llamas tend to uh, form bonds like that? They are very herd oriented. That's why when we adopt llamas out, we always say if you do not have a llama already, you have to adopt at least and you know, two at a time. Now, you mentioned, or our understanding is that you have formed a group called Arizona Llama Rescue. Why did Correct. you Why did you form that group? How long has it been around, and what exactly do you folks do? Um, well, I actually started rescuing llamas back in 99 or 2000, but we didn't become officially a 501c3 nonprofit until 2007. And what happened was people, once they passed away, there was no one to take their llamas. Mm. So we took the llamas, you know, the adult children would say, my mom passed away, she had these llamas, and we don't want to move to the country and raise the llamas. So you would come in and basically find new homes for them? Yes, we do. Are they, um, uh, do, for the most part, do, do people breed them as well, and are they considered expensive animals? Well, they can be. It's just like, let's take your German Shepherd dog. You have pet quality and you have show quality. And we actually have the most expensive llama in Payson, Arizona. And it's um, $260,000 for that llama. It's a show quality. Wow. Okay, now, yeah. is there a lot of raising of llamas up in the Payson area? Um, it, yeah, in Payson, um, Strawberry, mm -hmm. um, Sholo, yeah. Flagstaff, Williams. Yeah. You'll, you'll find quite a few llamas up in that area. It is interesting to me that uh, you have certain animals that a habitat in the desert uh, is ideal for them, and being up at uh, seven or eight or even ten thousand feet would not be. And uh, on the other hand, other animals that uh, just would not thrive in the desert at all, and really would only work in the uh, mountains. And yet, here's an animal that seems to do okay in both environments. Well, we have we we'll, we'll have llamas down in the valley during the winter time. And a lot of people, they take them, when it's April or May, they'll bring them up to the northern part of Arizona for the summer. Yeah, sure. Well, and I think all, all four with, million with of us, if we could, would get out of here and go, go be up in the mountains in the summer. It's so beautiful up there come <laughs> summertime. But anyway, yeah. um, all right, anything else about your organization that you want to share with us or, or, or our viewers that are watching you here on uh, News Now on our Fox 10 YouTube channel? Oh, yes. Well, you know, there's other llama organiza rescue organizations throughout the U.S., by the way. There's um, in New Mexico and Colorado is Southwest Llama Rescue. In the southern states, uh, southern eastern states of Southeast Llama Rescue, um, we all pretty much do the same thing. We take in llamas that are homeless, and we try to find them homes. If they are not trained, we do halter train them. Um, we do shear them. We, they have to have their toenails trimmed. Um, in Arizona, we are looking for volunteers, foster homes. We really need foster homes. Um, right now, we can't take in anymore. We are at our maximum, all of our volunteers. 
are at their maximum. Mm. So wow. we do need foster homes. Well, maybe it was fortuitous then that we were able to put you on news now, and uh, undoubtedly, I mean, we have a lot of people watching right now as you're mm-hmm. describing it. Um, what is your contact information? Do you have a website? Yes, we do. It is azlamarescue.org, and we also have a Facebook page, which is updated on a regular basis. I um, I don't want to get too soft and fuzzy here, but let me just ask this question. You can tell me if I'm off base. I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word lovable. Would you could you describe a llama as lovable uh, as much time as you've spent around them? And if so, why? Oh yeah, I have a couple that are very lovable, and they are they are very stress reducing. If you've had a bad day at the office, they seem to know that. And they'll come up to you and they'll just kind of rest their head on your shoulder. It's like, it's okay, I know it was a bad day, but you're home now and you can just relax. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, that is one great thing is uh, if in fact they can help somebody uh, de-stress, I can see why they, why they really are popular. Would you care to even put a number on it? How many llamas, I mean, if you had to just sort of round it off. How many llamas do you think there are here in the uh, in the area? Um, over a thousand. Is that right? Now that includes both the Metro Phoenix area and up into the Payson area, as well as the White Mountains. Oh, if you're talking about that, no, then, then if you're talking about all of the state of Arizona, is that what you're talking about? Well, I really wanted the valley, but you're saying a thousand in the valley, but yeah, you're saying I'm statewide. Yeah, I'm saying a thousand in the valley. Wow. <laughs> Wow, that's really something. I okay. drive around and I see so many. I'll, I'll be driving around and I'll, I'll, all of a sudden I'll see them in someone's sensed pasture. It's like, wow, where did those come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, uh, Alicia, we've really appreciated getting to spend a little bit of time. A lot of good perspective from you on exactly what life is like for these guys right. and why a lot of people uh, really would describe them as lovable. Lovable they dogs. are, <laughs> and remember, you can train them to pack. So if you are, you have an active lifestyle, you like to get out there and hike, these are great hiking companions. Wow. All right, Alicia, thanks so much for chatting with us this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Bye. Okay, bye. Well, a successful we had a lot of, conclusion Oh, I here. know, and we're, well, we're still watching. I mean, the llamas are in that white truck, that vehicle that we're looking at now. Yeah. Uh, and we're continuing. We're we're not stopping. Llama Watch continues even <laughs> if we don't see the actual llama. Well, it will be interesting because I th- have a feeling we're going to see that uh, there. They're right by. See, they've got some of those uh, man-made lakes that they've put in there. And you've got the hospital that we just had. I have a feeling Do the we- area where they're being raised is not too far away from this whole kind of Del Webb Boulevard and Thunderbird Road area that we've been looking at. But I, I Uh-oh. think Sky Looks Fox like is we headed. We have lost our llama feed. Yeah. Oh no. We'll get back to us. Yes. It still says Llama Watch down here because we're going to talk about Llama Watch for a little bit, even though we don't have any more images of the llamas. You know what? We're actually going to replay some of that footage of the llamas roaming the streets of Sun City. I know that's going through our editing system right now. Right. We'll bring you more uh, a replay of that llama footage for those of you who may have tuned in at the very end, who may have only seen the capture or what happened after. We're going to go back and clip the video right. where the llamas are just on the loose, roaming around on the streets, jaywalking, doing all sorts of things. In the meantime, if you're wondering what you ran across here on the internet, this is News Now, which is our opportunity to bring you live, constant streaming news information from both locally right here in Phoenix, out into the suburbs like Sun City and around the world as things are happening. Well, a lot is happening right now. Two of the biggest stories in the country are happening here in Phoenix. You have yeah, Llama Watch right. and Arius Watch. I cannot believe that <laughs> llamas became the number two trender in the United it's States. Number one. Llamas is the number one trending topic right now in the United States. Oh, for goodness And sakes. then we have uh, multiple trending topics. You uh-huh. have... Uh, for a little while, black llama was trending. 
And so I kind okay. of took that as like left shark you know, during the Super Bowl. I was like, <laughs> move over left shark. Yeah. Black Llama is in town. Yeah. Uh, you have Sun City trending. When is Sun City trending? Thank you. We it's love a, that. That's I mean, a it's great amazing. community. It's a, it's a little local small community, but it's making national news. Yeah. Thanks to these llamas. Lorenzo Llamas is also trending. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, there's so many different llama. There was a t- hashtag team llama was trending for a while. That's not in the top 10 anymore. But yes, the number one trending topic in the United States currently is hashtag llamas have you sent your llamas tweet yet no did you yeah i did okay. of course i did i was what do so you i was so yeah of course you're like right I on mean, top of the twitter i'm actually kind of bummed that i was like 20 minutes behind on tweeting about the llama i wish i sent out the tweet earlier so all my followers could have joined in yeah. on llama watch yeah. way before i only was able to send out a tweet you know, when things were slowing down and we'd already captured the llama. Well, we realized yesterday that we have such an international audience uh, I wonder what they're us. saying. We haven't even, I haven't you been able to see the what they've been saying. Box. There have been so many chats. Uh, okay. Everyone, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Yay for the llamas. Too much excitement in Phoenix. Uh, yesterday we realized <laughs> we've got peop- uh, people watching literally from this side of the... <laughs> This side of the United States to the far side and all the way over to Europe. Well, what's what funny is that a lot of our viewers are tuning in because they're waiting uh, for the Jody Arias well, verdict yeah, sure. to come down. Right. And so a lot of them are incorporating uh, Jody Arias jokes in terms of the llamas. A lot of them saying that the llamas wanted justice for Travis. Now, I see one from <laughs> Erica who's saying, Kirk Nermi appointed llama council, ex viewed llama porn, should go free. Oh, for goodness <laughs> like, sakes. <laughs> I mean. Well, Kirk Nermi's getting a lot of mileage out of this, when it's whether so he realizes funny. it or not. Yeah. We also, oh, uh, one of our videographers uh or photojournalist uh rick davis the one who was out at the train crash earlier in phoenix yep. actually got a close-up shot with the llama are you guys ready to see this close-up oh with the you llama? have got to come over to your computer screen right now if okay. you're just listening you're at work and you're working on your work come this, on over you gotta I might check have this, to this regram out this oh that's excellent because it's so good we all need to regram with rick davis on a on Instagram. Let me pull this up for you guys. Are you ready to see the llama? Oh, this is great. Oh my gosh. Llama watch. Ready? Huh? Boom. That is the white llama face to face <laughs> with the white llama. That is great. I kind of want to tweet this right now. Go for it, huh? People need to know. I am, as you just requested, sending out my Twitter link to this. It's so good. Give us a second, guys, while we, while we uh, type for ourselves on social media. I would bet we can turn that chase video around within just a few more minutes. So. Oh, I know people are working on it. Yeah. What's a... That is such a great shot. Oh, this this is a tweet on Fox 10 Phoenix, by the way, guys. Okay. So I would suggest people retweeting the llama. This is the greatest photo I love this. Yeah. I'm a big fan of llamas on the loose. Are you going to take a picture right yep, now? Absolutely. That's such a great shot. Rick Davis. The thing about Rick Davis, and I've worked with Rick for a long, long time here in this newsroom, going all the way back to the 80s, is that he just has this sixth sense. Um, you know, I'd love to, when he gets back into the building, I'd love to have a chance to just sit down, plop down here and visit with you for a few minutes about how he does this. He has this... Um, There was a photographer uh, here, photojournalist in the newsroom for many years who had the same ability. His name was Phil Walsh, and I loved, loved working with Phil because he just had this innate ability to be around the story whenever and wherever it was happening. And so um, Rick is the same way, and he he always has a... I saw him in the lunchroom a few hours ago, and he had that radio right with him, you know, and it's blaring, and he's listening to every police squad car and fire department engine that's uh, on its way somewhere and um that is such a great picture it's that, so great uh, are you going to tweet that or instagram i just it? i know i retweeted um fox 10 okay great yeah because it was just so cute i just wrote the world's most famous llama because it's true i noticed yesterday super famous samia that yeah. even after we were no longer on the uh, on the internet here with the broadcast yeah that people were uh Joining us, following us on Twitter, I'm Ron Hoon, Fox 10, and you're Samia Khan. I am. K-H-A-N. K-H-A-N. And, uh, it's, I mean, we love having we'll a chance our, to communicate you know with you while live. We're on, while we're at it, I'll just throw it up there so people can see. Okay, good. We love talking to you live, and we love having a chance, even after we're done, to, uh, you know, just to get to visit with you a little bit about uh, your thoughts on each day's 
fun. I know. Well, I'm going to get back to Jody Arias talk in just a second. I'm reading the chat window, okay. laughing at some of the things people say. Noah Hill is chiming in his thoughts on the Jody Arias trial, saying his favorite part of the whole trial was when she would answer a jury question, and then her lawyer would be like, objection, my client has amnesia, so can't possibly have remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it is Throwback Thursday, so it's the, kind of the ideal day to remember everything of the past, including okay. the first Jody Arias trial. Did you do your Throwback Thursday yet? No, I've been. It's been chaotic. It I barely has been had chaotic. time to eat lunch. Why are you you're off work an hour ago? You're just staying here because Llama Watch is too good to leave. I get it. I know. I'll just show my Throwback. This is my Throwback Thursday today, and it actually it's pretty apropos because that's Ireland. I'm representing the Pats Run, which is one of the great runs. Uh, honoring the memory of Pat Tillman. But anyway, out in Ireland, Samia, I'm upside down kissing the Blarney Stone in Ireland. That's my throwback Thursday from uh, almost four years ago. That's you got to go. I do. They There's say, a lot I need to do. They say once you kiss that stone and you're upside down and you're several stories high, and you can, can you see, I don't know if you can see the grass <laughs> below us there, but... Uh, there's a guy who holds on to you so you don't fall. There's a little bar, but I don't know if that would protect you too much. But they say once you kiss the Blarney Stone, upside down and backwards, that you have the gift of gab for the rest of your life. That's crazy. Would you say, did it work for me? Or Yes. Yes, because you're still here. <laughs> and you've been at work since like 4 this morning. It well, is almost 2 p.m. Yeah, I know. I think it's time you go to sleep. I think it's time Good. that I play the rest of this uh a uh, segment that Troy did where he talks about uh, executions and all that. And, like, basically this is really insightful because for all of you out there that want Jody Arias to get the death penalty, you want to know. This is what she'd have to go through. So I played the first uh, I played the first 10 minutes of it or so earlier. I'm going to play the last 15 minutes of it. And then right after that, I will play the video that you guys are highly awaiting. It's the video of... Um, an original news piece from 2008, back before we knew all of this crazy stuff about the Jody uh, Arias trial and the Travis Alexander murder, when all we knew the tra was that Travis was murdered and nothing else. So yeah. I will play that for you guys in a little bit. But in the meantime, I'm going to get back to the story I was playing for you guys before the llamas <laughs> interrupted. Which was Literally, I paused right? this and I was like, uh, you know, this is a great story. I had started playing this 25-minute clip. Yeah. And eight minutes, nine minutes into it, llamas are on the loose. And I'm like, llamas, execution, llamas right. are alive. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fine we line. We have to go with llamas. It is a sort of a balancing act we have to do in this business constantly because uh, I mean, we can cover the crazy stuff as well as the really serious stuff. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Troy has done such a great job covering this during trial number one and during trial number two. So don't be surprised if Troy pops up here later in the afternoon, spends a little more time with you as we continue to await word of the verdict from the courthouse uh, where our studios fingers are crossed blocks it, away. It comes and, today. Fingers yeah, crossed it, it comes today. Well. Yeah. Because if it doesn't come today, according to Celeste, she's hearing word that the jurors aren't planning to deliberate tomorrow. Right. Meaning they would have a three-day weekend and then we'd be back on Arius Watch come Monday. So if you want, take 10 seconds and go up right at the top of the page there and just click subscribe and we'll hang out with you more in the future too. Yeah, but we're still hanging out with you now. I'm not going anywhere. I'm, yes. on, I'm on news now all day. I my brief breaks are when I play like 10-minute clips for you guys. Yeah. That's when I'm allowed to like go to the bathroom, eat some food. Sometimes I just give up and eat food in front of you guys though. At I, this point, it's just like I'm just on air all the time. Do you know I actually watch you <laughs> when I'm at the gym? out in Mesa at like four in the afternoon. You guys should watch too. Some of you guys might not be able to stay near your computer. Yeah. That's okay. You're driving somewhere. Plug us into your Bluetooth in the car and just listen to us. Yeah. When you're at the gym, who needs music when you can listen to me and Ron or me and Troy or John Hook or <laughs> Carrie or Mia or Andrew or Nicole? You know, we have so many great anchors and reporters that join me every single day to give their insight on today's top stories. Ron especially. Ron is a trooper. Ron doesn't... I don't even have to ask Ron if he wants to join me now. It's just sort of assumed. Every morning at 10. Every morning oh, at 10. And I love out. that you love doing this. Yeah. I love that you guys watching love watching us. I love that you guys uh, chat in the chat window and interact it's so fun reading your comments they can be funny they can be sad they can be sweet they can be sincere whatever kind of comment it is we're just glad that you're there you're watching you're interacting okay. i'm gonna let um ron go home and get some sleep or go okay. to the gym and watch us there yep. i'm gonna play the rest of troy's uh story about what executions are like and what would happen really if jody gets on death row and then right after that you guys will see that story that you've been waiting for, the story from 2008. So stay tuned. I'll see you guys soon. Here we go. So we walked into it. Um, 
again, very cramped, about 25 people in there. We sit on benches. Mm -hmm. And it was so close that the person sitting next to me, we were touching shoulders while we were in there. And, and this was the, the, uh, a previous execution? And this is yesterday or oh, whatever. Oh, yesterday. Oh, yeah. okay. let's, let's fast forward to yesterday since everybody's talking about that today. But it was very similar in the previous two executions, but same place. So we sat down on these little benches, touching shoulders. Directly behind us, as you turn around and look, you can see the outline uh, of the gas chamber. It's still there. The gas chamber is directly behind wow. you. So as you sit, you can almost reach back and touch it. That's how small the room is. And it's got little blinds on it. And then a big chimney that shoots out of there that would vent the gas. Right. Mm -hmm. So nobody else would get you know, sick or killed because of the gas. And then directly in front of us is a big, like a picture window, rectangular, with a curtain drawn on it. Yeah, and I think we've seen this video. We've yes. shown some of this video. And you see the, basically the gurney, the bed that the, right. uh, that the convict will lay down on. Yeah, will was on. And, um, but what was new this last time is they had two monitors, probably like 25 inch or 27 inch TV monitors on either side because those were clicked on as soon as we got in there and we saw Wood laying on the table with his arms exposed. So now, as part of the process of a witness, you watch the IVs actually go into his arms. Interesting. And now, that why, never why did before. they not show that before? Is there I'm a, not quite they sure. Didn't, you, you don't see who's putting the, the uh, IVs in? You see them, but they're wearing eye protection and a mask. So you could ne never identify the executioner. No. Of this. That's by state law. Mm -hmm. You can't identify the executioner. And, so uh, is it one person? Are there two people? There Are two. there guards in there? Yes, uh, yes, to all three. There were, there were two people, um, medical personnel, putting the IVs in. The, uh, there was a corrections officer in there with them. I believe at one point there were two corrections officers, and then at one point the warden is also in there. We obviously don't <clears> know <throat> the identity of the executioner, but do we know if that is the only role they play in the uh, Department of Corrections? Uh, we or don't do know much about them. We just don't uh, know. The only thing they really release are their, their, in a very general way, their credentials. You know, what they, right. how, how come they're qualified to do this? That's about it. Okay. You know? So, um, so the, the TV, we see him put the, um, the IVs in and he's laying there and he's kind of looking around and then the TVs go off, the curtain opens and there he is, he's right there. Mm -hmm. And he was wearing in that same kind of orange jumpsuit you see him in there. Uh, short sleeves and the tops of the sleeves, which I thought was interesting, I'd never seen before, were Velcro. So they could open them up and get to his arms really easily. So it was a special suit made. Okay. So the IV this. is up here in the top of the No, arm? the IV was down here, but he was wearing short sleeves and they were Velcro. So I think it's so they could slide up. They had a um, blood pressure. Oh, okay. To determine slider. his uh, vital statistic, you know, probably his vitals. Probably, and also to pump up and get the veins <laughs> right. correct. You know. Um, why, now, why would they show the IV going in on uh, television screens and not just open the... Uh, the, the drapes basically and let you see it live I don't know. right there. That's another good question. I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I was surprised that we had the TV screens. I'd never seen that before. Mm -hmm. uh, and you assume they're recording all of this because they want to know that they did it right. And in case anything goes wrong, they want to be able to have a record of what right. happened. Uh, and you also maybe get a better view. I mean, the fact that you're looking at a camera looking straight down on them, seeing everything happen, is probably better than. Mm -hmm seeing something like that happen from you know, three or four feet away. A lot of side. people who follow the death penalty and, and things that, that go along with it um, are very much aware of a new drug protocol. But other people say, wait, why did it take two hours as opposed to 10 minutes? Why is there uh, all of this hoopla surrounding the new drugs? Why are they switching the drugs around? Yes. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that before <clears throat> we know, get into the final for, moments? For years and years, there was a three drug protocol. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do is they'd use, I believe it was a barbiturate, to put you out. Then there was another drug that went in that stopped your lungs, and the last drug that went in stopped your heart. They're called paralytics. Mm -hmm. They basically make you paralyzed. So the whole process was pretty fast. You stop somebody's lungs and heart for 10 minutes, all the tissues are dying right. and it's over, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the people who made those drugs, they weren't made to kill people. They're made to help people in different ways, different uses. Right. So the manufacturers, right. So the manufacturers started saying, hey, wait a second, you know. Uh, and they were being, uh, people were protesting them and things. They said, look, we, we don't necessarily want our product to be used to kill people mm -hmm. anymore. We don't want that. So they stopped and providing I'm sure there it. was some public pressure as well. It's like, okay, whatever the drug company that makes it, um, people who, who oppose the death penalty, right. were putting pressure right. on them you as know, well. You know, boycott so-and-so because their drug's being used to put people down. Right, and they're selling it to Department of Corrections right. around the country. So that stopped. Then they went to a single drug protocol. They went mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, that was also very effective. I think it was like a massive dose of barbiturates. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it was. It was a massive dose, and that worked well. But then the same thing happened. That company said, I no longer, it was, I think it was called thiopental. 
that that company said, I no longer want my drug to be used for this purpose. So right. now all of a sudden, the Department of Corrections is saying, and not just ours, but all over the country, what, okay, what do we use? And how do you experiment on drugs you know, that'll kill people? Who's yeah. gonna volunteer for that? Right, we wanna right? know that whatever we use is effective. Right. It's um, relatively quick, but more importantly, not painful, because right. that's kind of how it's a, uh, that's the, the law. law is written. The it, law is written. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you. I know Some I'm, people would like to see it painful. A, a lot of right. people would like to see, they're, they're saying, why should he have a, a, a non-painful death right. because he inflicted so much pain? Right. But the law is, that's can the law. be cruel. I mean, I, I, I totally understand. Like this family yesterday, I felt for them so much. I mean, they, they wanted this guy to suffer as much as he could. I'm not saying he suffered yesterday. Let me interrupt you for a second. We're showing, is this the room that you were looking yeah, into? Yeah, but they've, they've, uh, changed, they've it a changed it a little bit. They put like some, I thought it was really interesting. They put like blue swatches of fabric on the back. And I thought that was wow. odd. Was Let's like, keep this rolling if we can um, to our producers. So it looks, uh, one of the shots we showed, it looked very like kind of dark and ominous in there. Is this pretty much the lighting? Yeah, that looks right? about like the writing. So okay. the, the, the um, window we were looking through is the one on the left. Okay. And the window on the right is where I assume, I don't know 100%, but the doctors or the medical the personnel. The warden or something, yeah. No, the warden was actually standing in the room. So he'd be over here on the foot, okay. uh, on this side, on the foot of the... Uh, of the bed. Uh, yeah, the, the um, table there. And it's so tiny. It's such a small room. And yeah, and the room we're sitting in is not much larger. Right. So the right, right behind that window, but it's kind of tiered. It's, there's okay. a lower level, then a little bit higher, then a little bit higher. So people used to stand, and they just put the benches in as well. So well, Especially yesterday, lasting two hours, you were probably very happy there were some benches in there. Okay, so they, they've got the IV in um, Joseph Wood's arm. They, do you see them injecting no. drugs? No, that's never seen. No. When do you realize that, okay, the process is starting? He is starting he fell to asleep. Die. So he was looking around, and I've always said to people, um, they've all said, well, what, you know, is it awful watching these guys die? And I say, you know, I, I, it really doesn't bother me all that much. I hate to say that. It, it doesn't. It's, it's not a pleasant sight, but I'm not, like, having nightmares about it. Mm -hmm. But the one tough part that I've always found is when they look at you in your eyes. And, that, and it's like, you know, so here's this guy who's killed people, and now he's about ready to be killed, and he knows he's going to be dead in two minutes. He's looking right in your face and it's just a weird you know directly in your eyes oh yeah because it's and was he doing this looking around the room he can see all of you and he's yeah, looking he, it's just like he picked out four or five of us and he was really kind of you know i don't know, say giving an evil eye or whatever mm -hmm. but looking right at us and that was and i was one of them so it was weird he kept looking at me and i was and, almost and, wanted to and what, it, what would you kind of um assess his emotion was was he just looking at you like hey i think i know that guy or was it more of i don't know I can't believe this is my uh, my last no, moment. No, he didn't look scared at all. I mean, the, the last two guys, I have to admit, they looked terrified. This guy didn't. This guy was just kind of, he was almost, like I said, almost giving you an evil eye. It was, really? It was, yeah, that was creepy. That was the one, that was the, that was the weirdest part of the whole process for me. Interesting. Him. Uh, and the family, I think, said something about how he, he sneered mm -hmm. at them or smiled at them. Yeah, Did you he, notice he that? said he smiled and laughed at them. I never saw a laugh. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Um, and I know that family went through so much, and they were sitting right next to me. And what I will, I mean, I'll never forget the intensity of that family either. I mean, we were in there, not to skip forward, but we were in there for a long time. They never averted their eyes. They kept their eyes directly on him. Mm -hmm. The entire. I mean, every time I would look over, it wasn't like they were shuffling. I mean, they were just... That Staring. family's been through so much. Yeah, and and for them, this is at the end of a really awful cha a twenty-five year chapter for that family. Yeah. Having to see him in court, you know, over and over and right. over again, and probably and testifying over and over and over again, and looking right. at the pictures of their loved ones who aren't there anymore. I can't even imagine. So um, he he falls asleep basically, yeah. and um, when did you the, you thought 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe max, half an hour? No, I was thinking 10 minutes. I mean, the other two executions I saw were about 10 minutes. When did you start to kind of look around and go, this is, is this how it's supposed to go? I mean, nobody in there had seen a, a two-hour execution before. I'm not sure who's ever seen a two-hour lethal injection execution. I don't yeah. know if one's ever happened. But no, I mean, he, he laid there and he was asleep and I'm thinking, okay, well, this is just like the other ones I've seen and they're going to come in in 10 minutes and it's going to be over. That's not what happened. He started kind of gulping for air. His mouth started opening and closing. Mm -hmm. And that was going on. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, and we're looking at the, some yeah. of the crime scene here. There's a, it was an auto body shop. and This is the scene 25 years in ago down in Tucson, uh, when yeah. he gunned down his ex-girlfriend and her father. Right. And of course, we're back in the uh, executioner's room there. Right. And that's, that's yeah. The, the curtain now is on the inside. Uh, the, the curtain's not on the outside. It's on the inside of that room. Okay. 
Um, so, uh, I forgot where I was. We, we were talking about it, it going on so long and nobody had ever seen a oh, two-hour yeah. execution. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of gulping for air and, um, and I thought to my, after about 15 minutes, I thought to myself, well, this is, this is not, you know, this is ugly, but execution is not pretty and that's whatever, right. he's, he'll, he'll be done soon. And then it goes into half an hour and then it goes into 45 minutes, then it goes into an hour. So think about, you know, I, I said like watching like two full episodes of Seinfeld or watching the whole Fox 10 News at 9. And the whole thing, that whole hour, you're just staring at a guy doing that gulping that I was telling you about. Yeah, and it, and it wasn't happening. And at that point, everybody's kind of looking around saying, what, what happened? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. You know, has something gone wrong? Uh, his attorneys jumped up and ran out of the death house. And we found out later they went to federal court trying to get it stopped in the middle of the execution. Right. They to wanted it. him to be resuscitated and life-saving measures taken, yeah. which would have it. been the uh, never unheard of probably. I've never heard of anybody doing in that. Execution. In execution. Obviously that didn't work. No, it, well, it didn't ever happen. Mm -hmm. never, oh, you're talking about their court. Yeah, yeah, yeah they never got it. And, um, and then an hour and 15 minutes, it's still a thing, an hour and a half. And I remember at an hour and a half, I wrote a note down in my little notebook, but I remember thinking to myself, what happens if they can't kill this guy. I mean, are we at the point where they, they can't do it? I mean, I, I'm thinking after an hour yeah. and a half, whatever drugs they pumped into him, they've gotta be pumping more or whatever, and it's, nothing's going on. And it almost appeared at the very end, and uh, probably just my mind's eye tricking me, but it appeared like his chest was rising and falling, like he was getting more breath than he was mm -hmm. at the very beginning. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, what, what's happening? But about 10 minutes later, it was, he stopped doing it, and it was finally, it was over mm -hmm. at that point. And then uh, what, they, they close the curtains right away? Then the uh, Department of Corrections uh, head, um, Ryan, came in again and said, um, the inmate is deceased, time of death, whatever it was, I forget it was, 2.57 or uh, 3, uh, it was later. Any tears, any uh, cheers, any, any uh, outbursts no. from nobody? The, uh, the only time I saw the younger sister, the family member, um, tear up was when the death warrant was read. And when the death warrant was read by the warden, they mentioned the names of the victims. Oh. And at that point, she teared up a little bit. Right. But from then on, no, they were... And you heard from their comments yesterday. I mean, if anybody out there heard their comments, it was, you know... Emotional, they are still, raw. Oh, and they're, they're just, they're shattered. They're just what they've been through. And yeah. it's finally over. And, and they were frustrated that the attention of this execution was going on what happened to him yeah. and not going on, which is totally understandable. I get well, that. it's taken on a couple of stories. Uh, obviously, the first story is the terrible crime he committed, then that he's on death row. But the whole drug protocol is a separate story that is kind of being debated in this country. Um, and and it's a, there's a conundrum because states that execute prisoners don't know what to do and they're trying to figure it out right. so they're in this process of figuring it out and and it's really two separate stories but as a family member who's lost somebody I can see exactly where they were coming from oh, yeah. they're hearing this conversation about drug protocols and did it work did it work effectively is this how it was supposed to go and they're and they're thinking who cares he's dead that's right. all that matters in, in their opinion it took way too long and they probably would like to have had him suffer more. Of course, that's not the way we do things in this country with no, the death penalty. I mean, and that's... But you, know, you that's see where a, they're coming yeah, from. I, I'm sorry they got caught up in this particular execution. I mean, I feel terrible for them that they got caught up. If, if this execution had been no problems whatsoever, exactly as we thought, there would have been, I think, way more focus on the family and what they went through. Right. There would have been no focus on this protocol or no focus on this guy at all. But uh, like you said, there's two different stories. So mm -hmm. the fact that this didn't go well and the fact that it's coming off two other lethal injection executions that also didn't go as planned, it's part of this, this broadening debate. Right. And they got caught up in it. And, and it will probably be figured out. It might take some time. It might take some time. Uh, after the inmate is deceased, um, they lead you out and you go to, to speak to the cameras right away? Yeah. So... Um, when that's done, uh, the, the first group of people who leave are the family members. I didn't go through that, I probably should have. They bring us all in in different groups. That's why I never see the family before we get in the death house. Right. So the very first group that goes in is um, his, the Woods at, in this case, his attorneys and any family member that he has. He and no family, family member showed no. up? No, he just had uh, three attorneys and a deacon show okay. up for him. Then the media, then state officials, the Florence police chief was there and some other officials who I didn't, a couple mm -hmm. of them I recognized and a couple of them I didn't know who they were. And then finally the family 
came in after them. So you all leave in that reverse order. So the family left first, then we're all standing there, then the state officials left, and then we left. So when we walked out, we walked straight through the prison gates that we came in on. Um, he had very long last words. So we all got together with our notepads and figured out, got the last words down, because I guess that's important, and it, it came to the, the DOC spokesperson got exactly what his last words were. We decided, okay, that this is what it was. And then we walked out, and then and we walked into that very first classroom we were in, and the assorted media was already set mm -hmm. up and ready there. And that's where you make a statement, and, yes. and then... Did it ever cross... I mean, this is kind of how I was thinking as this was going on. I'm sitting at my desk in the newsroom. We know the execution's underway, and I'm thinking, did this guy, when he chose to take a couple of lives, ever think beyond that moment of the repercussions of that? Yeah. I, Probably you know, not. Right. If he, if he did, I, he wouldn't have pulled that trigger. And Yeah. You know, it was a stupid, it was a stupid, ugly, senseless crime. And, you know, we've been in this business long enough. I'd say 95% of the crimes we see are exactly that, just stupid senseless and then but they have huge impacts mm -hmm. and and this guy I don't know I, you know I don't know a lot about this guy but you know it was 25 years ago he's had all that time to think about it and then he gets killed yeah if, and I think if you would have asked him would you have done this over again of course he would have said yeah, yes no. but it, it didn't happen that way mm -hmm. he made that stupid decision to go over there and kill those people that evil decision he made mm -hmm. and that led to this well, Troy Hayden, uh, one of the few witnesses to the execution that, uh, that has made news really around the world for, for reasons other than just a, a prisoner was executed, right. but now it brings up in the debate of how do we go about doing this in the future, and was it really effective, and should we continue with this protocol? We appreciate your insight. I feel as if I were there. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Uh, I, I get the question a lot, why, why have you been to three of these things? Why, why do you do that? So I want to explain that because I think that's a valid question. The, the very first one I went to was when I was a young reporter back in 1995. I think I said that mm -hmm. earlier. And that was just straight luck of the draw. It just came up and somebody said, would you be willing to do this? I said, yes. I thought it would be good to do this. Uh, the second one uh, was um, a, the very first change in this drug protocol. And it became a big deal and part of this debate. It was in 2010, so it was 15 years after the first one. And uh, Jeffrey Landrigan was his name. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about these different drugs, and there was a question about whether or not the drugs came from overseas, and it was kind of a big right. deal. So I was asked if I wanted to do that one. I said yes, because, again, it was another kind of landmark case, and yeah. I could tell we were... And that took how long? Th th those drugs were the same drugs they were using before, but where they got the drugs. At that point, they were just running out, and it turns out... Uh, I believe it's been proven at this point, but it was alleged that uh, the Department of, Department of Corrections got them from overseas because uh -huh. we couldn't get them here anymore. Okay. And so that apparently was a big deal at that, at that time. And so, again, this drug protocol had changed. I knew heading into this that we were dealing with something else, and so I wanted to see this one again and be part of this. And as an anchor reporter, and if you watch any of the stuff I do, you know that I like to get out and experience things firsthand, mm -hmm. and I feel it's the best way for me to be able to communicate to viewers what happens inside of these things, whether mm -hmm. it's a breaking new situation. So any execution going forward, I can say to viewers, okay, here's what happens, let me right. take you through this. Because you've, you've been there, you've been there. I've been there, so. You think you'll do another one? No, I think I'm I, think I mean, I'm if they good. completely were to change the protocol, would you sign up to, yeah. maybe? Another lethal injection? I don't, I don't know. I mean, if they went back to, I mean, some federal judge says, go to firing squad, yeah. and I'm laughing about it, but you know, I mean, a lot of people are, I put it on my Facebook page, and people are going crazy. They're saying, yes, go, go do it. I mean, give yeah. Pete, I will maybe give, give the option because maybe somebody would prefer that as a, as a way to go. Uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I as I said, I feel like I was there after oh, listening to your description. And um, we appreciate all, all of your time. Awesome. I know it was a long day for you and a long day for everybody down there. Yeah. And thanks for joining us on the Fox 10 YouTube. All right, so that was the uh, full video segment. That was Troy chatting with Fox 10's Carrie Lake about his ex uh, experience witnessing executions again. I played that for you guys right now because you know what? If Jody Arias gets the death penalty, you guys have an inside insider's perspective on what exactly may go down. Now, it's the moment you guys have all been waiting for. I've been teasing it throughout the day. This old news footage from 2008. I have it for you guys now. I'm not gonna tease you guys any longer. So let me pull up this clip for you. And you guys can watch again. This is old footage, archive footage. Consider it my Throwback Thursday segment for you guys. And uh, let's see if I can find it now.
Let's see. Give me one second. All right, I got it. I got it for you guys. Audio is good on this video. Again, this is uh, a reporter actually who worked here back in 2008, I believe her name was Alexis Vance, did this story when Travis uh, was first murdered back in 2008. So I'm gonna play this for you guys now and give you guys a look at the news reports back then. 30-year-old Travis Alexander was a devout Mormon and a well-known motivational speaker. He never smoked, drank alcohol, or even caffeine. He did yoga on a daily basis and wore a calorie counter to make sure his diet was in check. So who would want this excelling young businessman dead? Well, up until now, family and friends had no idea. He's just a guy everyone liked. He was easy to get along with. Uh, if you talked with him for two minutes, you just liked him. After a big break in the case, detectives are now pointing the finger at this woman, 28-year-old Jody Arias, a former girlfriend. She was arrested in Northern California in the town of Wairika on suspicion of first-degree murder. These are pictures from her MySpace page. Why she allegedly did it is a question cops are trying to figure out. Peacefully living in your home. The death of Travis Alexander caused such an uproar in his Mesa community, police had to hold a meeting to address concerned friends, neighbors, and churchgoers. Now, more than a month after losing their friend, they have some closure. All right, guys, that was the new story. This is straight from... Uh, July 2008 this is back when Jody was arrested um, or when she was finally labeled a suspect in the death of Travis Alexander so it's kind of amazing to watch these pieces you know here we are now six and a half years later learning so much straight uh, so much information about this case now I mean at this time this was just like a big revelation well this is Travis's ex-girlfriend. She was just arrested in Northern California. So to watch that story from back in 2008 and kind of compare that now, uh, compare that with what we know now is, is for me just a really interesting thing to watch. We actually have this other story um, from uh, one from our archives as well about Jody Arias' artwork. So I'm going to play this story for you guys now, uh, taking a look back at some of the other Jody Arias coverage we've done in the past. Lay the world in sin and error pining. Back in 2010, Jody Arias' singing skills were highlighted after she won the Inmate Idol contest held at the jail. The prize in that competition was a holiday dinner. Her drawing skills are proving to be far more profitable, so far raking in more than a thousand bucks. Fox 10 has learned her brother is the one selling her artwork. His seller name, 0817 Soldier of Christ, and he's already sold eight pieces of his sister's artwork on eBay. Many sold for $100. A couple sold for about 200 bucks. The titles and subject matter vary. This one of a baby's hands and feet. Several others, sketches of women. Most sold after the trial started, but there are still a couple of drawings left for bidding, and they're pretty expensive. The title Grace Kelly at last check was listed at a thousand bucks. Pisces number two is almost twice that. Arius's brother describes her as a talented artist. One person posted asking whether there's a certificate of authenticity. Arius's brother writes no. He says all profits go toward covering the Arius's travel expenses to the trial, as well as money, so Jody can eat better food than what they serve in jail. I guess um, I can. Do you have it up? What's that? Yeah, we're on live right now. We just watched a segment about Jody Arias' artwork. This is what we were it was showing a couple of videos from our archives. Right before this, I showed a, a video from uh, reporter Alexis Vance from 2008. Oh, yeah. When uh, Jody was first labeled a suspect in the murder of Travis Alexander. Oh, yeah. And I was just telling our viewers how crazy it is to go back and watch a story like that and then fast forward to now and see how much we've learned since then. When everything was just speculation, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, and she was telling so many stories back then, and you just, you know you didn't know what to believe. This she's still talking about ninjas, I think, back then, and all kinds of crazy stuff. But I yeah, know. we've come a long way. Yeah, and I know we have a lot of people working to get even more of that archive footage from back in 2008, 2009, and get that uh, get that here online. So as soon as we get that in the system, I'll be playing it for you guys on News Now. But I did bring Troy up here for a reason. I saw a lot of chatter on our YouTube chat about um, Dodi Arias getting some clothes. 
Yeah, so what, this is what I heard from uh, Andrew Hasman, who is down there, and there's another woman uh, who's a blogger down there who I trust who's been at the trial every day. They both said that uh, Jennifer Wilmot, who is second chair in the defense team, uh, to Kirk Nurmi, and also Maria De La Rosa, who is the um, mitigation specialist, right. were bringing up clothes. They were showing up at the courtroom, which is fairly odd, and then they were bringing up clothes um, uh, that presumably are for Jody. I mean, why would they bring their own clothes up there? Right, right. And we had just talked about it when I had you on earlier. A lot of our viewers asking when the verdict was read, was she going to wear stripes? And then you reached out to your source and found out, no, she's going to wear civilian clothes. She's wearing civilian clothes. Right. For and this. so the civilian clothes that apparently were brought to court, probably Jody's. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Everybody's saying hi to me. Hello, everybody out there. Good to be back. You know, um, I just got back from a, uh, a long interview, and maybe we could even put that up, Rox. It's super interesting, and it's at some point once we get it in the system, uh, with the Department of Corrections Director, Charles Ryan, who answered a ton of questions for me about what's going to happen with Jody mm -hmm. after she is um, sentenced. Well, actually, I know I was going to have Mia Garcia up here in a second because she spoke with Charles Ryan earlier today, right? and we do have a couple of those sound bites. Oh, okay. So I know she was going to come up and uh, talk to me about some of the well, information. Well, am, am I then spilling all her thunder? I don't thunder, know. But, I mean, uh, we you talked know what? About Whoever minutes. does it, someone does it. Both of you guys <laughs> talked to the same guy. I'm sure he told you guys both very interesting information. Um, can you paraphrase some of this? Well, stuff I, I, I think or? the headline has to be that he told everybody working out there to keep their distance from Jody Arias. And I say, well, what do you mean by that? He said, we are aware that she's very manipulative. And we don't want anybody, uh, any of our corrections officers, getting close to her at all. Wow. They, they, they've been warned. And I said, wow, I mean, that's, I said, do you do that normally? He said, no, we don't. But we're well aware of what's going on, uh, and what, what has gone on with Jody. And uh, so we're, we're making sure that um, nobody gets in any sort of trouble with her. Um, if she goes, and we went through a whole bunch of different stuff, and I've got all the paperwork in front of me. Mm -hmm. If she goes to uh, death row, mm -hmm. She will never be in a position to have any sort of contact whatsoever, even like this, no, with another with, inmate. An an another. No. But uh, at a certain point, what, even if you're in max or if you're on death row, you get to work your way up to different levels. And I'm going to go through all this in a story that I'm going to put together. Hopefully we'll have it on later on tonight. Um, but uh, if she's in death row, she can be in a group setting with a number of different inmates, but they have a special chair that they put them in where they sit them in a chair and they put shackles on their legs down below where your legs go and shackle you in and the chairs are far enough apart that you can't reach over and touch anybody. So you'd be sitting in a room with 10 other people, but you're not physically able to even reach over and touch the person next to you. So while people are saying, is it gonna be solitary? Yes, she will always uh, be in her room at night or a cell at night sleeping if she's on death row by herself. And same thing if she's on Mac, she'll be by herself. I just uh, tweeted it, by the way, if you want to just retweet it oh, okay. to your followers. That way they'll know that you're on right now on News Now. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and check the uh, YouTube chat again. I know a lot of them had questions for you. We weren't able to get to all of the questions earlier. So if you have questions for Troy, put that in the chat window. Uh, a lot of you guys all talk at once, so I may pass over some of your questions. If you type in all caps, maybe I'll see it. <laughs> maybe it'll be more clear. Um, but for any questions for Troy, go ahead and put that in the chat right now. I know a lot of you guys saying hello to Troy. Um, they're saying hi back. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, yeah, I don't Noah see Noah Hill is asking, so what, all the money she got paid for interviews and stuff ran out already? <laughs> we didn't pay her any money. Um, I know that she was making some money uh, for a certain time selling her artwork, mm -hmm. which uh, she got around the so-called Son of Sam Law. Uh, basically, the Son of Sam Law was saying you cannot profit off your crime. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jody was not doing artwork. This is a decision by the MCSO, by the Sheriff's Office. She was not doing artwork depicting Travis or her crime or anything like that. So she was able to sell it. Um, are you writing something down for me? Oh, no, I'm reading. Oh, okay. I'm taking notes on what our uh, viewers are saying. So N3 Oteris is asking if we had footage of the community meeting in Mesa after the murder. Mm. So um, I'm sure we have footage. We have so much footage here. So I'm I just writing this stuff down. Um, you I, don't don't remember, know. I don't remember ever seeing that, but I mean, if, if it happened, those are the kinds of things we ask. cover. I'm going to go ask at least right. for you guys. So if we get it, I'll be able to play it here. Right. Uh, um, so anyway, I think that was part of the interesting thing. You know, if she ends up getting life, things are very different. Uh, after now, she's in basically the exact same condition she's in right now at the Australia jail for the first 30 days that she's in max security. But after 30 days, she gets a lot of different things. She gets... This is so interesting. Yeah, I know. So 
uh, step one, if she goes to max, step one is the highest level of security you can have in max. This is not death row, this is maximum security. There's only one unit at Lumley uh, that has max and death row. There are only two women on death row, so they're all in the same area. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Ryan says that they have a cell ready for Jody Arias, no matter what she gets, death or life, she'll be in the same cell. Okay, so okay. she's going to the same place. Yeah, same cell. Um, so after 30, uh, when she first gets there, she'll sleep in that cell by herself. And she'll be on max for at least two years. She has to earn her way off. But she gets one hour of recreation six times a week. She gets one non-contact two-hour block of visitors per week. Uh, she gets uh, the store. She can spend $60 a week at the store and $80 at Christmas. There's a prison store you can so order from. So she gets from. money. She gets a stipend while in jail. No, no. Well, or a, a stipend while in prison, excuse me. No, no. People have to put money okay, in there. Okay, okay. So she's only she's allowed to spend at max $60, and that's of money coming in from Outside. her parents or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something okay. like that. And But as we get later, she can get a job, and I'll, I'll okay. get to that in a second. Um, she gets library services, which means she'll get uh, books brought to her. Uh, TV and personal property she can have in her room. So that's actually different. That's actually better than Estrella. She gets no TV in her jail, or mm -hmm. a jail cell right now at Estrella. Um, she gets one 15-minute phone call per week. Okay, wow. so that's it for step one. Now, after 30 days, she's still staying in the same cell, but now she gets $80 a week at the store and $120 at Christmas. She can do, she gets hobby craft classes. She gets origami and pencil drawing. She has library services, uh, one 15-minute phone call per week, uh, 12 inmate groups, one hour, six days a week. So now, all of a sudden, after 30 days, she can be in a group of inmates, 12 inmates, all together. And there's origami and pencil yeah. drawing. It's almost like the things you do at summer camp. Summer, yeah, well, <laughs> summer camp in prison. And I think uh, what it comes down to is um, after dealing with inmates who are incarcerated for a very long period of time, I think right. they found that these things, well, some of us on the outside might say, why are they allowed to do that? that why are they allowed to have any sort of fun? Right. They're supposed to be being punished. I think that they think that this helps with their rehabilitation or whatever. <laughs> these, these are by state law. This is not something that they just come up with here. Right. These are things that are drawn up by the state. Um, she gets dining room access. So after 30 days, she'll have access to the dining room. So she can eat outside of that. Uh, she has unrestrained movement outside of her cell. Uh, and she can get a job after 30 days. Okay. And those jobs can be anything. I talked to Charles Ryan about it. Those jobs can be anything from raking, uh, out in the yard, picking up cigarette butts, doing things like that. And she'll make between 10 and 50 cents an hour. Wow. Doing those sorts of things. Yeah. 10 and 50 cents an hour? Between 10 cents and 50 cents an hour is what she'd make working at the prison. Oh, wow. Doing that. Uh, photos. She can get inmate-only photos on New Year's Day, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. So these it looks like she can take photos during that time. These are this is such interesting information that I think a lot of people don't realize. There's so many rules in place. Right. When you're in prison. Um, and then after 60 days, now she moved to step three. Uh, at six at 60 days, she can get a loaner appliance, a TV, a music player, a fan that she can use in her cell. That's if someone comes and brings it to her. I think they may have loaner That's appliances there at the prison. Uh, don't quote okay. me on that. I should have asked that. I didn't. Uh, 14 inmate groups, one hour, six days a week, library access, a job again, all meals in the dining room, fundraisers, uh, movement unrestrained out of cell, group activities, televised sports and entertainment programs, 180 days of visits in step three, uh, shall be granted contact visits, four hour blocks, hobby craft, origami again, and um, one 50 minute cell uh, phone call per week. So there you go. That, that's wow. what she's going to get if she goes there for life. Lots of people commenting. I'm going to go ahead and read this feed in a, uh, for a sec, so just give me a minute. Kenny Gray is asking, how many women has Juan put on death row? I only know of one. Um, and that's Wendy Andriano, who I've discussed here a few times. Um, didn't have any of the normal things we normally see for death row either, which is killing multiple people, killing a child, killing a police officer, or a terrible background. She killed her husband. He was sick with cancer, and uh, he wasn't dying fast enough for her, is basically what Juan said. And so she beat him with a bar stool and stabbed him. She called, it's really, it's a weird story. It was in an apartment complex, not very far away from where I lived, down in Ahwatukee, and she called paramedics and said he was dead, because she poisoned him. I'm sorry, I left out the poisoning. She poisoned him. 
Um, she thought he was dead, called paramedics. Paramedics were on their way, and all of a sudden the guy's alive. And she kind of freaked out. So she called the paramedics back and go, no, we don't need you, we don't need you. He's got do not resuscitate, everything's fine, everything's fine. And he still wasn't dying, so she beat him with the bar stool and stabbed wow. him. So she's one of only two women on death row, and Juan put her there. I still don't understand the mentality that these people have when they commit these murders, as if they're not going to get caught, especially when you're doing something that involves like an assault, something that it's so obvious to link the DNA back to you, you know? Or it's so obvious that this wasn't just natural causes. Like, what logic? Uh, do well, criminals have? don't. Yeah. I guess it's just, how do you? I mean, you could see with Jody's crime, a lot of it was very well thought out, minus the leaving the camera in the washing machine. Yeah, uh, you know, and when she tried to do so many other things to cover her tracks. Yes, and uh, you know, like I said, from renting the white car instead of the red car, from taking the license plate off, from borrowing gas cans in the back and putting them in the back of their trunk mm -hmm. so she wouldn't have to stop. Uh, Nicole's asking if the Alexanders were at the courthouse. I, I was just, I read that myself and I was looking. Uh, we've got Andrew Hasman down there Should and he hasn't said anything about Andrew it. Andrew a text or maybe? I, I'm, I'm sure that, let me put it this way, if the Alexanders show up at the courthouse, we're going to know like that. Right. Because it'll be All wildfire. Over. Yeah. That's when I'll be running down to the courthouse and leaving you, Sami, unfortunately. <laughs> Aw, well, we'll be watching you live and we'll probably get a live interview with you or a live, live shot with you at the courthouse. Yeah. We'll be streaming live, actually. We'll be streaming the whole verdict live here on News Now. Kathy M. is asking you, Troy, has she tried to manip manipulate um, with any success any of the staff at the prison? At the present jail? Yeah, I know they've had problems in the past. <coughs> I don't have specific examples. I know she's tried to manipulate me in the past, things that I'm not going to talk about right now, but I can later. Whoa. She's, Jody is always trying to work it. That's going to be a News Now exclusive. It, yes. That one I think a lot of people will be tuning in asking questions for. Yeah, and maybe we can talk about it uh, after this whole thing is done. Right. Keep, make a note on that, and I'll tell everybody. I will. Jody manipulates. Tried to. I'll add the word try. Okay. Jody tries to to manipulate Troy. That's going to be a special like hour-long Q&A <laughs> here on News Now, guys. So you better subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash fox phoenix. That way you'll know when Troy gives his uh, tell-all exclusive. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, let's get back to these questions. People ask this question a lot. They must have missed it, uh, you know, the first time you answered this. But Troy, how did it feel during the interview with Jody Arias? Did you see how she was trying to get you on her side? Sure. But, that I mean, that's a human thing. And I'm not saying that as an excuse to Jody. I think everybody... You know, what are you going to do? Hey, uh, good to meet you. I'm, I'm a scumbag killer or whatever. I guess you could have done that. J Jody's not right in the head. I, I've told everybody that. She's not right mentally. And, um, yeah, of course she's trying to spin things her way. That's what she does. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got borderline personality disorder. And I'm not, I don't buy into all these, uh, if you believe the, the experts. I don't buy, in, buy into a lot of psychology. But um, Jody definitely tries to manipulate, spin things her way, get things done, trying to use her charm. Uh, trying to do things to, to make people bend to her will. Sure. And she's done that forever. And uh, you know, maybe that was one of the reasons that... Uh, that frustrated her with Travis, that he wasn't giving in. Right, after he's finally saying enough. Yeah. Enough. Uh, Deanna Elliott is saying, Troy, I have a friend who was in jail, and she uh, said that Jody is very popular amongst the other girls in the jail. Do you know anything about this? I find it offensive. Yeah, I've told this story a couple times, too, that, I mean, she was... Uh, I can't even say popular. I mean, they loved her in that pod that she was in. Now that mm -hmm. was back when she's still in the same actual, let me describe the pod for you if mm -hmm. I can. Sure. Imagine a little mini jail. There are probably 12, maybe 14 cells along a back wall, okay? In front of that back wall are a series of like four or five stainless steel picnic tables. Mm -hmm. On the side of the wall is a phone, like two phones I think, and then a glass partition. So, and it's its own little mini jail. It's, so it's like it's a it's a circle uh, kind of you know and on the back of the wall it's straight and there's two levels of cells in the middle is a little courtyard on this side is glass so a a corrections officer a detention officer is on the other side of the glass right. in a circular uh like a office and so at any time that that detention officer can look around and see the entire pod oh, all the different pods interesting. pod here pod here pod Got here it. pod here pod here pod here you know so they can just right. sit there and see everything Right. what's going on but the inmates are shut in their own little pod they can't get out they can't right. go so there's like maybe 14 or 12 women in there right 
And uh, so inside that little pot at the time, they could be out all day hanging out and drawing and singing like we saw and all those different things. And then at night, they all had to go back into their cells and the doors were shut at like 10 o'clock. Right. The women in that pod loved Jody. Uh, t I told you, she sang a few songs for me when I was in there the very first time I met her, which was a super bizarre experience. And at the end of her singing, she sang the national anthem all by herself. Right. At the end of that, uh, they were weeping. Like half of these hardened women, three of them were murderers, and they were weeping over Jody because they loved her so much. You know, when I first got in there with my camera, she, Jody freaked out and had to be taken out of the room. I thought they were going to kill me. Or not kill me, but at least beat me up. Right, everyone that's that was on BS. Jody's side. Absolutely. They were right. looking at me with like Who malice in their eyes. Yeah. Who do you think you are? Uh, they were big women. Erica has an a good question. Um, what is available at the store in prison? What can you buy with that money? It's mostly foodstuffs and um, uh, like deodorants and soap. What and are they shampoo. given? Are they not given any soap, shampoo? Anything yeah, like they that? are, but it's kind of like, you know, really pretty, basic. It's bad jail shampoo, I'm sure. sure. Like as basic as you can get. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, and the food. Uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio is uh, a guy I've known for a long time, a uh, good guy interpersonally, but man, he feeds those prisoners just awful Like what kind food. of food? It's slop. It's just slop. It's like a, you should pull up that story. You want to see some great stories. Boy, we got all kinds of I stories I can food. show you. The thing is, I love food. I'd be like, no. without, if there's anything to deter you from a crime, it's giving up the oh, yeah. luxury of eating things so, that are delicious. Imagine like other a, a split pea soup that is like light brown. Uh -huh. with little tiny bits of maybe carrot, maybe something else dark, and you're not really sure what it is. It's just a slop of stuff with like an old kind of not great piece of fruit because you don't get top of the line fruit. You get like leftover fruit mm -hmm. and like a little cookie or whatever. But the I, I brought the slop back one time on the set and had John and Carrie. John actually took a bite of it. I oh took a bite God. of it. Oh, my God. John Hook It was awful. It. Yeah, John Hook ate John, the slop. John, what did you think about the soup from the jail or the it's not, slop? It's not soup. It's slop, man. <laughs> slop from the, the jail Joe Arpaio jo jail slop. It was terrible, and it needed salt in the worst way. <laughs> he doesn't put salt in there, He doesn't does he? put salt in his food because of low-sodium diet, so it's terrible. That's really the reason it's so bad. It wouldn't be so bad if you could put some salt in it. It's oh, John, terrible. You give it's it a bad. lot of credit. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. I mean, you took one for the team for trying Did you try it? Yes. Oh, yeah, he tried it. Yeah, but it, it's gross. Trust me, it's but terrible. But he eats sawdust. He'll eat anything. <laughs> sure. If I'm hungry enough. Thanks, John. Well, on that to note, to lighten things up, one non-Arius question. I don't want to neglect you. R-Y-M-N-D. Troy, do you prefer the Arizona Cardinals or the Phoenix Suns? Completely different sports, but are you fans of uh, either team? I'm a season ticket holder for the Arizona Cardinals. Not so even there's close. your answer. Yeah, I'm an NFL fan. So thank you. Boy, that's that's out of the blue. I like that. <laughs> uh, talk about something different. But, you know, hey, hey, let's for everybody who's just tuning in here, um, a big question, are we close to a verdict in Jody area? So here's what happened. We've got people down at the courthouse, people that I've known and worked with down there for a long time, including our own Andrew Hasbin, who's watching all of this stuff go on. Uh, about, I don't know, maybe five minutes ago, will you show me something? Oh, is she sure about that? I don't know. A lot of people are saying Tanisha is at the courthouse, according yeah, to the Tanisha's at the courthouse. Tanisha's i got to split. Tanisha's there. Tanisha's there. Tanisha's there. Sister's there. I got to go. All right. Everyone All right. is saying if that. If Tanisha's showing up, I'm going to split down there. Everyone's See you guys. saying that. All right. You leave. I'm going to keep our viewers entertained with some other stuff. I'm going to actually answer your questions. If you see Mia Garcia, can you send her my way, guys? Well, we're going to get Mia Garcia up here to continue our Arius conversation. We could have the verdict soon. If this Again, if Jody has clothes and Travis's sister has arrived, it looks like it, today could be the day. Stay tuned. Mia Garcia joining us for more Jody Arias talk. Lots of Jody watch. So, uh, Mia, you were covering a story on something to do with Diane Douglas and the state of education, but you did manage to sneak in some Arias coverage. Yes. Well, so we were what at happened? the state capitol covering the story, and on our way out, we ran into Charles Ryan, who is the head of the Department of Corrections for the state. So we just very briefly grabbed him and, and said we wanted to ask him a few questions about Jody Arias because mm -hmm. obviously they are waiting for the verdict too. They want to know, you know, is it is it going to be a death or just right. life in prison? So we caught up with him and just asked him you know, what they're doing, what that process is, how they're planning for her. All right, let's hear straight from him. 
no matter what the verdict is, uh, inmate areas will be a maximum security inmate assigned to the maximum security unit at the Perryville Prison, and it's known as the Lumley Unit. And what exactly, describe the Lumley Unit for our viewers? The Lumley Unit is a housing unit that is comprised of single cells in a two-story configuration. The cell doors open to the outside. Is she alone? Or does she have any interaction with inmates? As a maximum security inmate, she would be able to have interaction with other inmates. The majority of the day, the inmate would be allowed outside for exercise periods. Certainly, if they have approved visitors, they would be allowed to do that. Uh, if they had to uh, have medical appointments, they'd be escorted to the health unit, things of this nature. A cell block uh, has been designated where the inmate would be assigned and uh, staff are prepared to receive her. There's been some coordination between the department and uh, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office relative to her delivery. So when the verdict comes down, will you get a phone call or how does that work? I suspect uh, when a verdict comes down, the department's going to receive a notice that uh, the inmate was sentenced one way or the other, and then we will go ahead and adjust and prepare for her. No matter what the verdict is, uh, inmate areas will be a maximum security inmate assigned to the maximum. It started uh, replaying again. Oops. A little bit of a repeat. Yep. But um, so you got an inside perspective on what Jody's going to have to go through. A little, or he talked about her housing situation doesn't change. Right. Whether she's on death row or he said she's still going to be in maximum security. One person in her cell. Sure. By the way, I, I don't want to neglect what our YouTube commenters are saying. Kathy Cross is saying, Mia, thank you for your coverage of Savannah Cross and thank you for being so kind to us. Ah. It's kind of cool when they're just like tuning in and interacting with us directly, so... I remember Kathy, um, uh, her granddaughter, and it, it's a sad story, very sad story mm -hmm. about her granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, well, wait and see if hopefully she's she's waiting for justice for Savannah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and everyone in this chat, uh, or not everyone, a lot of people waiting justice for Travis. It's the hashtag they're using. It's the thing they keep typing in the chat. Mm -hmm. By the way, a lot of people like what you're wearing as well. <laughs> It's kind of interesting to watch what they're saying as they're watching us, you know. So is it is it right? Okay. You can right actually here. we can watch them come in like we're just I see. You know, it's uh But yeah, Troy has just gone over to the courtroom. We have not heard anything about a verdict coming in again. For those of you who are asking, we are given an hour notice before the verdict is actually read, right? That's what we've been hearing in the newsroom is that we'll know 1 hour before. And the it's getting drops. close cuz I just my theory is uh -huh. either they're going to come back at around 3.30 or they're not coming back. Right, because they're supposed to be wrapped at 4 any, or 4.30 anyways. And now that Jody has clothes and now that Travis's family members are arriving, we're sending Troy out there. I mean, it'd be nice if it was just done today. Right? <gasps> is anyone? No? No, I, I, I completely agree. Were you? I, I, I agree with you. But you've been here uh, working in the Phoenix market. Did you ever have to cover a lot of Jody Arias stuff early on or recently? I did about a year ago when um, Steve Kraft would go on vacation. Because Steve Kraft is obviously, he's covered Jody Arias from the beginning. So I just would sit in a few times to watch. But I've, you know, just as a, as a normal viewer, I've, um, I've watched Right, and you've been in court, you've covered the news, and looking at how this case has played out, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, everyone has an opinion here. This is just, you, you take off news reporter mask and you put on a expert mask, court expert mask. Okay, so, so, so I'll say this. I think that if Jody was a man, she probably would have been put to death already. But because Jody is a woman, this is just my belief. Right. It's suddenly, hey, oh, oh I, I, I don't know. Right. And that's a lot of people are saying that here on a, a lot of people are saying that here on the chat window. That's one of the common thoughts on the internet that she would be put to death if it was any other sort of, if if it, the roles were reversed and Jody was a man. I think that people want to believe maybe that women aren't as evil 
or couldn't do something so horrible or have a great reason for doing something like right. that. Right, and some people find Jody attractive too. And so there's that weird like <laughs> me is true if it was an attractive man probably the same situation would happen. Right, it would become yeah. more much more sensational. We'd still be paying attention to it. I know one of the arguments, I don't know if it was Troy who made this or Ron who made this, but if it were a man in the situation, would we be giving it as much attention as we're giving it now? Probably not. But like you said, if it was an attractive man that suddenly sort of was romanticized or glamorized, you know what I mean, in this mm -hmm. sort of uh, reality TV show, lifetime movie way, you know, yes. you get sucked in. And I think that Jody's has done, has she's kind of played it up she likes the attention my mm -hmm. belief she loves the attention and she knows exactly what to do to get some attention and she's she's done she's doing really it crazy yeah things. well i think if, if cameras were in there it would be a lot worse on her part in terms oh, yes. of in terms of what she would just um she does things i think that kind of she plays she plays it up plays games what I or think plays and just be, becomes extra emotional or react certain ways maybe I think she likes the camera just my thought but again I don't I'm not Steve Kraft who's sitting in there every day watching her watching her every move I mean what do you think I think girls can be evil <laughs> I think that um she sat in with Troy right I watched the whole thing we aired the whole 44 minute raw interview uh, earlier today on news now I listened in on it and yeah, when she cuts away the tears, are they real? Are they fake? I'm not her. I can't judge. But one thing I noticed is how easy it was for her to answer every question very straight-faced. You know, she was looking Troy right in the eye, didn't flinch. You know when you observe someone who's lying? Mm -hmm. Usually body language gives you the sense that they're lying. But when you're a really good liar and a really good manipulator, mm -hmm. you don't show that part of you. Because she, you can I, do it in such a straight way that it's so believable. And I think that's, I think that's what make is making everyone angry right now. Well, have you heard her interrogation, her police interrogation, where she's kind of, oh, she's laughing. I haven't heard but, that. I think you, you, it, you're pretty clear that she has no problem, not telling the truth, and she's, she's kind of, she, I mean, right. She doesn't seem very remorseful. Well, like, if we look at this trial and kind of look at the steps by... So, I mean, we know that in the beginning, she called Travis's phone after she already killed him mm -hmm. to sort of cover her tracks. And then she made up all of these excuses and, you know, all of these things before admitting to it. It's a circus? I don't know. It's crazy. It's chaos. And in a way, it's a relief that it's all sort of ending. But on the flip side... She gets death penalty, then there's going to be a lot of appeals, and we're probably going to be watching all of those appeals. I think she will. My personal opinion is she'll find a way to to create more attention for herself. What's this? Uh, I think it would have been given the attention just because of the drama associated with the crime, but because it's a woman, that made it even more drama worthy, and everyone has watched this in a spice girl. Well, I think women also. Um, pay attention to this case because again I think women believe that other women have a potential to be incredibly evil or, or manipulative can someone manipulative and, but I think have you talked to Steve Kraft about this he he believes that maybe she really I mean he thinks well I'm not he, he's not sure and there are other men who want to see a good side give her the benefit of the doubt and that's always been the debate I mean having more women on the jury versus men on the jury will, will that help but in this scenario it's not a majority vote situation this is one person says no i don't want her to get the death penalty and that's it yes one person it just takes one it has to be unanimous and that's where there's just so much pressure on them mm -hmm. and it's just i've sat in a few a few uh, jury deliberations and it wasn't arius jonathan duty was one of them where there was just one juror and, and the jury was hung. And she and what, just, what was the story? Um, it was he, he killed some monks okay. inside it, many, many years ago. And he was, he I think, went to trial three times for it because he was, he was retried and there was new evidence. So, right. But um, just a couple years ago, they couldn't agree. They couldn't, there was just one It's juror. hard to get 12 people to agree, though, on anything. You just need one who says, hey, I, I, I don't think she should be put to death. 
Just one. Right. And you could tell with the defense and the closing arguments yesterday, that's really the strategy they were trying to do, that emotional appeal. Really, what, let's, let me remind you, if you put this girl to death, that's going to weigh on your heart. Let's just let that weigh on you. Your heart, your mind, it'll haunt you. I mean, that's the gist of what he was trying to do to the jurors is my take, it's my guess. It's difficult. I've never been, a, have you ever been a juror? No, no. I've had to appear for jury duty, but I feel like I'm always not picked. They don't want the reporter to They don't want, I mean, <laughs> and there's always the element of bias and it just, I need to go to work. <laughs> but they don't, I mean, if you're called to jury duty and you say, oh, I'm a, I'm a reporter, local news reporter, they're like, okay, dismissed. Right. <laughs> We're usually out right away. Sure. So, um... And now there's a man man versus woman debate here. Loretta saying men do a lot of stalking too. Cheryl saying women are possessive and want what they can't have. Uh, I, so I don't think it matters if you're a man or a woman. You can do something horrible. Right. And it, that, that's all I'm saying. But sometimes I believe that, that maybe sometimes people believe that while it's a woman, she couldn't possibly have been so evil but but same for men and women that's my take right and i think and i've said this before here on news now and i believe it i think strategy the best strategy for the defense is really doing that whole emotional appeal making travis out to be the bad guy making travis be the player guy that emotionally hurt jody and while you could never justify her actions you can never justify the murder you can get into the heads of one juror who may yes. have been played. If one juror was played by an ex, you're good. I mean, that's what you have to win over. You have to make them almost relate to the pain that Jody allegedly felt. However, you could Travis. have a juror say, I've been hurt before, but I didn't stab the person who hurt me more than 20 times. Oh, absolutely. You're right, but there could also be that juror that You're feels that pain so much that it's like, okay, I don't justify the killing, I don't justify the stabbing, but in this extreme situation, I do remember how much it sucks to be hurt, so maybe she should live for the rest of her life in jail and maybe not kill her. I'm just saying, from a juror's perspective, yes, I'm not a juror, or, and I'm not saying that at all, but there could be one person that somehow identifies with Jody. I think that's the whole thing they're trying to do. Yeah, Will it be successful? We'll see. Sometimes you just have... I think the question was interesting because I think they're close, the lunch question. Right, right. So they had asked uh, if it was okay if they skip their lunch break or if they deliberate through lunch, if they take their notes. That Because, again, for those of you watching, they don't typically... They're typically not in session on Friday. They can choose to deliberate tomorrow if they want to, but uh, in early reports, we heard that the jury had planned to not deliberate tomorrow. So if they didn't want to deliberate tomorrow, and we're hearing that they want to work through lunch, there's a mm -hmm. high likelihood they want this done this afternoon. Well, exactly. I don't think that you want to hear it if you are Jody Arias's attorney. I mean, there's one of two things. Either they're very close, or they just don't want to spend the time. Can we work through lunch? Let's get this over with quickly. Mm -hmm. Not, hey, let's take our time and come up with a decision in weeks if that's what we need. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, let's try and get through this. We're tired of being here. Whatever the decision is. Or they're very close, and they're saying, okay, let's, let's, since we're so close, let's try to work through lunch so we can wrap this up. Well, we are going to be talking about it more here on News Now. We'll be continuing to do uh, Jody Watch and Jody coverage. In the meantime, I'm sure you caught it earlier, uh, Llamas on the Loose. I did. It was the craziest thing. We were live here for like 30, 40 minutes with llama coverage. For those of you who missed it, uh, llamas were trending nationwide on Twitter, and we have some great video of the llama chase. So while we continue to be on Jody Watch, as we continue to look out for a possible verdict, I'm going to play this video for you guys now so to Jody. keep you guys entertained. And <laughs> Jody and llamas. Well, oh. I'm telling you, we were all previously on Jody Watch. Mm -hmm. We doubled our viewership once we put on llamas. I don't know what that means. I'm not saying anything. I think it's fascinating. Fascinating. Llama watch. I mean, you don't. it's not every day you go driving in no. Metro Phoenix and see a llama on the road or in any part, in any regular city, right? Mm -hmm. I retweeted this tweet from Elle magazine and it said, it had a video of the llama chase and it said something like, this is why productivity was lost in the United States today, <laughs> something like that. It's so true. Everyone was on llama watch. So in case you missed it for whatever reason, you got to see it. These llamas out on the loose. A lot of you guys joking that the llamas were looking for the courthouse. They want to <laughs> see justice for Travis. I love how you um, merged our two big stories together. But yeah, 
Here's the video now.
All right, that was sort of the conclusion of Llama Watch. We actually have a special, specially edited uh, llama video that I'm going to share with you right now. Uh, it's a three minute llama video. This is Jeff Moriarty. He had a hand in this special llama video we're gonna share with you. It's three minutes, not like the 20 minutes that you just watched right now. Jeff, why don't you tell them a little bit about what they're about to watch? <laughs> okay. So oh, let's turn my mic on. Okay, so um, we were all just riveted watching, of course, the llama drama or llamas on the loose. I like llama unfold. drama. Llama watch, llamas on the loose. Llama drama sounds great. Oh, I That's love the good. alliteration, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the llama drama as well. Well, but llama, these... llamas on the loose would be alliteration because of the L's. Llama drama, I don't know if that's alliteration or like just rhyming, rapping. You know what, you, you might be right. I have not had enough coffee. I've had too much llama, not enough coffee here. But what we got is something I think you're going to really like. It so is really cool. These two fuzzy uh, critters. Uh, nope, go back up. So I'm helping uh, Sammy navig uh, navigate. Uh, go Facebook. There we go. Okay. So uh, we took the entire video of these llamas. Uh, you're going to yeah, shrink that down. Yeah, I got it. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I am wired in spite of having no coffee. And we uh, set it to music. Um, Alfredo, I think you were saying that this would be great Love. set to the William Tell Overture. Yeah, I guess great minds think alike, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we made a musical video. This is uh, uh, already uploaded uh, to our YouTube channel if you want to watch this again or share it. Uh, so yeah, this is Llamas, the musical. <laughs> and by the way, I'll have Troy up here again to talk more areas right after the Llamas, so don't go anywhere because Llamas are on the loose and Troy Hayden's on the loose somewhere in the newsroom too. Yes. Favorite part at the end, they come in, they get out of the truck, and they high five. Oh, yeah. The 
world is safe again. Is that it? That is it. Oh, wow. That was amazing. That was like the coolest thing ever. By the way, whoever said a Barack Obama, I'm tweeting about you right now because I think that's so funny yes. and clever. Among all the other crazy names. Uh, what were your thoughts on Llama Watch? I mean, you were sitting at your desk watching the llamas run loose. Well, I mean, I'm glad they weren't injured. This would be a very different story if they were hurt. But, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun to watch. It was a great chase. They, uh, I, I liked how they stuck together. They got, they got separated. And, uh, you know, the little, the little black one there would, would find his friend. And they would go off running again. And everybody who jumped out of their car is like, you're just driving along. You're going somewhere to get coffee. And all of a sudden, you're going to stop and run down a llama. Those are big, strong animals. They're mean. They'll spit like crazy. And you're just not going to hop out of your uh, Prius and stop a llama on the roadway. Not going to happen. So, yeah. Sorry, well, I'm sending a tweet, guys. <laughs> I had to. So, yeah, I thought it was fantastic to watch. I thought it was a nice break from Arius. You know, we are... Uh, you're welcome, Kelly, uh, Sunshine Lady, uh, everyone who, who liked it. If you didn't, I apologize. Not everything for everyone. We thought it was a nice break from Arius. We are keeping an eye on Arius. Uh, Troy's got like two phones up to his ears all day long checking I know. on things. As soon as he's off the phone, we're going to have him come sit in the ear seat right there. Yeah, you can relax comfortably and enjoy Silly Llama videos because if something happens with Arius, you are going to hear about it in immediately don't, don't worry, worry. Yeah. we will interrupt llama coverage for Arius as soon as we find out information yes. again we're on Arius watch basically just waiting it out uh, the jurors are scheduled to deliberate until 4 30 today if they do not reach a verdict today currently they are not scheduled to deliberate tomorrow we'll have to wait until Monday uh, or maybe even later than Monday before we get an answer so for all of us, fingers crossed that we get something today, <laughs> but yes. uh, it's not up to us. It's up to the jury, and so we are just watching and waiting and watching llamas in the meantime. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I'm not related to Aaron Moriarty. I'm sorry I missed who asked that. It just scrolled off our screen there. You're right, Sammy is not listening to me. She's tweeting, but I understand sorry, I that. I get it. No, 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 I have no, to send this Barack totally Llama fine. tweet out before llamas aren't uh, trending Jennifer, anymore. Yes. You can't send this out once llamas aren't trending. I understand, Sammy. One I of understand. my viewers named one of the llamas Although, Barack Olama. Uh, so uh, we might see that on uh, the newscast later on. I'm rather... I don't know if proud is the right word, but that did seem like a little bit of fun. And, hey, you got to have fun with serious news uh, once in a while. Um, I was going to say something else, too, and I can't remember what it was. Hmm. There we go. I completely forgot. So, uh, but again, you can find that on our YouTube channel if you want to go and check it out. Oh, I know what I was going to say about the uh, Jody Arias I was hearing because it's going so long. Well, I mean, relatively speaking, a lot of people thought this would be very quick. Uh, return. We're wondering if uh, perhaps this means a uh, hung jury. So I really hope not. I really hope that whatever the decision, the jury can put it to rest one way or another. But. My little brother is so funny. So I guess he talked to my mom about the llamas on the run out and from Fresno. And he's like, it was one white one and one black one. There was no discrimination yes, <laughs> right yes. from the cops. Silly. All right. So, really? yes, they do still have an hour and seven minutes, Jessica Gray, before they go home for the day. You're absolutely correct. Uh, and we're keeping an eye on them. Uh, just if they've got, you know, they've asked for, uh, I think, some more information. And uh, is that an iPhone 4S? Is that what you have? No, no, no. It's a 5S, Chris. 4S is so many generations ago. Yes. I'm not cool enough to have the 6 Plus like Jeff Moriarty here. But it's because I'm not eligible for an upgrade yet. Giant hands. I'm getting there. I just can't spe justify a $700, $800 purchase. Yes. So I can check in. I've got to hop back to um, uh, Law Dog says it's not a hung jury. Uh, I'll never believe that. Or she'll never believe that. Sorry, hard to tell from your icon there. Uh, but uh, I hope you are correct that it's not a hung jury. We shall see. Anyway, I need to run. So, Sami, I'm going to turn the console back over to you. All right. Actually, um, I wonder if Troy has a free minute. I know he wanted to update us on uh, some Jody yeah. stuff. Do you have some time? Uh, very quick. Like three minutes. Okay. I'm going to have Troy for three minutes. So, we'll All have right. you guys swap seats. And... Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Shannon. Glad you enjoyed it. And uh, I'm going to turn the seat over to uh, the wonderful Troy Hayden. He'll mm -hmm. be up here in just a moment. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks for making thank that video or getting uh, it done. Okay, we got a crew. We need to.
Hi, All Stomia. Right. We're going to be very good friends. We're spending a lot of time together. This is nice. Some Jody bonding. Jody Arias Watch. Thanks, Jody, for bringing us together. <sighs> uh, did you see this video, by the way? The no, it's great. Video? It's so great. It's so great with the William Tell Overture. But I know. Awesome. Enough love. Jeff is a genius. Genius Jeff. That, good it's, job, Jeff. That's alliteration right there. Uh, it is great video, so if you guys love the video, make sure to find the link itself on our YouTube page. You can share it with all your friends, post it on Facebook, all that good stuff. Love it. Um, so I will do all So there's been a lot things. of chatter while we were playing Llama video. There was speculation that a verdict may have been reached. Jody had gotten clothes. Travis's sisters had showed up to court, but all not true. I mean, that stuff is true. But. Yes. Uh, all of those, all those things did happen. But. Uh, that they, um, Jennifer Wilmot, who was the number two chair uh, to, uh, to Kirk Nurmi, and uh, Maria De La Rosa, the mitigation specialist, did bring some sort of clothing uh, to the courtroom. And uh, Tanisha, who is Travis's sister, the more angular one we see with um, you know, thinner face, uh, was down there. So everybody was speculation. That, hey, we have a verdict. Uh, but I have sources well-placed. Um, all over the place in this case, and one source in particular um, uh, who has knowledge of things going on, no verdict. No verdict. No. So it's 325 right now. The jury is supposed to be deliberating till 430. Are scheduled to deliberate till 4:30. Yeah, but they can go as late as they want. The one sure. thing I'll say about this courthouse, though, uh, they generally don't go very late here because the courthouse closes down at a certain time, and they have to get everybody out of their security. And mm -hmm. it's a very large building, and they want to have it secured. So uh, generally, we don't see them going very late, but they they can. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I see it happening today. When I first heard of them asking for numbers of exhibits and things, that's what told me right away they're probably not close. They're probably trying to convince two or three jurors one way or the other, or the two or three jurors have questions, say, let's listen to this again. Mm -hmm. One juror brought a crock pot. <laughs> you know, we keep laughing about that. But when, but you, when you bring a crock pot in, um, you know, you're going to be there for a while. Because that's a slow cooker. Yeah. You know? It's a slow deliberation. I wonder if they brought in the crock pot with the raw food to cook throughout the day <laughs> or if they brought the food in it just if to it was it already up. well when meat was already cooked right yeah. and they kept it warm so they'd have like you know swedish meatballs or something now for we're just speculating what the jury eats we just uh, <laughs> there's so much to talk about with the jody arias trial uh what is the typical would so arias be getting the street clothes even with no verdict no jody arias does not get into street clothes unless she's in front of that jury in that okay. courtroom so she's got stripes and that's just the way it is right yeah. right um in a juror's typical day so they're in court then they're deliberating. Then they take a lunch break. Do they leave the courtroom or do they bring in their own lunch? Or are they typically like off eating out, dining out somewhere? The last jury used to leave quite a bit. So, I mean, it, uh, the fact that the jury wanted to stay in and work through lunch gave a lot of people hope that, okay, maybe they're going to make something happen. Sure. You can take it one or two ways. Oh, they're getting ready to make something happen. Or you could take it as they're so far apart that, you know, that it could be a while and they want to work as they hard as they can. Right. Right. And right now... Uh, they still haven't changed their minds on deliberating tomorrow. They're still going to deliberate. Uh, they're not going to deliberate tomorrow. They're not that we've heard. And okay. we probably won't know that. And, and, and I have to keep uh, checking my Twitter feed because we've got some great people down at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And I can reach out to people from time to time. I don't want to bug them all the time. Uh, but I've been here preparing some other stories. And so um, we'll probably know uh, at the end of, the, of court today. Sure. And I know you were working on that special exclusive for the web, uh, some old footage. Have we gotten that yet? Or the, is it, we're are work they still working I've, on it? I've got, it's got to be cut right now. I've got it in my hands oh. and uh, the, I was gonna make it like really big and I'm thinking now it's like 30 40 seconds it's a little taste and uh, it has something to do with I, I can't even tell you to be okay. honest with you. let's make okay. it a big exclusive. But when do we get to when do we get to play it for everyone? Well, let me leave and get okay, this thing leave, leave so you can up. get that all and right. I'll play some other stories for that. <laughs> okay thanks Troy all right me, that means we're gonna hear from Troy again today he'll come back with that exclusive behind the scenes video footage from back in the day a special throwback Thursday for you guys it is Jody Arias related that's all I'm allowed to say um, I'll let him tease it again when he comes back but in the meantime, I want to keep you guys entertained with some different uh, news stories. Um, I'm going to step away from llamas. I'm going to step away from Jody Arias for a second. I have a number of different stories uh, that I clipped for you guys today. Uh, I guess maybe since we're on the whole llama kick and the llama story, here's the story about a house or a home that uh, houses animals that are celebrities. You know, you could consider them uh, celebrity animals, the animals that make their appearances on TV and in commercials and all of that. Well, this is a special story that uh, we did, I believe it aired yesterday, and I want to share that with you guys in case for some of you guys, you aren't local, so you may not have caught our local newscast. And for others of you who are local but maybe sleep early and didn't catch it, I want to play this for you now, and uh, I'll be back in just a moment.
Banjo, Boomer, and Rusty. Just some of the gang here at a place that can only be described as a real-life animal house. Just kind of my life. Since 18-year-old Cody can remember, his mother, Chris Rankin, has been rescuing animals. Came from a fur farm. Yeah. Yeah. So if he, if he wasn't here with us, he would have ended up as a coat. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Rankin has a license and permits to live with the nearly 20 animals in her Phoenix home. She trains them for animal stardom. Banjo appeared in a Skittles Super Bowl commercial. And here he's hanging out with Will Ferrell for an upcoming movie. Rankin's two newest additions, orphan baby Bobcat siblings, and they're already ahead of the pack. Just a few months old and already featured in an Urban Outfitters ad. And here they're on the set of Teen Wolf. Here, they're hanging out with Betty White. This is where it all starts in the backyard. This is the training ground for future animal stars. For example, to train them how to bark, speak, <laughs> took the trainer one week. And when the animals aren't training, they're making themselves right at home and sometimes getting into some friendly roommate squabbles. It's a problem in the mornings. Like, I'll be trying to brush my teeth and the bobcat will be in the sink. Like, I need to get to the water. Still, for all the chaos, Chris and Cody Rankin see these animals as their family. So when the animals are ready to quit the dog-eat-dog -dog world of the entertainment industry, they'll have a forever home. So if they get to the point where they just say, I'm not going to do that today, then they'll have a permanent home and they'll be cared for and they'll have a nice big habitat and they'll just stay with me. That was a really fun, lighthearted, interesting story about uh, animals. I enjoy all of our animal stories today. That story about the celebrity animals and the llamas on the loose kept me entertained. Hopefully it kept you guys entertained too. I was getting, going back and reading some of the comments that you guys were leaving here on uh, News Now. Uh, Melissa Ward is asking, Sami, are you going to play the Travis family clip? Melissa, I have let my bosses know to get that footage from the archives. Um, because uh, a lot of this stuff cap came from years and years ago when we switched digital systems, we actually have to go back and find the physical tapes and then get it back into the system. So I have put in the request. I promise you, as soon as I get that video here, I'm gonna be on air and I'll play it for you guys. Um, I do have people working in the back, so uh, we're working on it. That's the best I can give you, Melissa. And uh, as long as you keep watching News Now, we'll have that for you as soon as I get it in. Let's see what else you guys are saying on the internet. So this Spice Girl saying, who doesn't want to hang with Betty White? I know for any of you who may have watched a special 40th anniversary of a certain show on a rival network, I especially loved her appearance in the sketch, The Californians. Uh, it was really funny to see her appear there. So uh, yeah, you're right. Who doesn't want to hang out with uh, Betty White? She's 93, I think. I mean, she's doing really well for 93. It's very impressive. She looks good. She's keeping her career alive. Um, really cool. RYMND uh, is asking, is this stream 24-7? Uh, the answer is no, it's not 24-7. Eventually, we will be 24-7. Right now, we do streams at 10 a.m. Arizona time and 3 p.m. Arizona time. Usually, our stream from 10 goes to about 1. It's about a three-hour stream, and then we stream again at 3 p.m. for a couple hours. But also, we stream whenever there's breaking news, so it's we're not tied to that 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. time slot. Sometimes, I'll break in at as early as 8.30 or 9 in the morning. Sometimes I'll break in at 1 or 2. Whenever there's breaking news, I bring it to you live. But we do have regularly scheduled streams at both 10 and 3. Because this is a special stream where we're on uh, Arius Verdict Watch, we are nearly 24-7. We're going to be continuously bringing you the stream during business hours. So uh, anytime that the jurors are deliberating, which they start at 9.30 and at 4.30, we'll be continuously having a News Now stream live here on our YouTube channel. So we will be continuously streaming for as long as the jury is deliberating. That way, you guys won't miss it. We'll have the information as soon as it comes in that the jury has a verdict and we'll set up that stream for you guys and stream live from the courtroom. The courtroom just a few hundred feet away from this newsroom. So uh, like I said, we're the closest station to the courthouse and uh, we'll be bringing you guys that verdict live as soon as it's reached. Uh, okay, let's see what you guys are saying. Jurors took nearly 15 hours to find Jody Arias guilty of first degree murder and the death of her ex-boyfriend child, Travis, says Holly Preston. Everyone thinking these animals that I played were so cute. Um, 
Soam Broski saying they have no llamas WTF I think he's talking about I guess there's no celebrity llamas out there well there weren't now obviously with llama watch those two llamas that made national news are basically the uh, celebrities in the llama world you could say um, Steven Martinez turn around Sami llamas are behind you what really I feel like you're tricking me or you're talking about that Fox News um, window right there or TMZ there's TMZ up there and Fox News Channel, maybe they were replaying llamas and that's what you were talking about. Um, <laughs> but if so, or you're just playing a huge uh, joke on me, Stephen, because the lighting behind me is my jacket. <sighs> okay, let's see. Penny G, thanks, Ami, for all the work you do. Absolutely. It's great fun hanging out with you guys. And thank you guys so much for watching continuously and keeping the chat busy and keeping the chatter up. It's so great to have you guys chiming in. And, I mean, the days where it seems stressful, where it seems difficult to keep up with the chat because there's so much chat going on, even though it's stressful, it's amazing to have so many of you guys chiming in with your uh, perspective. I really like having this interactive format. News Now, that's the great thing about it. You guys can watch the headlines and watch the video, but also interact with us and let us know your opinions on the stories and we can read your comments on air. And I mean, this thing that we're doing here um, at Fox 10 is really one of, a, one of a kind, sort of innovative in terms of a uh, local news market. So I hope that you guys that have been with us for a while continue to be with us and tune in every day. And for those of you who are new to News Now, if you haven't done so already, please go to youtube.com slash Fox 10 Phoenix. And there is a small button there called uh, where you hit subscribe and that way you will stay subscribed to our channel and that way you will never miss out on a live stream opportunity um let's see kelly davenport is really upset knowing the fact that i got everyone all hyped up thinking we had a verdict and found out it was all lies it's okay kelly is apologizing to those of you who may have believed the hype patrick is saying kelly don't worry about it um let's see Holly Preston is saying, Sami, would you like to make a guess on how long this jury will deliberate? I don't want to make a guess. Um, I honestly, I, I'll tell you what I hope for. I hope that it would be done this afternoon because taking it into next week, it just leaves all of us waiting and watching in just further anticipation. I think if it doesn't get decided today, I would like to believe that it would be decided Monday. But uh, I don't think I could make a fair prediction, Holly, to answer your question. Um, and everyone else, I comment, everyone was telling me there was footage of the, la uh, the llama behind me. That's what I'm telling you. The llama's everywhere, I guess. Uh, right now behind me is a picture of Bobby Christina, Whitney Houston's daughter. That is TMZ playing in the background. Kayla, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> who was it? Someone just said I should interview the llamas. That's a great idea. There's a lot of you guys out here. Uh, Jay Deering, ever eat at sushi on Shea? I used to live in Phoenix, love that place. Jay Deering, my question for you is, is it the sushi place on Tatum and Shea? Because if it is, I have eaten there. Um, let's see, what else are you guys asking? Don't worry, I'm gonna have some more video for you guys. Oh, Kelly, thank you. That's really sweet of you. Uh, Elizabeth Gyllenhaal saying, I hope the jury does not hang. Uh, I think a lot of people here feel that way. I think everyone who is tuning in just to want an answer. A lot of you are here because of you want justice for uh, Travis. And um, we will see what happens, what the jury decides. Nurse Mom 1951, new to this but loving it. I'm disabled and it sure makes the day go by faster. Thanks. Well, you're welcome, Nurse Mom 1951. And again, if you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. That way you can hang out with us every day. We are streaming news continuously here on News Now. Uh, sometimes we have breaking news situations, whether it's a really serious accident, like what happened with the train crash in California yesterday, or it could be something fun like llamas on the loose. Um, we're bringing you live images from everywhere, from Washington, D.C., when uh, someone is speaking uh, at the state capitol, for example. We cover President Obama. We cover lighthearted things like the celebrity animals you just saw. So we're continuing bringing you news and um, for those of you who have been here since this morning Ron Hoon who is an anchor here at Fox 10 joins me usually every morning at 10 a.m. to talk about all the top headlines we kind of have a good conversation discuss things with you guys and we also talk about the trending topics on Twitter we all want to know uh, what things uh, th the internet is talking about because you guys that's where we all are right the internet <laughs> so give me one more second I'm gonna continue to read your um, 
your tweets. Lindsay Bell is asking, do you guys do verdict watches for a lot of big trials? Well, we just started news now uh, at the end of November, so it's only been a few months. And so our verdict watch has been primarily just for this case because this has been the big case in Phoenix. But of course, anything that is happening uh, that's major here locally or even nationally, uh, depending on the situation, we will have verdict watches. We have just a number of different kinds of watches. We carry live car chases from LA sometimes because sometimes just watching anything, you just want to watch as it's happening live. And even though we're not streaming from the courtroom right now, or we're not streaming the jury deliberations, it has that similar feel to watching a uh, like a car chase, for example, where you're just heavily anticipating what's going to happen next. So I guess if that's what you mean, we, we're watching constantly <laughs> to answer you. Uh, Lindsay Bell, watching from Denver. Hi, Jenny from Denver. Um, some um, Absolute Blue saying, don't use the mic when you interview the llamas they spin. <laughs> okay. Linda R. saying, I love this channel. Just found it. Well, thank you, Linda. We're glad you found us. And uh, Michelle Whitcomb adding, I hate the thought of the Alexanders not knowing for even one more day that the Travis will get justice finally. And that's a good point, Michelle. I know so many of you want justice for Travis. And if they don't reach a verdict tonight, or this afternoon rather, 4.30, I mean, they could deliberate later today. But if they don't reach it today and they choose not to deliberate tomorrow, well, that's a three-day weekend. And so the Alexander family has to wait another four days. And a lot of you Travis supporters have to wait another four days before we may even get a verdict if... They don't read a verdict today, Thursday, and they don't deliberate tomorrow, Friday. You may expect them to have a verdict reached by Monday, but that's not always the case. They have unlimited time to deliberate. And as we talked about earlier, uh, the longest deliberation period ever in, in history uh, was four and a half months in a court case. So we're not saying it's going to take that long, but just know that a jury has as much time as they want to make this big decision. Kayla Stein is saying, greetings from Illinois. Thanks for keeping us updated all the way in the Midwest. Well, you're welcome, Kayla. I hope you're keeping warm. I know it's a little cold out there. If you ever want to uh, take a vacation, uh, maybe I'll give you a look at our 10-day forecast in the meantime. This is our 10-day forecast here in Arizona. Not to get you guys jealous out in the Midwest. Well, okay, maybe that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you guys jealous out in the Midwest. So here's a look at our 10-day forecast. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, Aside from a little bit of rain this weekend, uh, we usually have fairly sunny and partly cloudy skies, uh, nice mild temperatures, 68, 70 degrees. So if you want to escape that snow, I suggest making your way down to Arizona. All right, let's see. What else are you guys saying? Uh, a lot of you guys are saying that nine jurors just walked back in. One looked a little stressed. A, f a few others kept their heads down. Um, let's see. So much chatter here. Let's see. Cold and rainy here on the Central Oregon co Coast, says Kelly. Sunshine Lady saying, hey, beach lover, I'm in Central Florida. Annabella saying it's 30 degrees here in Baltimore. See what I'm saying? If those of you who have a, a vacation coming up or can take off like two days and make a weekend trip out to Arizona, I suggest you do because I showed you the forecast. It's looking good out here in Phoenix. <sighs> While we continue to be on area swatch, what else can I show you guys? Okay, I've showed you guys the celebrity animals. I've showed you guys the interview with Charles Ryan when Mia was up here. I've showed you guys the Arius artwork, and I've showed you that original story from 2008, although I feel like there were a couple other people asking if I'd already played it. They may have missed it. So you know what? It's a minute and a half story. I'm going to go ahead and play this story again. It's a story that was done in 2008, a month after Travis was killed, when um, we in the media were just learning that a suspect had been arrested. So let me replay that for you guys now. Thirty-year-old Travis Alexander was a devout Mormon and a well-known motivational speaker. He never smoked, drank alcohol, or even caffeine. He did yoga on a daily basis and wore a calorie counter to make sure his diet was in check. So who would want this excelling young businessman dead? 
Well, up until now, family and friends had no idea. He's just a guy everyone liked. He was easy to get along with. Uh, if you talked with him for two minutes, you just liked him. After a big break in the case, detectives are now pointing the finger at this woman, 28-year-old Jody Arias, a former girlfriend. She was arrested in Northern California in the town of Wairika on suspicion of first-degree murder. These are pictures from her MySpace page. Why she allegedly did it is a question cops are trying to figure out. Peacefully living in your home. The death of Travis Alexander caused such an uproar in his Mesa community, police had to hold a meeting to address concerned friends, neighbors, and churchgoers. Now, more than a month after losing their friend, they have some closure. I still find it so crazy to go back and watch that clip from 2008, especially knowing everything we know now. For everyone who's been watching this trial, you watch it and you're like, you hear the speculation by the reporter. Well, why would she do this? Why would someone want to kill Travis? We hear about Travis. We hear all the way, uh, you know, all the ways people described him at the time. And it's just fascinating to go back and watch that and see how much we've learned and how much the story in this case has evolved and in the last, uh, what, six and a half years. So I just wanted to replay that for you guys. Um, again, we have a lot of people here working behind the scenes to get more and more footage from back in 2008, 2009, and throughout this uh, whole story, you know, this whole case. So we'll be playing a lot of that for you here on News Now. Stay tuned. I'll have that for you as soon as I get it in. I'm not sure if I'll get it in today, but hopefully by tomorrow I'll have some more um, exclusive behind the scenes. Um, archive video for you guys so we can watch some of that again. Um, back to your questions and comments in YouTube. Holly Preston is asking me, would you recommend actually living in Arizona? I want to live close to Phoenix so bad. Ha ha. Well, Holly, let me know where exactly you're writing from and I can answer that um, specifically. But I like it here. I would work. I would live here. I mean, I do live here, but you have to factor in. I mean, a low cost of living. Gas prices are below average here in Arizona. You have a decent cost of living. You can get a very nice uh, apartment for a fraction of what you would pay in California. Um, and it feels like for me, for example, I moved from California and it felt a lot like California in the sense that I had everything I need. I had my Costco, my Target, and my grocery stores, and it felt very familiar. It's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of strip malls. There's a lot of different things that felt so familiar that it was comfortable. And I don't know if you're on the East Coast. I've lived on the East Coast briefly. I lived in Massachusetts while reporting out there, and I'm per someone who... I don't like shoveling snow. I don't like scraping ice off my car. And even though we do get really hot temperatures here in the summer, you don't have to scrape heat off your window. You know what I mean? It's a little less work. Yes, it'll get hot, but thank God for air conditioning, right? I get it. 1980s, not every car had air conditioning or some overheated, but you know what? It's 2015 and you have air conditioning at your home, air conditioning in your car, air conditioning at work, air conditioning in the store, at the mall, wherever you're going. And for the most part, you're really just tolerating that walk in between car, home, store, work, school, whatever it is. So yes, to answer your question, yes, Holly, I do recommend living in Arizona. Uh, Kelly says, Sami, I would love for you to come to the Oregon coast and I'll show you how to Hunt, uh, how agate hunting is done or agate uh, who there's no end so I don't know Kelly I would love to come to the central Oregon coast regardless I've been to Oregon once it was in high school and I had gone to Ashland and I checked out the Shakespeare festival and it was really cool so and I was obsessed with the fact that there was no sales tax I thought it was the coolest thing ever at the age of 16 <laughs> uh, let's see what else you guys are saying Um, give me one second. I'm going to read uh, read some of these tweets. In the meantime, actually, there is a conservative political action committee meeting going on today where a number of different Republican leaders are speaking. I'm looking at my screen right now, and Sarah Palin is speaking. I don't know. I haven't heard from her in quite a while. So in the mean, uh, while I wait on uh, Jody Arias' watch, I want to check in and see what Sarah Palin has to say. Oh, friends, worse, the suicide rate, the suicide rate among our best and our brightest is 23 a day. As we gather here, we're safe, we're secure, we're having fun. Four days together at a conference. In these four days, 92 of our veterans will have taken their lives. So have we lived up to Washington's wish for our vets? I don't ask this as a politician. As Dakota was suggesting there, no, I, I asked
Vasquez, one of so many mothers of a combat vet, when my son went off to war the first time as a teenager, I was confronted with the same reality that all the other moms have to face, and that's realizing that, man, I wasn't going to be there to help, to protect. Moms can't be there when they hurt. I could pray, and I did, and I do, but oh, few things are more difficult than to kiss a child goodbye, often to harm's way, knowing that you're not going to be able there to protect those first deployments. Um, that is when a parent goes from calling him son to calling him sir. America hands over her sons and her daughters in service with the promise that they're going to be taken care of. Our troops are promised that no one will be left behind on the battlefield. They're promised that a grateful nation will spare no expense to patch them up and bring them back to health when wounded. And now they come home wounded, too many broken in body and spirit. Well, we, their mothers and their fathers and their husbands and their wives, we're here to collect on the promises made. We can't wait for D.C. to fix their bureaucratic blunders. This bureaucracy is killing our vets. They wait for months, they wait for years to get treatment at the VA, and they're losing hope. The VA's mistakes and those cover-ups, they have cost the lives of 500 vets in just the last four years, and that doesn't account for those who took their own lives in despair. We witness the way a corrupt government treats our vets, the VA, putting them on those secret waiting lists and deceiving Congress and spying on investigators who are just trying to get to the bottom of it. And don't be fooled into thinking that the problem's resolved simply because the media doesn't cover lame duck scandals anymore. Just because one guy at the top resigned, well, the problems didn't resign. The reason that you don't hear about them is because our vets don't whine. They're, they're not wired to complain. That's why this ran under the radar for so long. Well, our debt of gratitude, it starts payment with three simple solutions that government can and should do right now, because it is time to demand solutions. First, with healthcare, give vouchers for treatment outside the VA. Give our vets the same freedom that they gave us. And instead of illegal aliens cutting in line, being rewarded with a handout of U.S. benefits, no, we demand that the vets are first in line. Allow vets who are re-entering the civilian workforce, let them use the skills that they learned in the military. Today, say a vet with superb computer or um, uh, mechanical skills, often they have to go backward. They have to go back and take classes to get a paper degree or paper certificate to slap on the wall that says, okay, now I'm certified in a field that they already knew. Let them test out and their military certification can transfer over common sense. Yeah. Common sense, which I know is an endangered species in these parts. Yeah. Third, secure their benefits. Congress, secure their benefits. Did you know that last year, Congress actually voted to cut vets' retirement benefits by 20%? Did they vote to cut their own? No, and they only reversed course when enough of us, we rose up in protest. So take the issue away from the politicians after legislation to secure benefits permanently. Now, health care and benefits, you know, this is just part of the equation. General Washington wished for our veterans that their deeds in war would be recognized as glorious and honorable. And the deeds have been, certainly, there's no question. But see, the thing 
that those vets from the Revolutionary War, what they had that today's troops don't is victory. And that is the thing that they cherish most. They deserve to know that their sacrifices are not in vain, to know that what they fought for and what their friends died for was worth it. It is said, it's said that old men declare wars and then they send the young ones to fight them. So it's the duty of he who sends them to actually make sure that we can win those wars. And it's our duty to elect an honorable commander-in-chief who is willing to make the same sacrifices he sends others away to make. We must provide our troops the political will to win and the rules of engagement to win. How many Americans are harmed today because politically correct rules of engagement are imposed by those who are just too uncomfortable to give troops the trust and the tools that they need to win. That leads to a very unpleasant question. And it's one that, well, every gold star mom and every veteran will live with forever. Did we actually win in Iraq and Afghanistan before we wave that white flag? The jury is still out, but when Evil Islamic terrorists are on the march, screaming Allah Akbar from Syria to Iraq to Libya and Yemen. All right, I've been catching up on all your uh, chat in the window, and it seems like you guys are pretty much demanding that I bring llamas back because you don't want to listen to Sarah Palin. Is that what I'm getting? You guys want to see more llamas? Okay, I'm going to replay that uh, William Tell Overture llama video again. That is a three-minute video, and then... I will bring you guys some other news stories because apparently you guys weren't you guys weren't into the Palin uh, you guys weren't that into the Palin uh, speech that I was sharing with you guys from the conservative political action conference. So give me one second while I pull this up yet again. I have been playing a lot of llama videos here, but it seems like this is what you guys want, so I'll give you what you guys want. Without further ado, more llamas. Thank <laughs> you. 
drama video once again per for uh, because of popular d uh, demand and uh, you guys just really wanted to see the llama video again. I know uh, Jeff had mentioned it when he was up here earlier. There's a separate YouTube link specifically for uh, this llama clip. If you guys just want to share the llama clip exclusively, go to our YouTube page and you can get the link for that. Share it on your Facebook, on your Twitter. Uh, you can't really share links on Instagram unless you put it in your bio, which you can do if you want, if you're that passionate about the llama story. We encourage you to share this link everywhere, send it to your friends, uh, because it sums up the whole llama, llamas on the loose. You can watch for the whole 30 minutes, or uh, or you can just uh, go and watch this one. This one's super fun. So, um, Oh, I actually got a lot of tweets. So many tweets are happening. Some of you guys are mentioning me and following and all that good stuff. We're going to have a weather update in just a minute um, to discuss the possible rain this weekend and maybe even get uh, weatherman Dave Muncy's thoughts on all the area's craziness. In the meantime, um, I've showed you guys the llamas multiple times. Here's a story. It's actually a good story to share with you right before I go into weather because it's a story, an amazing story about a man who was buried in snow but survived was rescued and uh it's something i want to share with you guys now because i really love watching these stories of survival i was really angry um because i and i just told myself you know what no you're not going to go out this way that anger may have helped keep Drew Andrews alive. This Peterborough, New Hampshire man lay buried under three feet of snow for three and a half hours. I was in and around this area raking the roof. Drew shows Fox 25 where he was clearing his roof Sunday when he suddenly heard a strange noise. Noticed the snow rushing off the, the metal roof and just ended up kind of an avalanche effect. Drew was buried. No one was home. At first, the complete silence struck him. Drew couldn't move. Then he got mad. I was thinking about my wife and my daughter and thinking that um, I'm not going out this way. Just before 5.30, Deanna and his daughters pulled up. Deanna heard a muffled sound. And then I heard it again and I just knew and I yelled out his name. Frantically, she ran to help and call 911. I tried to dig him out as best I could, you know, with my bare hands. Minutes later, fire crews did the rest. The couple thankful tonight. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I'm here. <laughs> glad that I'm here. I was... Obviously a very uh, heartwarming story. I think those ending words, I'm glad that I'm here. It's it's crazy being in his position where he just, you know, being buried under snow for those hours, not knowing what's going to happen next. But fortunately, that had a very pleasant ending. Uh, in just a couple minutes, Dave Muncy, actually probably in just a couple of seconds, Dave is going to uh, join me to talk about weather. I see him walking over right now, so I'm going to make some way for... Mr. Muncy so he can sit with me and talk about weather. Dave, I have been on all day. We're oh just on goodness. Arius Watch. What are your thoughts on Jody Arius before we even talk weather? Um, I haven't heard anything. You don't even know that that name. Who, who is, who is who's, Jody? Who's Jody? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'll tell you, though, it's interesting because I think a lot of people um, are waiting to hear this. They I, are. I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think... Uh, it's it's more than curiosity though i think it's they want to uh, uh see it end they want to say okay okay let's well, wrap it up of, let's get it done they want it to end but then there's a lot of people out there that want justice for travis a lot of people that have been watching us yeah. all day they're here because they're hoping for a death penalty verdict that's what they're here waiting for i think that uh um i've always had a problem with uh, defenses that attack the victim uh, especially if, if, it, if, if it can't be proven, I think it's a responsibility of the judge to say, stop that. And um, in this situation, Travis's character was attacked a lot, and yes, he is not yes. allowed to defend himself. Yes, he had, he had very little defense, and, and I just don't like that. I do not, I don't find that uh, to be, uh, I suppose that a defense attorney would say, oh, that's sound practice. Uh, I find it to be creepy. <laughs> uh, and uh, right. and and I think that uh, there should be a way for a, uh, a relatives of a victim 
who has been unfairly trashed. And I'm not saying necessarily that that happened in this case. That, that is, I think, a great possibility in this case. But uh, I think there should be a means for them to recover on that. I think that if, if you can go after the people that uh, portrayed him in that fashion, there should be a means to do that. And that would stop people from doing those sorts of things. I know Dave likes chocolate. I have a, a Nutri-Grain bar. I don't know if you want. Well, you see, I, I, I don't like healthy chocolate. Oh, I yeah. was like, oh. Yeah, no, I, I don't want anything. Straight. I want, okay, you, know I, you got some, you got a some... marshmallow milk chocolate bar? Uh, By golly, I'm, gonna have to, I'm, I'm in. going to have to prepare better tomorrow. I'll get some straight chocolate in here tomorrow. Do you like Girl Scout cookies, Thin Mints? Uh, I like the Thin Mints. That's the only thing I eat is the Thin Mints. Well, let's I will have those, yeah. And she's she obviously has some. Did you have every brand? Do you have every brand here if I had said... No, I only have Thin Mints. Oh, okay. So I'm glad that you like Thin Mints. That's the hot one. That's the one that well, everybody's running out of. I feel like sometimes you bring out of. me treats, and so I feel like it's only there right. There you go. Have okay. I get to have a Thin Mint. You can have more than one. We'll just leave it, it here. Is. And then you can have it. as many as you want while we discuss weather and other fun things. Mm. I feel like I'm bribing you, basically, mm. to stay up and hang out with me. I have Chex Mix, too. Mm. So much. No, I like that. Do you like the sweet and salty mm-hmm. mix? Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Not with this, though. Oh, chef. look at you. You're all set. You got a little dwarf food Well, in my here. whole, this is my whole world. So, anyways, guys. When uh, I get hungry, it's like coming to a little, it looks like a Circle K over Well, here. when I get thirsty, you offer me water. It's a fair trade, Dave. It's mm-hmm. a fair trade. Mm. Uh, and you know what happens when you're really, uh, when it's really hot outside, that's when you get thirsty. Mm-hmm. But thankfully, we've avoided heat. Recently. I drink a lot of water. I have a lot of water. You need to, regardless, mm-hmm. even if it's not hot, right? The wa- air right. is still dry. But you come by my desk. I have a refrigerator there. There's nothing in it but water. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. You are my source for water. Uh, so I'm the water source, folks. Let's look at a. We can take a live look outside right now for our. We're, we have viewers all over the country, all over the world, uh, tuning in, waiting for uh, a potential verdict. Uh, for those of you who have never been to Phoenix, this is a live look outside from our South Mountain County. You can see downtown right there. What you're looking at, where you see the buildings, the courthouse. Is in that in mix that mix of buildings. Jody in Arias is somewhere in that little group of buildings over there. I think there's a. You can see one of the one of the buildings downtown with the, there's a reflection, a white line reflection on it. Yeah, that's pretty close to to that's the area that that she's in right there. So. Yeah, I'd give you an idea. And if you're, you know, flying in from Germany for the verdict or something, or from France or whatever, <laughs> uh, bring your rain jacket because it's going to rain this weekend. I know. Let's look at yeah. the forecast that you have made for us. Well, we have uh, uh, just the national map up right now. Do you know some areas of Alabama got up to 12 inches? In fact, some just a little bit more than that. 12 inches uh, of, of snow. That's a lot of snow for those areas. And uh, there's some ice uh, in the area as well. I haven't looked at all of the information, but I know that uh, Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia and uh, places like that were all, yeah, Georgia picking up as much as 12 inches in some areas as well. And I think Chicago just uh, uh, through the day today uh, picked up almost nine inches of snow. Any of the viewers that are maybe watching from Chicago or Georgia, Alabama, chime in. Let us know how it is out there. We have people literally watching nationwide and around the world. Well, they're all they they are uh, probably tuned in a lot for the uh, for the Jody Arias uh, verdict, and uh, then as a bonus, they get me. So. <laughs> You're a special bonus. <laughs> Didn't know that was coming, folks. Mm-mm. But there you go. Uh, and some of them are going. Uh, actually, we're stuck with you. So. <laughs> but they're waiting for that verdict, and I'm waiting for it too. It's a, it, it is a uh, it is a, a big piece of curiosity. Uh, not only here, but as you said, across the world. Mm-hmm. It's amazing when you look at this trial and the time that it's taken to get through this trial. And then you look at the, the American Sniper trial, start to finish, somewhere in the neighborhood of three weeks. Uh, it just uh, It's just really, uh, it's really strange how they can have two different uh, situations like that. Mm-hmm. But that's the way our justice system is. And it is. Uh, it, I guess whoever creates the most hoopla... 
By the way, this Kayla the way Kayla Stein is saying, I'm in Chicago. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Come see us. And it's Dork Rainwater here. is saying it's melting in Alabama. Yeah, it, that stuff is melting very rapidly. But the thing you have to remember uh, about that, uh, if you're living there, is the fact that stuff will freeze up tonight. And that will be a problem on your roadways. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm from North Dakota, and I remember the time of year. I hated it. And that was where the, it was kind of nice during the day, and it would melt the snow, and there would be this slushy, wet snow stuff in the streets and then at night it would be hard and crunchy and it would be solid ice and you couldn't walk on it you couldn't drive on it uh, and and I was a teenager so the last thing I was going to do was stay home so you were out you were about you were doing things uh, and uh, uh, that was the stuff but I hated that stuff worst of all your your gloves got wet your coat got wet your pants got wet and uh, if you were you <laughs> stepped into too big of a puddle then it got down into your shoes or your boots whatever oh, man. it was just a mess I didn't like it and that's kind of what they're dealing with that slushy messy stuff uh, and, and if it's not that way now it will be in a day or so all right. Well, uh, whenever I have you up here, I try to share with you some crazy and okay. story. But I've already played this story so many times that I don't even think I'm going to replay it. But I'm assuming you saw the video of the llamas on the loose. I have not. I oh, knew they haven't? were on the loose. I knew they were on oh the loose. Oh, my God. You haven't seen it? Play it again. I feel like I have to play it again. Play it so there's again. the 20-minute version, but These... then there's the special three-minute version that Jeff had made. Well, our friend we in Georgia, in maybe background. our friend watching from Georgia hadn't seen that I yet. just played it for them, oh, but you okay. know what? The fact that you haven't seen it okay. makes me want to play it one more time because I want your reaction to okay, it. Okay, I want to see it. And I think that's it. only fair. So I'm going to show you the sped mm-hmm. up version to music. Okay. A special uh, llama remix. Okay, because <laughs> we have llamas in my neighborhood. Oh, people. you do? Well, there is horse property there and people what keep llamas are you on in? it. Well, I'm out in Tempe. Okay, so this was in Sun City. Mm-hmm. And it was just so fun to watch. Here we go. Oops. Dave's reaction to this because it's so fun and it's so honest and so live. Oh, and those cop cars are trying to stop the traffic. (laughs) Boy, that's great. Oh, he's got, it looks like he's got a little leash on there. (laughs) You know, what's funny is when somebody gets close to him, they take off faster. It's like, "Uh uh-uh, not us. But look at, he's got a little leash hanging on. Oh, the one in white. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh, they're not going to catch them. <laughs> well, just keep watching, Dave. You'll see what happens soon. Oh, that's funny. And you're watching the like the fast version of this. We were watching for 20, 30 minutes. Oh, yeah, all yeah. Live. I see. It's all it live here on News Now. Oh, they both got them both in the same field now. I think they, oh, I was going to say, they have the black one. I think they got the black one. I just think he's going to get caught? Well, I, I don't see a plan. I'll put it that way. Now I see a little bit of a plan, but not much. And obviously they got a cowboy out there now. And uh, that'll take care of that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Get a few people on that. There we go. 
So it's over. You oh, see it. Yeah. I mean, that's the quick way to watch it. Who needs to sit through 30 minutes when you can just yeah. watch that fun version of it? So I was watching oh. the chat as we were playing that, and everyone is saying that uh, um, that Juan Martinez has arrived at the courtroom. Um, I'm going to ask Troy about that. Troy, everyone's talking about Juan being in the courtroom in, at court now. Does it mean anything? Troy says he doesn't know. Well, here's what I say. This is what he says. Here, uh, let me get out and let Troy no, get in I, here. I gotta go. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Give me that mic. Uh, Wilmot was there earlier with Maria De La Rosa. There was no verdict then. Uh, Juan Martinez showing up today. Uh, at this point, uh, we don't know what that means. He's got some members of the family with him. Um, is a little bit of smoke. Does that mean there's fire? We don't know. Okay. Stay tuned. Thanks, Troy. What happened to where there's smoke? There's fire. <laughs> okay, guys, so that was the latest from Troy. I asked him what you guys were all talking about. That's the latest. Uh, that's all we know. It is 4.15 right now. Court is scheduled. Deliberations are scheduled to end at 4.30. Um, but we will continue to watch and give you an update on Jody Arias. In the meantime, there's a live press conference in regard to the Oxnard train crash that occurred yesterday in Southern California where the train collided with the truck. Did you see this? I did. It was crazy. So now they're doing a live press conference. I think conference. there was a Yuma connection to yeah, that, wasn't there? Yeah, the driver yes. of the truck yes. was from Yuma, mm -hmm. and now they're doing a live press conference with an update into the investigation. So let's listen in now and see what they're saying. Thanks, Dave. Okay. As well as for the preceding grade crossing, which would be... Um, at Rose Avenue, and I wanted to tell you that all of the signals uh, worked as designed. We've also confirmed that all signage and pavement markings at Rice Avenue regarding the railroad, talking about in pavement markings uh, that would indicate the railroad presence, the signs that would say things like uh, do not stop on tracks, also a round lollipop sign that has a cross buck on it that says RR. All of those signage and markings are within federal standards. We're continuing to document the damage of the truck and the trailer. I know there's been a lot of aerial vid video uh, footage of the, of the truck as well as the trains, uh, but uh, the truck was not fire damaged at all. The truck itself was not fire damaged. The trailer, of course, was completely consumed by fire, but the truck itself was only uh, damaged by impact damage, severely crushed. Now, yesterday we told you that we were downloading and trying to uh, analyze the, the event data recorder, and so we've got some preliminary inf information for you right now. Uh, preliminary information would tell us that the, the horn, the train horn, sounded 12 seconds before impact. The throttle, throttle position of the train was moved to idle 11 seconds prior to impact, and the train was placed into emergency braking 8 seconds prior to impact. Speeds, at the time of emergency brake, at the time that the emergency brake was applied, the train was doing 64 miles per hour, which is certainly under the 79 mile an hour speed limit for that section of track. And at the time of the collision, we're showing it as being 56 miles per hour. Now, I do want to emphasize that this is preliminary information. Uh, this is uh, very preliminary. I would not be surprised if these values changed by the end of the investigation, if these values changed by one or two miles per hour. But this is from our initial readout. There are actually two event data recorders, one on the uh, forward car and one on the trailing locomotive. And so we're just trying to synchronize those two recorders. But this is preliminary. We have confidence that we are pretty darn close, but if they change by one, one or two miles per hour, uh, that would not surprise me. But uh, they will undergo uh, extensive analysis uh, in our uh, laboratories in Washington, D.C. So let me describe to you the forward-facing video camera. Uh, I would say that this is good quality video. Uh, it's, it's color, but of course the outside conditions, it's, uh, it's dark outside, so therefore there's not a lot of contrast between, between the colors, but nevertheless, uh, it is a color video. 
as the train is moving down the track. So the train, of course, is moving in this direction. So as the train is moving this direction, the camera shows traffic moving up and down East 5th Street. So we can see the headlights and the taillights of traffic on East 5th Street. As the train approaches this grade crossing, we can see lights that we, if, if you continue to watch those lights, those lights on the track, those lights end up being the vehicle that was on the track. So we can see those lights, the headlights, and we can also see traffic moving up and down, traversing the Rice, South Rice Street grade crossing. So we see traffic, vehicular traffic, going up and down, back and forth on 5th, as well as up and down South Rice. We can see that the grade crossing arms come down. We can see them flashing. The object that ends up being the, the truck, the accident truck, the headlights were on, the emergency flashers were on, and the driver's door was open. So let me show you how this was, was positioned on the track. So we have, of course, two rails. We have a rail here and a rail here. So for the purpose of discussion, I'll refer to this lower rail as the southern rail, and I'll call this one the northern rail. The truck was straddling this southern rail. When I say straddling, I mean that the driver's side tires, both front and back tires. Passengers. I'm sorry, thank you, Robert. The, the passenger side tires were on the inside of the rails. They were between the rails. The driver's side tires were outside of the rails. So basically we've got we've got a rail right here. That's the south, southern rail. And then we've got the vehicle that's on top of that rail. Meanwhile, the other rail is here. So it's straddling this particular rail. Both tires inside the, the, the gauge of the track inside part of the track and the other two outside the gauge of the track. The vehicle is facing the train basically but it is canted slightly at an angle. It's not completely straight toward the train but it's canted at an angle slightly. The trailer appears to be completely on the southern end of the southern rail. In other words, it does not appear to be straddling the rail at all. Anything else on that that I should cover? No, sir. Good, thank you. Okay, so let's talk about the the, the people involved in the in the collision. The engineer is 62 years old. He has 42 years of experience, and he is number one on the MetroLink seniority list. He received his biannual certification in June of 2014, and he's qualified on all of the MetroLink lines. The student engineer, 
is 31 years old. He was just, he's just about to complete his one year of on-the-job training that's required to become fully certified as an engineer. And he was operating the train at the time of the collision, at the time of the, the event. In other words, he had been operating the train that morning up to the point of putting it into emergency braking. The conductor is 50, 58 years old, and he has 24 years of experience. Sorry, he has 25 years of experience. The driver of the truck holds an Arizona driver's license with a CDL endorsement for Class A. Basically, that means that he's qualified to operate large trucks, 18-wheeler type of trucks, even though this vehicle was not an 18-wheeler but he had those qualifications. This license was issued in 2013. He's been employed by Harvest Management LLC since November of 2002, and he usually drives the same vehicle on a daily basis. His job is to service farm equipment. He was scheduled to be in the Oxnard area for about six weeks, and according to his son, he was not familiar with the area. Among other things, we will obtain his cell phone records. We'll determine if he may have been using some sort of electronic mapping device for navigation. Now, our survival factors group has interviewed 20 firefighters from seven different units. And what they're doing is they are developing, in addition to other things, they are developing a timeline of the emergency response. And they will also begin a detailed examination of the rail cars. They will do that tomorrow. Uh, they thought initially they would do it today, but um, they wanted to get the interviews done yesterday because, as we know, people's memories of things fades or changes, so we thought it would be best to conduct the interviews uh, as soon as we could. So, so we did the interviews yesterday and today, and we will be uh, doing the rail car uh, surveys beginning tomorrow. Uh, but the cursory look at the Rotom CEM cars, crash energy management cars, uh, reveals very little crush damage. A more detailed examination of the inner workings of the crash energy absorbing uh, equipment uh, will be done, but we'll have to move the rail cars to a maintenance shop uh, in Los Angeles to remove uh, certain panels. So that will be looked at very carefully. We're interviewing passengers. We're that, those are in progress as we speak. And the things that we want to learn from the passengers would be the extent of their injuries, uh, how they evacuated the train, and how they were medically treated. Motor carrier factors. We, one of our investigators today traveled to Somerton, Arizona, uh, to, uh, to visit the headquarters of Harvest Management LLC. Hey guys, I am just uh, texting with Andrew Hasman, Fox 10's reporter. Um, I'm going to call him right now and do a phone interview with you guys. Uh, Andrew is live um, at the court right now. He has been listening in. Um, 
he's not been listening, but he's been observing while the jury deliberates. Andrew, are you there? I'm here. All right, let me put you uh, on speakerphone loudly, and that way we can get you. Um, so you've been in court. I mean, everyone that's been watching, we have people from around the world speculating. They're hearing that, you know, jurors are out. Then they see Juan Martinez, and then they see Travis Alexander's family. Can you speak since you're there live in the courtroom? Um, we are not actually in the courtroom. We're actually right outside the courtroom. The courtroom is locked. So um, what we're seeing are people coming and going who you know, are associated with the trial. The Alexander family is up here right now. Uh, Juan Martinez showed up. Um, Jody Arias' attorney showed up, and she had a bag of dry cleaning with her, which we can only assume is for Jody. Um, so people have been coming and going. It's just hard because you know no one really knows what's going on um, except the judge and the jury, if the judge even knows. Um, and we saw, we've seen the jury actually leave and take breaks for a little bit, go downstairs and come back in a group. So, I mean, you can read into it. Every, every time someone shows up, you know, you kind of just read into it whatever you want. It's anyone's guess what's happening. Right. Um, but it is it's a, little, it's a little strange to see everybody gathering around. My assumption now is that people are here, especially the Alexander family, because the day typically ends at 4.30. Right. Um, and at that point, usually the, um, everyone's alerted that the jury hasn't reached a verdict and that they're going to keep deliberating and that, you know, we'll come back Monday at this time to start deliberating again. So that's typically what happens towards the end of the day. Right. But that hasn't happened yet, so we don't know what's going on. Right. Right now it is, uh, it's pretty much 4.30 right now, so we should be getting information any minute, correct? Well, I hope so, yes. That would be the, that would be the hope. Right. What but, actually happens is anyone to guess because any nothing with this trial has been normal. So, right. Um, I think it's anyone's anyone's guess, really. Sure. Um, I do think it's a little odd though that you know all the families just hanging out here and that um, and that also the uh, that they brought clothes for Jody. Right. Um, it is a little strange, um, but maybe they just wanted to have them here and store them in the courtroom or in a safe place around here so she could have them. We do know that she's going to be able to wear civilian clothes for when, if there is a verdict, what is read. Right, and a lot of our viewers have been uh, following just a number of tweets everywhere, some of them saying that uh, they saw Juan Mar Martinez laughing with the Alexander family in the courtroom, other ones saying that Juan had a smirk when he said that he didn't have any answer in response to the the question, have they reached a verdict yet? There's so much speculation. You know, uh, well, yeah, what can I you say? Here, I, was, I was here when that question was shouted out to him. I think he was just kind of laughing at the whole situation, kind of a smirk on his face, not that he had some sort of a secret, mm -hmm. but that nobody knows anything, and anytime someone sees someone like Juan, they're going to blurt out, what's going on? Tell us everything. And he really doesn't know. Right. And then <laughs> I, they don't know. And then there was a tweet that someone shared saying that the jury had left through a back door. They're done deliberating, deliberating for the day. Well, I mean, no, so I'm not, no, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read in too much into that. I, we saw the jury. I saw them with my own eyes leave, go downstairs, and then come back up as a group about maybe 45 minutes to an hour ago. So, um, you know, if they go out a back door, they could, but I don't. there's no reason to keep the Alexander family here and keep everybody around if the jury's not here and they've gone home for the day. Right, right. And uh, right now, normally they're scheduled to end at 4.30. Could they still just continue to keep deliberating? If the judge and the jury all want to stick around, they can stay as long as they want. Okay. Um, but it's all up to the judge and the jury. Right. So, uh, you know, and, and we're not privy, really, to what they're asking, what's going on. So, um, we just kind of have to wait until we get any kind of word if, if they're done. Right, right. And if they choose to go home today, then there's no court they're tomorrow. Not, yeah, there's not expected to, to be here tomorrow, although you just never know that that could change. Um, but they're not expected to be here tomorrow, so that means they would come back Monday. Right, and what's that, Mr. Ben, uh, been like in the courtroom? I'm sure you're there with a ton of media, not only locally, but national media as well, right? Uh, yeah, well, I think the mood is just kind of like, uh, what's going on? Because, you know, anything that happens, you try to read into it whatever you can. Um, right. You know, you just kind of want to, you just kind of assume, like when you see them walking in with a bag of clothes from the dry cleaner, you're like, uh-oh. You know what's going on everyone has to be on alert and then nothing happens mm -hmm. so I mean, the mood is sort of like anticipation and yet at the same time you know just kind of sit here waiting <laughs> i mean and, and watching i mean it's not there aren't that many people here except for media and the occasional um alexander family members that are just popping by so no uh no trial fans 
but not really at this point there's a few here and there but no big crowds or anything uh-huh well, no it's just just a lot of anticipation and everyone trying to figure out everyone trying to read something into the tiniest details right which i'm not sure is a healthy thing to do but uh, <laughs> that's, what we're, that's what we're doing <laughs> well i mean that's pretty much we have been on live on news now for six and a half hours now um, we're trying to stream, basically, as long as the jury's deliberating, we're streaming here. That way we won't miss anything. That way viewers can watch us live on News Now as we find out the information. But yeah, we've been on here for six and a half hours, and the chat window has just been going crazy the whole day with a lot of speculation. People are genuinely praying for a verdict today, hoping that something comes down. They want justice for Travis, a lot of them. Um, I haven't seen any Jody supporters in our chat. I haven't seen too many of them here either. Right. <laughs> um, you know, this and you know, with the Alexander family here and a lot of um, supporters of Travis Alexander, this probably wouldn't be a good place for them to hang out. Um, you know, it's just uh, it's really just kind of a waiting game. Mm-hmm. Earlier today, there were some jury, the jurors had some questions, and one of the questions was, "Can we basically work through lunch and?" can we look at our notes while we're on break? And the answer to those questions was, yes, you can work through lunch, but you, uh, you you cannot look through your notes while you're on break. You can only look through your notes while you're deliberating as a group. Right, right. Well, um, yeah. what's that? No, go oh, ahead. No, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, yeah, they, uh, you know, everyone tries to read into to that, thinking that maybe, well, if they want to work through lunch, maybe they think that they're close. Mm-hmm. But uh, we haven't heard anything, and now it's still past 4.30. Yeah, I mean, we were all speculating the same thing. I mean, uh, we're just as guilty here in the media. <laughs> There's a lot of speculation. Absolutely. And, you know, some of the questions that I've been, that I've been getting um, on Twitter and uh, are things like, you know, are they going to reach a verdict? And, and frankly, the answer is nobody knows except the jury. Right, right. Well, Nobody knows. You know, the, the, the attorneys, they may, they may say, oh, they're clearly getting close. There may be, like, little inklings of information. But, frankly, nobody knows in there except the jury. Right, right. Well, thanks so much for calling in and giving us that update uh, as to sure. what you're seeing, what's going on. You're going to have another live hit at 5 o'clock right on the newscast on That's the Fox correct. 10 News yeah, at 5. Yeah. We'll be there at 5. Great. And for those of you watching internationally who want to tune in but don't have a low TV with local access to Phoenix channels, you can watch us on fox10phoenix.com. That's where you'll be able to watch the live broadcast and see Andrew's report uh, then. Uh, thanks again for calling in, Andrew. We'll talk to you later. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Whew. Lots of talking, lots of various watch. Guess what I have for you guys? I know you guys want to see a live image of the courtroom, and guess what? We have it for you now. This is a live look from outside the courtroom. I'm going to put up this photo now. We're going to continue to be on Aries Verdict Watch. I'm going to leave this photo up for a second, and I'll be back in just a few minutes.
Alright guys, I was just giving you a live look at the cartoon for a little bit, and I was also working on something. So earlier today, uh, you know, in the beginning of the day, I played for you guys this highly talked about, much anticipated, 44 minute raw interview clip with Jody Arias. It's from the interview that Troy did with Jody um, way back in 2013. Uh, originally what aired on TV was a seven minute version of the actual story. Well, we have pulled the raw video for you. And initially we had a lot of audio issues because it was the very raw version of that video. Well, now we have enhanced the audio so you can hear Jody fairly uh, clearly, whereas uh, before you had to listen on max volume, you can barely hear. So what I'm gonna do right now is replay for you that 44 minute clip, that Jody Arias interview, exclusive, completely raw, unedited, untouched video of the interview uh, between Troy and Jody Arias, in case you guys missed it earlier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Great. And if you can put that uh, mic cord back behind you again. Please. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Okay, I just want you to be aware that the doors are locked. We're lean up. If anyone needs to leave, it makes a noise. Go ahead and lean back. So if you need to leave for any reason, if you want to stop, because I don't know if you want that noise in the background of the sliding doors opening up. It's pretty heavy and we can't go. We'll, go. we'll go straight through here. Everybody's good? Joe has a lighting one. Does the lighting look up this one? I'm going to line. Okay. You look nice. They've got you lit really well. Hmm? They've got you lit really well. Remember, waist up, no stripes. Yep. Okay. Hey, what do you guys? What do you got? We good? Good to go. I'm good. Okay. Um, just a couple of minutes ago, you heard the verdict from the jury. What are your thoughts? Um, I think I just went blank. Just, um... I don't know. I just feel overwhelmed. I think I just need to take it a day at a time. Was it unexpected, do you think, this verdict? It was unexpected for me, yes, because there was no premeditation on my part. I can see how things look that way, but... I didn't expect the premeditation. I could see maybe the felony murder because of how the law is written, but I didn't ex the whole time I was fairly confident I wouldn't get premeditation because there was no premeditation. It seemed, and you got a lot of questions from the jury, it seemed like some of those jurors didn't believe what you were telling them, didn't believe your story. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? I can understand that, I think, because of what I was, the lies that I told in the beginning to try to cover up this, cover up that, hide things that I didn't want to be known, made public. Why did you lie at the beginning? Um, well, mostly because I was scared, but I also didn't want certain aspects of my relationship with Travis to come out, and um, I was ashamed of what had happened, how it happened, how it escalated. Um, I don't know if there's really a word in, at least in my vocabulary, to describe it. But I think mortified is one of the closest words. Ashamed, things like that. You, um, did you avoid eye contact with Travis's family while you were in there? Or did you make eye contact? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, I typically okay, avoided eye contact. Bottom. Travis comes from a family where they all sort of look a lot alike. So when I see their faces, I see Travis. and. I see the man that abused me, and I don't want to look at that. Um, is it hard? Do you have a sense of where the, the public feeling is about you, that you're liked or not liked? I mean, I get the sense that there is great division on both sides, but I believe the majority is against me. What are your thoughts on that? Um, a psychologist once explained to me that society has this need to um, persecute people. They get some sort of gratification from it, so there might be something going on there. Um, beside that, I, I don't really... There, it's so convoluted that we could talk for hours on that, but um, it just is what it is. 
you, um, in just a recent, and we'll talk about Twitter in a second, but in just a recent tweet you were talking about, you just mentioned the word suicide. I mean, how are you feeling right now? Well, I'm not really looking forward to what comes next, but... Explain that to me. Um, well, I just, it's just more court. It just keeps going on and on. I just want, wanted to get it over with. What? Are you focusing on the court, or are you focusing on what could be the, the worst outcome for you? Well, the worst outcome for me would be natural life. I would much rather die sooner than later. Longevity runs in my family, and I don't want to spend the rest of my natural life in one place. Um, you know, I'm pretty healthy, I don't smoke, and I would probably live a long time. So that's not something I'm looking forward to. Um, I said years ago that I'd rather get death than life, and that still is true today. I believe death is the ultimate freedom, so I'd rather just have my freedom soon, as soon as I can get it. So you're saying you actually prefer getting the death penalty to being in prison for life? Yes. That might surprise some people. Well, I think that if you look at um, things eternally, it's not as scary. I mean, we do get attached to our lives, and I'm attached to mine. But, um, I don't know, I just, I can't fathom staying in one spot for the rest of my life. So I've been everywhere. And um, I think it would just drive me a little crazy. You uh, had some clashes with Juan Martinez. You kind of went after him on Twitter a little bit. What are your thoughts on Juan? Um, well, Prior to trial, I respected Juan as a very um, capable attorney, um, even though he's done some very shady things in my case, as far as hiding evidence and um, failing to disclose certain things, hoping it would just go away. But in the end, what does it matter? It didn't help my case, as far as all the evidence that did come to light eventually. Um, in trial, I think that um, his accusation that I was seeking fame is, is absurd. Um, I remember a hearing we had in 2011 when he stood up before the court and said, I don't control the media. If, if it were up to me, I'd be on TV every night. So I think he's the one seeking fame, not me. But, you know, it is what it is. You... Uh had some, some pretty tough things, I would imagine, to go through in the trial. During the trial, there were photographs of you displayed. Uh, I noticed you tended to look away. What were you thinking when those photographs were being flashed up in front of everybody? I wanted to crawl under the table and just disappear. If you had to look at some of the tougher uh, parts of what you've been through for the last four months, what would they be? Just coming to fully understand what I've put people through, my family and everyone else as well. That's the part I'll always regret. Tell me more about that. Well, just the way everything happened, um, I think that if I had just been honest from the beginning, I'd be in a different place. And so would everyone else. And um, because of what I've done, a lot of people will hurt for a long time. It's got to be a tough uh, time for you, obviously, just learning what happened. But you're telling me that if you would have done things differently, do you, do you regret how you went about doing things after Travis was killed, after you killed Travis? Yeah, I think that I was just freaked out. Well, I know I was freaked out. Um, I didn't know what to do. I, did, I knew that I couldn't just carry on as normal, but I tried to do that. I tried to act that part until, you know, until everything came down on me. 
I just, I just couldn't imagine going to my family and saying, hey, look what happened, or going to the police and saying, here, arrest me. Um, I was just horrified with what had happened, and it was difficult to face that, that I had been pushed to that point and that I would, could be capable of something like that. And let's talk a little bit about what happened um, after you were at Travis's that night and that day. A lot of people who have talked to me about it have said, how could she have gone up and been with another man, you know, basically 24 hours after this? How were you able to put that behind you and basically go on a date? I don't think I so much put it behind me as I just sort of checked out. I hardly remember that day. Um, I don't remember it being nearly as intimate as he described. I remember falling asleep and taking a nap, and he was lying next to me. Um, I remember feeling, it's strange, but I remember feeling safe. He wasn't going to snap. He wasn't going to, you know, take advantage of me and try to do things I wasn't comfortable with. Um, I just felt safe with that person, but I knew that, I mean, it's not like I went up there because I was hoping to pursue a relationship. Right. I went up there because I thought, oh crap, I need to keep my schedule. So I went up there almost because I felt a sense of obligation inside in order to keep up the pretense, not because I was going off to have fun. But it's odd even to me, I don't know you at all, but I, I feel like I know a little bit about you. But you really look at your hands and you realize what's happened. Yeah. And at that point you say to yourself, I've got to go up and meet this person. I'm going to keep that appointment. I'm going to keep that date. How, I don't understand how that goes through your mind. Well, um, what happened was um, I slowly began to come to while I was in the desert. And um, um, when I found my charger and I turned my phone on, there were tons of voicemails. Um, one from Leslie, I think a few from Leslie, maybe one from Ryan. And I realized these people are wondering where I am. And I thought, I just felt like I needed to buy myself some time and figure out what had happened. I was just very, I was very shocked. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I'd like to go over just a couple of things in the case, if I could. Um, when your grandparents' gun went missing, that's what most people point to as the point where you basically made the decision that I'm going to go down there and do this. What, what do you say to people when they make that point? Well, I was really hoping the defense would call my sister because I spent the day with her. And um, we weren't at the house when that happened. We weren't even in Wairika. We were out of town. We were um, actually in no town. We were out in the middle of almost nowhere at a Buddhist monastery near the border of Oregon and California taking pictures. I was really hoping my defense team would um, recover those pictures. They're on another hard drive that stopped working that they never made an issue of. Those photos on there. Um, our date and time stamped, and they show that I'm out of town um, during that time. So that was my hope, that we could show the jury that I was nowhere near that area. I mean, that's what it's really helped So me. you're sticking by that part of your story? Oh, sure. absolutely, yeah. Let's talk about the gas cans. That's another thing that keeps being brought up all the time. Was there a third gas can? Um, there was initially when I purchased it, right. but I, I really did return it. I got $13 and change back, and I went on my way. A lot of people are saying, who, who carries gas in the trunk of their car? I didn't fill it up until I realized I was going to be driving across the desert um, on a highway alone that I've never driven at night. And um, it's something that we began to do when I moved to the desert because we didn't want to get stranded somewhere. Um, just being from the coast, 120 degrees is a, a shock to your system. So we sort of um, would travel with provisions and things like that. So not always gas, but I was taking a road that I'd never traveled before. And um, suddenly being safe was more important than saving a few dollars on gas, which was my initial goal. And uh, the other thing that keeps coming up, or the jury seemed to have issues with as well, was the lack of memory over the attack. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to me? Sure. Um, I think it's been described how certain memories come back with time and rather than get worse. And I've experienced a little bit of both. Memories have come back. It's not just completely blank. Little things have come back here and there that I remember. Uh, have, have things come back since we began talking about this, since the trial started? Um, no, these things, well, 
I can't think of anything specifically. These things have come back within the last year, two years. Things have been popping up and coming back, and I testified to that a little bit. Um, just different scenarios that have research. I don't want to get into the details. Um, so I, I just, I can't explain it. I think I have a good memory, and it's almost like I blacked out, but I mean, obviously wasn't unconscious. Um, you're talking about your defense a little bit, and you wish they would have done this and done that. Are you happy with your defense? I'm grateful for my defense. They worked happy, very hard. Right? Um, not 100% but they've worked very hard. What would you have changed? Um, there is a man who saw me with bruises all over. I would have made every effort to find him, and they didn't. There are other people who saw me with bruises. Um, my friends, my sisters, and the defense didn't call them for their own reasons, and I think that that would have cooperated some of the things that I said on the hard drive that we just discussed, um, the one that was not part of my trial. There are photographs during that time, and I think there might have been a photograph on there. Maybe, maybe not. We wouldn't know unless we looked. Oh, but of your bruises yourself? Yeah. I took pictures of myself during that time, not specifically for that purpose, but just being on the road, and I just keep thinking maybe it was in that photo. Um, Tons of things. You know, um, what I hear from women a lot is if she was getting beat up, why didn't she call the police? That's why probably what you hear them? from women who have not been in my situation and been abused. Um, I think at that time, if I can put myself back in that mind frame at that time, my fear of calling the police is that I would be seen as overly dramatic or I would make an enemy of Travis, and I really just wanted us to be able to be friends, ultimately. Um, I was scared of the consequences for him, and scared a little bit for me of calling the police and getting them involved, getting the law involved. And um, I didn't want that to happen to him. I, I just wanted him to go on and be happy and be successful, and I wanted the same for myself. Um. Let's talk about your family for a little bit. Your mom has been um, there for you every day in the courtroom. What are your thoughts on her? Is that the hardest part, thinking about your mom? Yeah. My mom and my whole family. Yeah, that's difficult. As far as my mom, I feel like I don't deserve her. She's been a saint, and I've not treated her very well. I vaguely remember the incident, I think, when they say I kicked her. We were arguing and she was kicking me under the table, and I think I kicked her back. I was a teenager. She did anything she could to keep us under control. So. She uh, visits you often. What do you talk about? Um, everything, pretty much. Sometimes they're good visits, sometimes they're bad visits. Are unpleasant. Other times they're great. So. What happens during the good visit? Um. Usually she's telling me um, stories about things that are happening with my family or my friends or how many um, emails and messages of support that she's getting. People that support my family and me. 
you know, moral support that they're behind us, and that makes me feel good. What about the, what about the bad visits? What are they like? They're usually um, just discussing unpleasant things, um, frustrating times. Things are very frustrating sometimes, and it just, it's a drag. Um, your artwork is all over the place. Do you take uh, pride in the fact that people are paying money for your art? Um, it's interesting. Um, I take pride just not so much in the price tag, but in the way I've developed the gift itself, or the talent, I should say. I take pride in that. I'm just, I'm happy that I'm able to share it with the world. Um, I noticed that, um, and I saw this on another network, so I, I don't know 100% if it's correct, but uh, that you buy large amounts from the commissary, and then you tweeted out that you, it's not only for you. Tell me about what you do behind bars when it comes to the commissary. Yeah, um, after I was arrested, I'm no longer working or going to church, and so I'm not tithing anymore to the church. But the church encourages you to tithe 10%, so what I do is I take 10% of the dollar amount that I spend and I give that away. And then recently I've been blessed with the ability to spend a little bit more, so I'm able to give more. And I've, I've been glad to be able to do that. Are you still practicing your faith? Um, I don't think I... I'm still a member of the LDS Church, but I'm not actively practicing my faith at this point. Um, they don't offer LDS services for maximum security inmates, and the Mormons rarely come around to visit me. So I've sort of fallen away for that. I don't know. I still have my scripture. I still read it. But it's hard to maintain um, an active status in the church when you're sort of cut off from it. You say the Mormons don't come around to visit you. Who are you talking about? Um, they have, well, they do come, but maybe like once or twice a year. Um, they are volunteers that are members of the church that go to jails, prisons, um, facilities where people are incarcerated to visit them. The uh, Alexander family, uh, especially the, the two sisters, and the younger brother, if you could say something to them, what would you like to say to them? I hope that now that a verdict has been rendered that they're able to find peace, some sense of peace. I don't think they'll ever find the peace that they would like, but maybe, they, maybe they'll be able to have greater peace now or some semblance of it and be able to move on with their lives and remember their brother the way they wanted to. Do you still think about Travis? Yes. In what way? Um, there's a lot of regret because I was really hoping to get a plea and avoid talking about all of the things that came out about him. Um, if we had been able to avoid trial, we could have avoided just the murkier aspects of his life that he kept hidden. And these aren't just things that came from my mouth. They're his own words, his own emails, his own text messages. The activities that he was up to, photographs that show that as well. None of that ever would have come to light. It would have just been forgotten and he would be memorialized as um, not perfect by any means, but somebody who was known to adhere to his morals and the principles that he espoused, but now the curtain has been drawn and you can see the hypocrisy and everything that was there and I regret that because I know that even though he was living the life of a hypocrite, that's not how he wanted to be perceived and I think inside he really didn't want to live that kind of life. There were some parts of your story that were definitely backed up by emails and texts and phone conversations and things like that. 
but a lot of people had real issues with the pedophilia when that was brought up. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, again, I mean, he's fantasizing about having sex with a 12-year-old on a tape. That's a pedophile by definition. Um, also, there's a photograph on my hard drive which my attorneys didn't feel was relevant, but it's a picture of him chasing around a naked four-year-old boy with his Bible open, pretending to be a Catholic priest. I don't know why we were all hanging out. I thought it was silly at the time, and I snapped the photograph. And um, at the time, I just thought he was mocking the Catholic Church in poor taste, and and then that was that. But that was a year before I walked in on him. And so after that incident of walking in on him, I began to put all these things together, and that was one of the puzzle pieces that seemed to make sense to me. A lot of people accusing you of tearing down a dead man's reputation. I would have been very happy to remain silent and go quietly into the night off to prison. My defense team decided to rip the lid off because we were forced to trial. Um, the state didn't want to settle, so it's not that I wanted to plow ahead and do this, but I took the stand because strategically they advised me to, and when I was on the stand, I had to tell, I had to answer the questions that were posed to me. So if you had to do this all over again, you're in the desert, you notice that you've got blood on your hands, how do you handle it? I would turn around and drive to the Mesa Police Department. And what do you think would have happened to you then? I don't know, but it would have been the right thing. Let's go forward. Say you do get a long sentence. How are you going to spend your life? I haven't decided yet. Um, talk to me again, if you can, briefly about wanting to hurt yourself. Do you feel like you want to hurt yourself right now? Not right now. I think I've gone in and out of periods of that since 2007. There was some talk about me being uh, suicidal in high school. I never was. I think I might have written the words, something along the lines of wanting to die, but that's distinctly different from wanting to actually kill myself. So I never was. It, I found it strange at the time that after I had gotten into the church and I gained a testimony of the church, suddenly I'm feeling suicidal. I didn't understand that. But I never did anything, so... It could just be talk. It could just be purging my thoughts, um, that kind of thing. Um, you're tweeting. Talking about Twitter. Is that your idea? Um, initially, I've never been on Twitter. I don't even know what it looks like. I just have heard about it through other people reading about it in magazines. Um, in 2009, somebody started a false Twitter account in my name and began tweeting, pretending they were me. So I had that shut down. Um, and then it, it just became sort of an idea that I thought of in February, and we decided to go for it. Are you happy you have? Yes. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say happy. I'm, I don't regret it. Right. Yeah. What has it brought to you? Um, I think there's a little bit of satisfaction gained from being able to um, just impart my ideas and my thoughts and sort of let people know where I'm coming from. Whoever wants to look, I mean, you don't have to read it if you don't like it. So, uh, you went after Nancy Grace there a couple times. Yeah. You want to talk about Nancy? I don't think she's worth it. Juan, you also went after there. Yeah, I just found it a very highly hypocritical that he would point to me and call me the epitome of a liar when he has lied over and over on record in court over the years. Um, 
I wish I had the ability to comb through those records and say, right here he lied, right here he lied, right here he lied, but he's not the one on trial. So in that sense, it doesn't matter that he lied, but in another sense it does because of the important position that he has. Um, we have, how am I doing on time, Lisa? Okay. Um, you've got a mitigation hearing coming up here or at, um, at penalty phase. Tell me what, do you know what your mitigating factors are going to be? And how you're going to um, Well, I've been told that I don't have any mitigating factors. By who? Um, my attorney. So, Kirk Nurmi you're talking about? Kirk Nurmi said to you there are no mitigating factors for you in terms of arguing against the death penalty. Um, nothing that is what you typically see in a case like this, such as um, a childhood where there was drugs, alcoholism, molestation, things like that. None of those things occurred in my family. Um, so, I don't know. I guess we would sort of joke that my mom didn't beat me hard enough, so I don't really have mitigation. So what are you going to do? I talked to the attorney in the, in, who's handling it. Um, she seems like a very pleasant woman. She says she's got a week-long case. Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that um, they feel that I would be a suitable candidate to behave myself in um, a correctional facility and just not be a problem. That may be their angle. I don't know. Did you uh, have any knowledge of, you know, the interest in your case? Do you have an idea of how many people are interested? Um, I hear things, but I have no access to the news, the internet, that sort of thing. No direct access. What kinds of things do you hear? Um, I do get the newspaper, so that's been one portal where I've learned things. Um, a lot of inmates have come in to the jail since then, and they tell me um, they want to come up and shake my hand, they want to give me a hug, they want, to, they want my autograph. I'm not going to sign anything. They just, they want a piece of something. That, so it's, it's kind of strange, but that's given me an idea. That has to be strange, huh? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think when somebody comes up and asks you for your autograph? Um, it's, it's kind of awkward. I mean, I, I want to be nice to people, but I tell them no. It's, I don't think it's appropriate. Why don't you sign things? Um, my goal isn't fame. I just, my goal was just to get through this. So I certainly didn't want that to, to give off that impression. Pretty, uh, a quote or a soundbite from your trial that's played over and over again, and you even smiled at it in court. It was Kurt Nurmi saying, nine days out of ten, mm -hmm. even he doesn't like you. Yeah. What did you think when he said that? Um, I thought of, um, I actually thought of Elizabeth Johnson's trial because I was reading the coverage in the paper and her attorney said, told the jury that it's important. Uh, well, I'm paraphrasing, but he told them that it's not about whether or not you like her. It's about the facts of the case. So I think it was, um, I think it might, I believe it's standard somewhat that um, jurors need to remember it's not about whether or not you like the defendant. Um, Does Kirk like you? I think nine days out of ten. I mean, one, day, out of one, one day, day out of, out of nine. One day out of ten. Yeah, I think so. Why don't you get along? Well, or we actually, we got along very well for a long time, and then we just have had clashes um, in ideas, and ultimately he's the boss. Anything you want to say to Juan Martinez? No. Um, you seem to be writing quite a bit during testimony. Or were you drawing? What were you doing? I was writing. Just thoughts. When I heard something with testimony, I would write notes, pass it to Jennifer, pass it to Kirk, things like that, just to keep them informed. So you um, weren't drawing? There might be occasional little scribbles in the margins, but no, no drawing.
Anything else you want to talk about? Not that I can think of. I well, think actually, there is one more thing yes. I wanted to say. Um, if I could um, tell somebody in a situation that I was in anything, I just would encourage them to document it. I think that um, it doesn't mean they have to turn the person in or betray them, but should a situation ever arise, I think documentation would have been very helpful in my case. And um, my sister is going through um, something right now with her ex-husband, and there are um, a lot of things that she could have documented that would help her. So it surprises me that even as she knows about what I've gone through, she still fails to document these things. And it's so easy. Save these text messages, save these incidents, write these things down, make reports. Um, but they don't. People just don't do that. I don't know why women don't do that. I mean, some do. No, it's not black and white. It's not 100%. But if we could just make a record, then that record will stand should something happen down the line. You've actually started, um, at least uh, you tweeted out that you're selling T-shirts for a domestic violence shelter. Do you plan to continue those efforts? Yes. Why do you do that? Um, my, uh, well, I, I assume that they were doing okay as is with government funding and things like that, just donations. But I've spoken with some people who have worked in those shelters, and they always need donations. And um, it's important to me to be able to assist them in being able to assist survivors. So I guess I'll wrap it up by saying we talked about domestic violence. Um, a lot of people are going to be seeing, going to be a lot of people are going to be seeing this. Is there one thing you'd like to get out to all those people? Do you mean um, people in general? Yes. I'm sure I'll think of something very clever to say later. But <laughs> As you walk out. Yeah. I, can understand that. I guess what I really want to say is to um, other women who are in a situation that I was once in, and it's like I just like I just said, I really just I wish they would just document it. That's it. it. You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to turn the person you love in. You don't have to do anything. Just document it, just in case. It's better to have it and not need it than the opposite. And um, again, I think that things would be very different right now if I had documented all of the things that I went through, instead of being in a state of denial. What would you like to say to all the people who seem to really dislike you, even even hate you? Um, well, maybe I should be flattered that they focus on me so much. If they dislike me so much, then why am I always on their radar? I'm Ivan Lilly, I'm Troy's executive producer. Thank you for doing this. Um, do you, you were just talking about the people that don't like you. Mm -hmm. Do you care at all? I mean, does it matter to you that people like you or don't like you? Is it going to matter to you wherever you end up, if you want to answer Troy? Um, at age 32, it doesn't matter. Um, I think when I was arrested at age 28, it bothered me. And um, even before my arrest, before I ever imagined my life going in this direction, if I knew someone didn't like me, it, it would gnaw at me in the back of my mind. But at this point, I can truly say it's like water off a duck's back. Um, I've reached a place. I wish I'd reached this place years ago, but I think it just comes with age. But I've reached a place where it, it really doesn't bother me. What about the domestic violence groups that don't believe your story and say, we don't want your help? There's some people out there saying that, you know, keep your t-shirts, keep your efforts, we don't believe you. Okay. I'm not aware of um, any organizations that help survivors of domestic violence that are calling a survivor of domestic violence, um, saying that they don't believe that person. That's, um, that's not a good thing to say to somebody who's been through, through it. Um, it would be like a child running and telling somebody what's going on with them, and the parent says, I don't believe you, or an authority figure says, I don't believe you. So you can imagine what it does to that person. Um, and then I have a question about the jury. Hmm. You obviously you think they got it wrong, correct? As far as premeditation, I know they got it wrong. Um, some said felony murder. I think that's uh, a very 
ugly law sitting in my position. But as far as the way the law is written, I think I can understand how some reach that conclusion. So what's your message to the jury right now? Well, I don't know that I have a direct message for the jury. I know that um, I prayed constantly for every single one of them. So that's the jury that was brought to me. That's the jury that I was meant to have. So you, you prayed for the jury? I prayed prior to trial that the right jurors would, would be on my, on my jury. So um, I just have to believe that those were the right jurors. And the last question I have is going back to when you were on the stand and Juan Martinez was cross-examining you. It was really tense. It felt like you were giving back as much as he was giving. What was going through your mind? What really did you want to say had um, there been no constraints on what to say at that point? I would have said a lot more. Um, you want to say it now? Well, I can't. I would have to think back to a specific incident. Well, you told him he was scrambling your brain because he was yelling at you. I yeah. That. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking when he was yelling at you? Um, I probably shouldn't say. There were a lot of times when he was beating up on other witnesses, more like attacking the messenger rather than the message, and I just wanted to be able to uh, jump into their body and respond for them, just because I feel like he is um, a bully. I actually kind of expected you, when he would go after you like that, to to shrink away or cry or be like, why? But instead, you, you did stand up to him. Was yeah, that? I think that if um, it had been any sooner, then trial did take a long time to finally get here. If it had been any sooner, I would have melted. I would have just fallen apart. Um, but my confidence came on the stand knowing that I'm, I'm up there and I'm ready to speak the truth. And I know that I was, I know what happened. And that gave me a sense of inner strength to handle him. He can throw whatever curveballs he wants. I know what I know what happened, and I'll answer it. What are you going to do tomorrow? I have court. Um, I don't know. What's tonight going to be like? I'm hoping. Knowing, knowing now the decision, what's how is tonight going to be different than every night up leading up to today? Um. Well. I thought a lot about that, and um, I had a list of things that I wanted to do with my life if I were blessed with a second chance. So there are still things on that list I might be able to accomplish regardless. Um, but tonight I was going to go back and visit with my family and um, break the news to my friends who have been very supportive. And just business as usual tonight, and then we'll see what tomorrow brings. Jerry. You gotta get all your stuff off of here. I was gonna try to show you what your Twitter page looks like, but we have no service down here. Yeah. Here's what the home page looks like. That's my home page. So yours is you know, a shot of you in court. Yeah. And then down below is a whole bunch of the groupings of what you write. So you only get 140 okay. characters. Okay. And then you're able to. All right, that is a wrap on that interview with Jody Arias. I know a lot of you are, have been asking for that interview, um, or not that interview rather, but the video of Travis's family um, on the stand pleading um, from the first trial. And um, we are working to get that footage along with other archived footage from the first trial from um, previous news coverage. We're working to get that back into the system and we hope to have it here on News Now tomorrow. So even though there won't be any jury deliberations tomorrow and we'll have to wait till Monday for that to continue our official Jody verdict watch, I will say that we have a lot more Jody Arias coverage, um, old archive footage, never before seen footage that we will be airing here on News Now tomorrow. So if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash fox10phoenix. If you hit the subscribe button, you will stay uh, subscribed to this channel, meaning when you log into YouTube, you will see when we are broadcasting live, we should be live uh, most of the day tomorrow as well, and we'll be playing all those uh, different clips um, and exclusive uh, videos that we have from the previous trial as well as initial coverage from 2008 and so forth. So please join us then. Thank you guys so much, those of you who have stayed with us throughout the day, those of you who came in and out. We really appreciate uh, you guys, 
you guys watching this channel, you guys interacting, uh, viewing, chatting in the comment box. We love interacting with you guys. So thank you so much uh, to all you viewers watching from around the world. And I guess I'll see you guys next time. Uh, bye.